Good morning. Okay, uh, m much as I value your enthusiasm, you need to do better than that, so I'll, tr I'll try again. Good morning. Thank you. Though, if there are any people who haven't got seats, uh, there are some available at the back, and we've double-checked you will be able to see all the script, so the seats at the back are as good uh, as the ones at the front, and maybe there are even better because, you know, the back seats are for those people with dirty conscience. Welcome back. This is day two of Code Dive 2016. This is Wrocław. This is the New Horizons Cinema. And this conference has been organized and sponsored by Nokia. Thank you for wearing Code Dive t-shirts. I also practice what I preach, so there's a photo opportunity later, so make sure you make a nice crowd at some point and we'll take nice photos and publish them online and ridicule you later. Uh, quick question, on the scale from one to 10, how excited are you? Okay, those who said one, I've got to talk to you later, Mike. And today's menu, since you are so excited, is another series of talks on coding. And it will be followed by a series of lightning talks later this afternoon. As you know, there are four rooms available, so there's plenty to choose from. Uh, also, there's an after party tonight at 7 in the Mleczarnia pub. Make sure you don't miss it. Uh, so. With this, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and it's the person you may have had uh, to, uh, a chance to meet yesterday. Uh, for those who haven't, this is Chandler Caruth, and Chandler leads the C++ platform team and LLVM team at Google, and is a fan of single malt whiskey and Cherry Coke Zero, but provided they are served separately. And Chandler's talk today is especially relevant to those who do not understand compiler optimization. And I know this for fact because the title of the talk is Understanding Compiler Optimization. Chandler Caruth. All right. So are folks warming up, waking up a little bit? A little bit? All right, so, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you today about compiler optimization. Um, how many folks here write C++ code? I know there's some people who write Java, enough of you write C++ code. So, so a big question for me is, why are you writing C++? Uh, how many folks here are writing C++ because it is the easiest programming language they know? <laughs> look around you, look around you, it has your hand up. Those people are liars. Okay, how many folks here are writing C++ because they care a lot about the performance of their code? Uh, these, this is the right reason to use C++. But there's a real challenge when you're trying to work on performance of your code, and that's that when you write C++ code, a very large factor in the performance of your program is the compiler, how the compiler optimizes that code. And, and I worry about this because you're writing C++, caring about the performance, but most people don't necessarily understand how compiler optimizers work. And, and it's very hard to effectively make high performance code if you don't understand a critical component in the code's performance. So this talk's whole mission, the whole purpose that I have in giving this talk is to try and teach you all kind of how the compiler's optimizer works, how it interprets your code, give you a mental model for kind of reasoning about performance in that way. Um, and so, so this, this talk is going to feature lots of code. It's going to feature lots of compiler internals. I'm going to try and walk you through it. It's essentially, you know, uh, like three weeks of a compiler's course compressed into an hour and 15 minutes, uh, which may be a little bit bold. So let, let's get into it and see how we do. So many folks here have taken a compiler's course, right? A few people have taken compiler's courses. Not very many. Anyone use this book? So this book is, is the book I had in my compilers course. It taught me a lot about, uh, uh, about parsers and parser generators. Uh, it taught me a lot about code generation and register allocation, and it taught me very little about actual compilers. Um, and, and we need to understand why. 
So the first thing to realize is that this, this book uh, has on its cover this dragon character up here, right? And the dragon character is, is labeled the complexity of compiler design, all right? And then it has a bunch of, of, of tools that this knight here is theoretically going to use to tackle this complexity. And a big component of, of this book is the idea of parser generators allowing you to tackle the complexity of compiler design. Because most of this book's complexity focuses on parsing and the complexity of parsing. Now, that's actually not the side of compilers I find to be terribly complex. That's not the side of compilers I'm going to talk about today. And, and, and the other problem I have with this book is that this dragon seems awfully friendly. I mean, I, are you afraid of this? Like, I mean, come on, he's, he's, he's practically smiling. I mean, this is a very, like, cute dragon. See, when I think of compilers and the complexity that they face, I think much more of this dragon. Uh, which is a bit more scary, a bit, you know, more fire coming out of its mouth. This is the dragon that I think of with compiler design. Okay, so uh, we need to kind of understand these, these optimization, uh, th these optimizers in order to really understand performance. So, so my suggestion is that we actually dive through compilers and figure out how they work. And we actually understand the piece of software that's going to be transforming your code. So first off, what parts of the compiler do we want to talk about today? So, so there are three kind of huge pieces of the compiler we can point at. We have the front end at the top. At the bottom, we have the code generator, which is actually responsible for producing executable code. And then in the middle, we have this optimizer. It's this kind of weird thing. And, and if, you, if, you, if you read the Dragon book, if you, if you studied that, that book, you would see that it talks about the front end, and it talks about the code generator, and it doesn't even really mention the optimizer. It has a few very minor comments about the optimizer, but it doesn't really spend a lot of time on it. And this talk is only going to discuss the optimizer. We're going to completely ignore the front end, completely ignore the code generator. If you want to learn about those things, you can go read the Dragon book, you can go take a compiler's class. There are many places to learn about these. But I want to focus on this optimizer because it's a very uh, less well understood component of compilers today. This is essentially optimization 101. Now, as, as a consequence, like, this is very much a lecture. I'm going to be trying to teach you, you all things. But that means I need your help because at some point during this talk, you will be completely lost about what I'm saying. Unlike a lot of the other talks this, uh, this conference, I want you to interrupt me. I want you to like, put up your hand, like jump up and down, whatever you have to do to get our attention. And we're going to take your question, and I'll try and answer, because otherwise, we're not going to be able to make progress. This is much more of a, of a, of a lecture style thing, much less of a, uh, just you know, me talking the whole time. If you let me talk the whole time, I'll end up finishing early. It'll be awkward. right? You so you have to help me out with that. You think, you, is this a responsibility you're okay with? Nodding? Okay, okay, excellent. So here's our program. It's not actually very C++ at all, sorry, but it is, it is relevant. So this is a very simple program, okay? Right, we've got a function. It does some things with the arguments, right? It calls some other functions. Nothing too fancy, okay? This is a really simple program. So this should be a great program to kind of illustrate how the compiler works. Right? And it's, it's tiny, right? So we'll be able to kind of think about it in, in, in our heads. We'll be able to put stuff on the slides about it. So this is how Clang uh, models this tiny program. So, so there's a lot, of, a lot of information. This is actually about the first of eight pages of Clang's representation of that program. Right? So tiny program, eight pages of, of tree-like data structure in Clang. Okay, it, it really does keep going. And you can kind of see some relevant pieces in here, right? We can see that we have, you know, a Boolean, right, that we're comparing against things. We have some conversions, lots of, lots of uh, tree representations. The front end is actually incredibly complex. The whole, the whole dragon book actually was kind of onto something with that. Uh, parsing languages is incredibly complex. And so this is the AST uh, produced by Clang. And AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. This is a terrible name for this data structure. On the first point, it's not at all abstract. It is completely concrete and precise. There's nothing abstracted here at all. You can, you can see that we have every single precise location of every character relevant here. We've abstracted nothing, okay? The second problem is that this isn't talking about the syntax half the time. Most of these nodes in here are invisible. Implicit cast expressions and array subscripts with more implicit cast expressions. A, a reference to a declaration. None of these things are syntactic. So it is simultaneously an incredibly concrete, specific, and precise tree. 
And it is, it is not talking about the syntax alone. It's talking about the syntax and the semantics. And it gets worse than that. It's also not a tree. It's a DAG. But anyways, despite all of that, we call it an AST. So, so this won't actually help us optimize anything, unfortunately. It's too much information, OK? It's too specific and it's too precise. It has far more to do with the source code than what we want to optimize. So we reduce all of the program down into something much more simple to reason about in order to optimize it. That's the first thing we do. And, and for Clang, it reduces us down to an intermediate representation of the semantics of the program when executing, as opposed to the kind of language constructs used to form it. All right, and that's the LLVM IR, it, uh, where IR stands for intermediate representation. And, and if you do that, you get something like this. And this is still a whole lot of stuff that no one really understands yet. How many folks here have ever worked with LLVM? Got a few people? All right, so, so for those of you who have not worked with LLVM, this is going to be a really fun talk, because I'm going to essentially teach you everything you need to know to understand how LLVM works. After this talk, you will actually understand how LLVM works. Now, I will admit, I'm going to focus on Clang and LLVM. That's what I know best. That's what I work on. Uh, but I'll try and mention where, where things are fairly general and apply to lots of compilers in the world and where they're very specific to LLVM. But we need to understand what this does, because this right now is just a bunch of weird words and you know, weird syntax highlighting. So we need to dive, dive in and actually do a quick you know, uh, uh, brain dump on what the LLVM intermediate representation looks like and how it works. All right. So let's, let's talk about LLVM's IR. So here is something you can probably understand. If you write software, you can probably grasp what this does. We're declaring one function at the very top called G. Okay. Then we're defining another function. It accepts a couple of arguments. You can see that we have types for those arguments. They're 32-bit integers. And we have names, right? The little percent sign in front of the letter gives it a name. We then have some code here. We're adding things. We're calling another function, right? And we're adding more things, and then we're returning the value. You can see that we, we annotate. Every time we use one of these types, we annotate it, uh, one of these names, we annotate it with the type. So we get kind of bidirectional type checking out of this. It's a little bit verbose. But this is mostly machine generated. And so having the, the consistency checking is very nice. And the machine is very, has a very easy time generating this code. Now, one important thing to understand about this representation are where these names come from. This isn't an assignment like you're used to in C, C++, or Java. This is what's called single static assignment or static single assignment. Uh, you can find it both ways. It doesn't matter. SSA form. And what that means is that Assignments can only happen once and are static. They never change. So this percent %c is permanently assigned to the value of this addition. And in fact, we, we actually don't even talk about them being separate. Percent %c is really just the name given to this instruction. All right? That, that's its entire identity. And we never break that invariant. Is it making some sense? All right. So this is, this, is, this is nice. We have you know, basic linear function here, but we need to handle control flow. So to do control flow, we introduce a couple of new constructs. We have multiple basic blocks. Okay? And each basic block is just a sequence of instructions that are executed in sequence. And we have entry as a basic block, then, and else. Okay? Every basic block ends with an instruction that transfers control to some other location. Every basic block ends that way. So the first basic block ends with a branch instruction. And not just any branch instruction, but a conditional one. We have a flag here. And based on the value of that flag, 0 or 1, because it's, it's a 1-bit flag, we either send control flow to the then basic block or the else basic block. OK? And in then, we have a call. And then we return control to the caller with that value. All right? So return is also a, a terminal instruction. And then the else block has a very simple terminator, just returns a value directly. Make sense? Everybody following the control flow here? That's really all there is for control flow. This is all the control flow constructs. I mean, there's some, there some other instructions that are more complicated than branch, but they all follow the same model. They explicitly transfer control flow to some particular destination. All right? 
Now, that gives us control flow, but we don't yet have a way to kind of move data through this graph because all of these variables aren't actually variables, right? They're assigned. Yes, one question. So the, the question is, what is the point of the entry label? Well, you, you could, in theory, branch back to the entry label. It doesn't actually happen, but it's a theoretical thing. But every basic block, just like every instruction, has a name. And you can refer to it like we do here. And so every basic block has a name, and we gave a name to the entry basic block. Other questions? All right. So, so we need some way to move data through this, but we don't actually have variables. We have singly and statically assigned names for an instruction. And so that can't actually you know, choose between two different values. There's no way to actually represent data flow here. So the way LLVM represents data flow is based on this single static assignment form. It's a very important paper in, in, in kind of compiler technology development. And, and it uses a very special instruction called a fee node, okay? And what a fee node does is it actually mentions the edges where control flow comes into the basic block. So this is, this is a fee node for the end basic block. And it's saying that there are two predecessors to end. That is, there are two edges where control can enter this basic block. One of them is from entry, and we can see that here, right, with the branch. One of them is from the then basic block, and we can see that here. Making sense? Now, based on which edge control travels along when it enters this function, this fee will take on a different value, okay? If the control comes in on an edge from entry, it takes on the C value. If control comes in on the edge from then, it takes on the D value. Whichever it is, the new value is in result, and we can do anything we want with it, normal single static assignment form. Making sense here how data flows through this graph, right? Everybody happy with this? Okay. So this is a, so, so here's kind of the most amazing thing. We're done. That's LLVM's IR. We've covered all of the fundamental and important constructs of LLVM's IR for the purpose of understanding optimization, okay? It is an incredibly simple model. It's very reductive. We, re we take away a lot of information and come down to this very simple, very predictable model. This is one of the most powerful things about LLVM's IR because it makes it very easy to teach, very easy to understand, and then fairly easy to reason about. You tend to use the same patterns over and over again rather than having to know about hundreds of different variations on something. And that's, that's a really very important property to this, to this system, okay? Okay, so, so now we, everyone think they're happy with the LVM IR? Think you'll be able to read my next slides with LVM IR? Some nodding, all right? Cool, so let's, 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 let's figure out where were we? We were looking at the IR for Hello World, all right? So let's go back to that. So unfortunately, this doesn't look anything like the examples I showed you. I mean, it's, it, it's, first off, it's a lot of it, right? It's kind of hard to see, but, but even worse, right? We have these allocations, we have a bunch of other things that we can talk about, loads and stores and all kinds of other stuff. This doesn't look like what we were used to seeing. And this is actually the first clue to what the optimizer's role is in the compiler. It actually does much more than just producing really efficient code, okay? The optimizer has a lot larger scope it also is responsible for several other phases of the optimizer, okay? The first thing that the optimizer is going to do is clean up after the front end, okay? The front end, right, we started with this code over here, which was fairly simple, and we produced this very long pile of IR here, which is really complicated. So we need to do something to kind of clean this up. Producing very uh, uh, naive IR in the front end is a significant simplification to building a front end. And so we instead rely on the optimizer to put it into kind of predictable and expected SSA form. All right, so the first step of cleanup is going to do this, which is kind of fast, but I'll, I'll walk through the primary thing it did here. So before we had all of these allocations, if you look at the very top, right, we're allocating memory, and we're storing, and we're loading from this memory. 
the first thing the optimizer is going to do is it's going to try and, and just replace trivially evident stores and loads with that single static assignment form and with fee nodes to represent data flow around the control flow graph. And so if we look at the new version of it, we don't have any of those allocations, all right? And we have a fee node at the bottom that handles the actual data flow, okay? And you can see kind of more what's going on here. It's gonna start to correspond, right? We start off with the comparison, right? And indeed, we have a comparison over here, right? And if it goes in one direction, right? If, if, if argc is in fact not equal to three, then we jump to this end location, right? Or sorry, we go jump to the then location. We look at the then, and the then just returns. We can look at the return, and if we come from this then location, we select the value negative one, and we return that value. Making some sense? This is starting to look like this code. Now, if we, if we go to the end location, right, because this, this, this comparison failed, which means this comparison failed, we end up here, and we start to see code that looks more like what we would, we would expect. So there's this weird get element pointer thing here. That's a little bit unusual. The get element pointer is essentially doing pointer arithmetic. It's a strange formulation for pointer arithmetic. Instead of adds and multiplies, we instead have this very confusing get element pointer. But you can think of it as essentially doing array subscripting. That's, that's the idea here. Then we load, we call, we do more pointer arithmetic, we load more things, we call, and then we add things together, okay? And this is essentially modeling these two calls, where we have a pointer subscript, right? And so we do the arithmetic, we load, and we call to A to I, okay? And we do that again, call A to I, and then we sum the results, right, with this add, and we return that value. Folks liking this so far? Feel like you can understand kind of how we're modeling the semantics of this program in a dedicated IR? Questions? Trying to make sure I don't miss any questions. If I miss you and you have your hand up, shout out. Oh, we got one? Okay. She's bringing you a microphone, and that way I'll be able to hear. Here, while we're getting the microphone, there's a question down here. Go ahead. So the question is, why isn't there a return statement inside the then? We're going to get to that. Question at the back? Yeah, a uh, question, why we cannot just return directly in the if then? S yeah. can, can you say one more time? Why we can't directly return in the if then? That's the f that's question we had at the front. So, so we're going to get to, the, to why this is in the particular way it is. My big question is, do you understand the model? And it sounds from the questions you're asking you do, which is great. All right, so, so let's, let's figure out why it is that this looks this way. Right? And that's actually step two, which is called canonicalization. Because there are a million different ways you can write code. Let's look at a trivial set of examples, right? All of these things, right, assuming no weird side effects or anything else, all of these programs do the exact same thing. They produce the same result. But there are a bunch of different ways to write them, even at the C level. There are just as many ways to represent them inside of LLVM's IR. And we don't want to kind of reason about all of these different variations, right? We'll keep guessing, we'll go back and forth. It'll be really hard for us to predict the right what pattern to expect. To, to make the optimizer not have this explosion of complexity, we have to canonicalize each of these patterns into the same predictable pattern that the optimizer is expecting, okay? And so, if we look at this code, right, there are a bunch of things that are kind of weird and idiosyncratic about this that we can, we can kind of start to canonicalize. So the very first thing is we're comparing against not equal to, right? And the, the, the canonicalizer is going to look at that and say, like, well, not equal to and equal to are pretty much the same thing. I'd like to not have to reason about both of them, and so it will simply reverse operands as necessary to always form equal to. And so, I know it's quick, but you can see we have not equal to here, right? We have two labels here in a particular order. We switch it to equal to, and we flip the order of the labels, which preserves the semantics, but brings us to kind of a consistent pattern. We always prefer equality tests over not equal. 
All right, so that's the first step of canonicalization. The next step is exactly what you asked about. Why do we have this if-then return? All right, we can, we can fix that and just go directly to return, and we have to fix up this fee node to mark that now the predecessor is this entry block, right? Not, not just uh, not the if-then block. Make sense? And so the optimizer is going to do this very systematically throughout all of the code. And, and you might think this is a trivial thing, but this is actually incredibly important. This is probably the most important thing that the optimizer can do to manage its own complexity and to manage this, the kind of explosion of state space it's required to look at. And this is actually an area where LLVM is uncommonly effective. Uh, it is one of the most effective canonicalizers among all of the compilers we've seen out there. Uh, GCC, ICC, and Microsoft's compiler all tend to be substantially less effective at canonicalizing. They tend to have to handle a wider explosion of, of, of permutations of code as a consequence. This is an area that LLVM really pushes very hard, and part of that comes from this very minimalistic and reductive IR. We have to because we form so many different patterns of IR. All right, any questions about, about this canonicalization idea before I, I start moving on? Yes? In the, in the code uh, that uh, came from the front end, I saw something that looked a bit like the uh, uh, entry frame, uh, like the stack frame of yes. the function, and here it disappears, and then I, ex uh, I imagine it uh, appears again after the in the code generation phase. So, is it really necessary to to, to like do it like this? Um, so, so, so the idea here is that the front end actually has some information that gets actually removed here, and and it does. And the idea is that we want to make this intermediate form simpler, so it's easier to optimize. All right, so let's let's keep going to the third phase because this is where we're going to spend most of our time, collapsing abstractions. Okay. So this is the third major activity of the high-level optimizer. This is actually where, where I, I, I spend most of my time. This is the part of it I love. Because if you write C++ code, you'll understand that one of the, the kind of the promises of C++ are zero-cost abstractions, right? Zero-cost being this kind of you know, very lofty goal that is often very hard to achieve. And, and this is actually the part of the compiler that most often steps in to allow you to have truly zero-cost abstractions. So, so let's start digging into exactly what uh, abstractions your program is made up of. I'm going to make a bold claim that there are exactly three abstractions in all of your software. All right. Everything comes down to essentially functions, right, and calls between functions, right, loads and stores and memory, and loops or iteration. Now, if you want to think about, about why this is the case, Think back to think back to Turing machines, right? Think back to the very basics of programming. All right, what do you need to have a Turing machine? Well, you need to have tape, which we represent typically with memory loads and stores. All right, you need to have branches, which control flow, right? You need to have iteration. The two things that form loops are a branch and iteration, right? And then the final thing, functions, are what we add as programmers in order to reason about large, complex programs. So functions are completely synthetic. There's no need to have a function in your program. But you, the programmers, actually add functions because that's how you can comprehend the software you're building. Okay? And so of all of these things, functions are probably the most important to remove because they're the ones that are truly synthetic. They, they, they have no business being in the basic computational model. Memory and loops will only be able to help a certain amount because there has to be memory and there has to be iteration. There has to be control flow. Otherwise, there's, there's, there's nothing at all uh, to, to compute about. But some of both memory and some of loops are, are actually abstractions as well, added by programmers because they need to reason about things in a simpler way, and we want to take those out. We essentially want to reduce your program down to this very minimal state that looks very much like the basics of computation, that looks like the control flow iteration, and, and memory access is necessary to compute something, not ones added by programmers to reason about their software. So, so all of the other uh, fundamental optimizations, which I'm going to completely skip over, if you ever have taken an optimizer class, there are lots of things discussed there that I'm not going to talk about, because I'm going to focus on this collapsing of abstractions. 
All right, so let's talk first about function calls. This is, this is probably the most important one. It's purely synthetic, and yet it's incredibly uh, impactful. The optimization which collapses function call abstractions is called inlining, all right? And that's essentially taking a function which is being called by some other function and just inlining that code into the other function, which is a very nice way to reduce abstractions. It's the single most important optimization in every compiler I'm aware of because this is the purely synthetic abstraction boundary programmers insert. If we don't remove these, we get nonsense code uh, out of the optimizer. Unfortunately, this is also just about the hardest optimization in the entire compiler, okay? It's, it's absolutely impossible to get this perfect because it suffers from the Goldilocks problem. Uh, so how many folks here have heard of the uh, American fable about Goldilocks? Not very many, yeah. So, so this is this really terrible uh, uh, story. You can, you can look it up. It's, it's absolutely terrible in its original form uh, from, from the Grimm brothers. It's a very dark and kind of scary thing that because, you know, we, we don't like to think of dark, scary things, we've kind of, you know, cleaned it up and fantasized about it. And it's this idea that, you know, a girl goes to this house, right, and she's hungry, right? And there are three, there are three bowls of porridge that she wants to go and eat from, okay? She tries one bowl and it's too cold. She tries another bowl and it's too hot. And then she finds the third bowl and it's just right. And the fable goes on as she tries these alternatives. And then she discovers at the end of it that this house she's in it belongs to three bears, a little bear, a middle bear, and a tall bear, and they come in and eat her. <laughs> because it's a grim kind of scary story. And this is exactly what I feel like when I work on the optimizer. Because if you inline too much, you end up making your code look like this scary monstrosity, right? If you just keep inlining away all of these abstractions, you bloat the code beyond all reason, right? It's terrible. But if you don't inline enough, then the optimizer just turns off because all it sees are abstractions and it doesn't know how to reason about what your program does. So you somehow have to find the porridge that's exactly the right temperature. It's incredibly hard, okay? And there's no right answer. There's no perioptimal state that you can pursue here, and that makes it a very frustrating part of the optimizer to work on. And you end up producing programs that look like this. All right, so how does the inliner in LLVM work? The first thing we need to do is we need to be able to reason about these function calls that make up your program. And we do that using graph theory, okay? So we can imagine that each of these green arrows is a function call between each of the functions, all right? So A over here calls B, B calls C, C calls A. The first thing you'll know, and this is true in all of the real function call graphs in the world, there are cycles, okay? This isn't an acyclic graph, it's just a directed graph. So the very first thing we do is we try and apply some graph theory to reason about these function calls. And we identify what are called strongly connected components. Right? And that's, that's all of the nodes which participate in a set of cycles. When we and so if you look at these, we can see there are three cycles here, right? A, B, and C, D, E, and F, and G, H, and I. Okay? So that's the first thing. We identify these, these strongly connected components. Now we have a directed acyclic graph between the strongly connected components of functions. Making sense? Once we have this directed acyclic graph, we can do interesting things from a graph theory perspective. Notably, we can traverse it in a topological order, okay? So we can start down at this leaf, which is easy to reason about. Because if we're trying to remove function call ab abstractions, right, this leaf is really easy to reason about because it doesn't call anything else. There's, there's nothing to do, right? It's very straightforward. So we start in this kind of bottom-up walk in order to, to allow ourselves to, to kind of break apart these abstractions in a reasonable way. This is called a bottom-up, SEC-based call graph walk, which is a bit of a mouthful, right? All right, so we start here, and we look at these functions, okay? And we, for now, we're gonna, we, we can ignore the cycles, right? We're going to just look at these, these functions as a unit. They don't call anything else. Okay, so there's no function call abstraction to remove. We let the rest of the optimizer run on them because all of the function call abstractions are already gone for these three. And then we kind of go bottom up and look at the next set, okay? Now we look at these and we can actually say, ah, we have one interesting inlining opportunity here where E calls G. The nice thing is we've already optimized G 
Okay, we've already optimized it. We've we've you know deleted all the dead code we can. We've we've inlined things. There wasn't anything else to do, right? It's as easy to analyze as we can make it at this point, point. and that means when we try to understand whether or not that we should inline G into E, we have the maximum amount of information about G. We're not we're not being bothered by other abstractions. Okay. And then we can finish that SEC, move on to the next, right? And again, we've now fully optimized this SEC, right? If we can inline G into E and inline E into D, we've already done that. And if that simplifies D, we can see that. And that lets us make an accurate estimate about whether to inline D into B, okay? So this is really important bottom-up walk. Now, this doesn't help us within a cycle. Within a cycle, right, we don't have this topological ordering. So we just have to pick an order. And, and within each SEC, we just walk in that order. And if we want to get really fancy, we can iterate a few times within the SEC to understand it. But by chopping up the graph into these connected components and walking in topological order over it, we, we constrain the space that we have to do this expensive search over because we can do everything else in an ordered fashion. All right, is this making sense to folks? Do I see any nods that aren't nodding off? We've got a question at the back on the left side. See, the real reason I get you guys to ask questions is so that I can drink water. <laughs> okay, so you said that uh, the dead code is uh, optimized during uh, the bottom-up way. So first it will be for the yellow uh, connected component eliminated. Uh, so if there is some dead code that calls from I to C, would it affect the optimizer? That in calls a, from? From I to C, but to it's C. a dead code. So it, it is just some something, maybe uh, just even as simple as if false, call C. Yes, okay, so, so the question is, you know, before we built all of these SECs, what if there was a call edge from I over to C here? And this was actually one big connected component. And then we go and we delete that call, how do we then reevaluate it? That's actually a great question. The current inliner in LLVM doesn't handle that exact case. There is a four year project to rebuild the infrastructure in a way that allows LLVM's inliner to detect when we change the cyclic structure and rebuild the topological walk in order to handle that. But it turns out to be incredibly complicated. It also turns out to not happen so often, and so we haven't been motivated before the last few years to really change this. But it's a great observation. It is a limitation in the way it works right now. Question at the front. Uh, if I have a recursive call, then uh, does LVM change it to like f using a ta tail calls to, to, to some could it change it to, to a loop, and if it does some, when does it do so, it? So there's a question, what happens if you have recursive calls? Right now, recursive calls are, uh, so, so direct recursive calls are, n are not modeled in the call graph itself, and LLVM actually doesn't optimize them very well. There's also a major effort in LLVM to do that, but it also hasn't made a lot of progress. Um, direct recursive calls don't actually come up as often as you might think, though, um, in hot code. All right. I want to keep moving to make sure we get to some other stuff. So let's, let's keep looking. So the big question here is we have this inlining decision to make, right? Like we have this inlining edge decision. And that's essentially a cost modeling question. And the question is how does the optimizer actually model the cost to decide whether or not to inline? And this is, this is actually the hard part of inlining. I mean, the actual transformation of inlining a function is easy. But this cost modeling and this evaluation of complexity is incredibly complicated. And it's based primarily on context. So let, let's look at some examples. So we have this function g, OK? It's a very straightforward function. We also have a function f. All f does is kind of rearrange arguments and then call g. This happens all the time in real code. It's a wrapper function. It's an adapter, right? This actually comes up constantly. And so we definitely want to inline this because the complexity of calling f Right, like it is the same as the complexity of calling G. That's all it's doing. If we can inline this, we just replace one function call with another function call. This is always a win. Okay, and so we really want to inline this case. It's a really good example. 
Let's look at another example that is perhaps more interesting. Ima imagine this fancy sort function, okay, Th that you're going to call before you call std sort. So this std sort is some big, complicated algorithm. But you notice most of your containers are empty, right? You don't need, you don't need a lot of complexity to sort an empty container. You've also got a lot of containers that have one element. You don't need a lot of complexity to sort one element. It is sorted. You're done. So, so okay, we can, we can handle this pretty well, right? Let's write our custom sort function. It's fancier, right? The first thing it does is it says, hey, if the size is less than one, less than or equal to one, we're done. And then even if it's two, it's actually really easy. It's just one swap, right? We can, we can do both halves of this one go super fast, right? Really, really nice. And then we fall back to std sort for everything else. So now, to, to figure out if this is a good inlining candidate, we have to know a lot about the caller of fancy sort, right? We have to know whether its size is going to hit one of these special cases in which case, this is clearly a good inline candidate, right? If, it's, if it hits this special case, inlining, it just deletes the code, right? That's, that's got to be a win. But if it doesn't hit any of these special cases, we're just going to add special cases to code, right? And then have the fallback. We haven't made anything better, okay? And this is, this is the challenge of the inline cost estimation. It depends on this argument, this vector. And so we really precise context when we call the function and then apply that context to analyze the body of the function in order to estimate cost. Make sense? This is, this is a huge part of the LVM optimizer. All right. As you might imagine, this doesn't always work, okay? This is a, an incredible, incredible challenge. So let's look at a case where this doesn't always work. And this is actually from real code. This is actually something that, that actually came up working on, on C++ code uh, and, and working on the LLVM optimizer. So imagine you have code that looks like this. Has some function, right? Takes some big state object, does a bunch of complex stuff on it, then produces a final value, all right? And now you have this variadic function, okay? Classical variadic function. Now, if you call this variadic function with a whole lot of arguments here, okay, what you're actually going to do is you're going to create this incredibly tall chain of calls, okay? Incredibly tall, maybe hundreds of calls deep. And inside of each one of those, right, you're going to have some complex code, and then you're going to kind of peel one element off and part of that, and then you're going to call kind of the next, the next thing. It's just this long chain of code. Now, the inliner, it's going to work bottom up. So it's going to start at the very bottom, and that one's going to be an easy case, like maybe it inlines that one, because this complex code isn't, it isn't too much code, so maybe the inliner does it. Then it inlines again and again and again. At some point, it gives up, because this complex code, several layers of this complex code add up to a giant pile of code, and it's way more than the inliner wants to deal with. So the inliner gives up, goes on about its way, right? pops up and up and up and up that call stack, and eventually it hits a caller at the very top of the call stack, which sees, oh, wait a minute. We called this thing with a bunch of arguments. Every single one of the arguments is a constant. All of them, right? But we didn't inline some of those intermediate functions, okay? So, so what we see is we see a bunch of constant arguments being passed in to a function that then calls another function, then calls another function, then calls another function, and we lost track of it, right? The inline cost estimation completely falls over here. We have no way of connecting the context at the first call with constant arguments to the actual inlining decision that matters at the bottom, okay? And so constructs like variadic templates, which in introduce an incredibly deep stack of function calls, are very dangerous to the optimizer. That doesn't mean they're bad, it just means that they're risky. And so you've got to watch out, especially when you have this complex code inside of a variadic call stack. That means that it may be hard for the compiler to completely flatten this and give you simple looking code. Making sense? All right. It's a lot about function calls. Let's talk a little bit about another abstraction. Let's talk about memory, loads and stores to memory. I tend to spend less time talking about loads and stores to memory because I actually think programmers tend to have a good intuition about what, how memory works and, and what, what constitutes memory in their software. This is probably the least confusing part of the optimizer's abstraction kind of destruction mechanism. 
So here, here's some kind of typical code, okay? And what this code is going to do is it's going to try and form that SSA form. It's going to try and take loads and stores, which are in memory, and lift them out of memory into this high-level SSA form that you can represent. So we start with, you know, allocated memory here, some stores, some stores, a load, and a result. The primary thing that the optimizer is trying to do is to take this and turn it into something that looks like this. The way the optimizer does this is it kind of thinks about what values are available at each location in memory in each part of the control flow graph. So it, let's let's start with let's start with the uh, sorry let's start with the memory. Okay. So in the memory one, we start off with the entry block, and we store this value c into it. All right. At the end of this entry basic block, we know that the value of c is available in this memory location. We then go to then, right? And we store a value d into it, OK? Then at the end of the then basic block, we go to end. And so as end happens, we know that depending on control flow, we have one of two possible values in that memory location. And this is how the optimizer chooses to lower it. We remove all of the stores, but we track these as available values in the control flow graph. And then when we see this merge point in end, we insert a fee node to select between the possible available values. Making sense? All right. So then we see, but like that, that's, that's a very simple thing, right? That's the, these are loads and stores that the, the front end introduced for you. You didn't even write these in your code. And then the optimizer just cleaned it up with a very simple algorithm. The more interesting case where we're actually breaking through an abstraction that programmers use is when you have structures, when you have aggregates of lots of different values and some layout in memory. And that tends to look like this. And this starts to get a little bit bigger. Sorry for that. So at the very top, we have a type, this percent uh, %s, which is our struct type. And we say it has three 32-bit integers in this type. All right? That's the memory layout that, it, that this particular aggregation is using. We allocate this in memory, and then we have to do pointer arithmetic. So this is doing pointer arithmetic. You can think of it like an array index. Right? So this is the zeroth element in that array, that we get th in that structure, the first and the second element of the structure. And we go into each one and we store percent %c, then 0, and then 0. So we have three values in the memory, percent %c, 0, and 0. And this is actually going to be in memory because the programmers wrote something that put this in memory. When you have this aggregation, you fundamentally have a memory construct. And the optimizer is going to try and remove that abstraction for you. And so we actually uh, have to partition this memory into distinct slices that you're accessing so that the original algorithm of you know, tracking the available values works and we can put this into SSA form. Okay. So the very first thing we do is we slice this up into each of those i32 slices, following this pointer arithmetic. And so then we see more stores to those slices, loads down here. But now they're all independent. Instead of being part of the same memory, we partition it into independent pieces of memory. And then we run the other algorithm and track what values are available in memory, or fee nodes to handle the selection. In other cases, we actually fold it all the way through and we get the result. Make sense? So this is what most of the memory abstraction reduction looks like. Questions, brief questions about this. Now I want to get on to a more interesting abstraction. OK, so memory is kind of boring. What about loops? Do we really need to talk about loops? I used to think loops were really boring. I didn't like them. I didn't want to talk about them. I didn't feel like there were a lot of interesting abstractions in loops. Because you know, if you really cared about writing loops, right? You'd you don't write in C++, right? If you really care about loops, write in Fortran. How many folks here have written Fortran? Anyone? It's a beautiful language. You should go try it sometime. Uh, it will challenge you, because you have to think about problems differently to write in Fortran. It's not, it's not a language for writing general purpose programs, and so it, it really forces you to think differently. Um, but it, it has its beauty. It has this really clear modeling of mathematical problems that we used to solve in computers all the time. And I thought, you know, this is where all the loops are. Like, we can leave it to the Fortran compilers to optimize them. I'm busy inlining, inlining all of the wrapper functions and adapters in my C++ code, right? But it turns out there are a bunch of interesting loops in C++ these days. 
Uh, anyone here heard of the Eigen project? A few people? You should go read up on Eigen. It's a fascinating project. It uses templates to, to allow you to essentially write very complex mathematical programs, and then the templates themselves enable domain-specific optimizations, which then gets lowered in, through, through C++ into LLVM. If you're using Clang at LLVM, we optimize it further. It's great stuff, all right? It does amazing, amazing things. And it's probably responsible for a very substantial fraction of all of the world's compute cycles these days. A really astonishing fraction of compute cycles, both on your mobile device and in data centers, are spent inside of Eigen. It's, it's remarkable to me. Because if you're using uh, machine learning, right, if you're using any kind of machine learning based framework, it's probably using Eigen under the hood, all right, which is kind of remarkable to me. And, and this is all in C++. So we need to think a little bit about what it looks like to optimize loop abstractions. OK, so let's look at a loop. This is, this is my favorite loop to try and optimize. It's, it's, it's beautiful, right? Simple. This is one statement, right? This is, this is the tr most trivial loop in the whole wide world. So let's look at what the LLVM compiler generates for this code when I, when I compile targeting uh, x86, for example. That's the IR. Maybe a little bit hard to read. That's OK. There's a lot of it. It's, I, I, even I can't read it. It's, it's totally lost, right? This is just a tremendous amount of code from this tiny little function, right? Tiny little loop. But, but what the optimizer is doing is it's trying to find an incredibly efficient way to execute it. But that's not really collapsing abstraction. So we're going to look at somewhat different loops to understand the actual nature of loop optimizations inside of the LLVM compiler. All right, so let's look at a, a simpler loop, and let's look at it directly in LLVM's IR. So this is actually the same loop I showed you, okay? Um, but before all of the crazy stuff has happened. All right, so we come in at the beginning, right? We load some stuff, right? We load the, the begin pointer out of the vector, right? We, we load the end pointer. We check to see uh, where things are, right? We go to the loop head. In loop head, we have these lovely fee nodes. Do our comparison to see if we're at the end. If we're at the end, we exit. If we're not at the end, right, we keep going. If we keep going, we, we you know, load, load through the pointer, do a sum, and then we, we, inde we, we increment the index, and we go back to the head. Does that make sense where this loop is going? So the loop is kind of going round and round and round and round and round these two basic blocks until it stops here when it's done, and it goes to the exit. Make sense? That's what iteration looks like in LLVM. Doesn't use anything more than we've already seen. It's just a particular pattern of branches that turn into a loop. So now we see this. But the, the first thing you should kind of think about is there are a million different ways to write this, right? So the very first thing we have to do is we actually have to canonicalize it, just like we do with the scalar IR. We have to pick up very specific representation of the loop in order to get it right. And LLVM has a very, very specialized representation that it wants every loop to be in. OK, so, so the very first transformation looks like this. And it may be a little bit surprising what, what this is doing. So the first thing it does is it has a precondition, OK? It, it separates the condition about whether it should even begin to loop into a separate check up here at the top. All right, the next thing it does is it inserts a dedicated basic block that is outside the loop but always enters the loop, this loop preheader, or loop.ph. All right, this always enters the loop, okay? Now we don't have a separate basic block. Now the loop is just this one basic block that we go over and over and over and over and over again until we stop, we go to the exit, and then we fall out of the exit. And you'll also see this exit block. We have a dedicated basic block, which is only reached when you leave the loop. So if we didn't loop at all, you never showed up here. But when we leave the loop, we always reach this, and then this falls through to the final exit. OK? The last thing of loop canonicalization we're doing here is this fee node. Because this fee node looks different from every other fee node you've seen. There isn't a merge between two control flow edges here. This exit only has one predecessor, the loop block. But we still have a fee node for it. 
This merely marks that a value defined inside the loop and redefined every time this loop iterates is actually used outside. It, it's actually the thing that you know, escapes out of the loop and is continued to be used. We insert this marker phi node so we can recognize those values. They're often called loop live out values. Make some sense? All right, so this is the canonical form for the loop. So the first thing I want to kind of show you is why this is useful. So let's imagine some things transform, maybe after inlining or something else, and actually change the inputs to the loop and see how they propagate. So the thing I want you to look at is this end and the begin up here, right? The precondition to check whether or not we're going to loop at all. So what happens if end becomes a constant distance from begin? All right, so again, we, we, we've had this get element pointer, so we did an array index here to try and find the end, and we loaded the end out of memory, so we couldn't see it before. What if some other transformation made what that loaded value was apparent, like it is here, where we can just compute end directly as being four past the beginning, okay? Once you do this, it becomes very clear that we don't actually loop at all. We actually can predict that this is going to execute this basic block exactly four times. So if we can turn this into a four, then the loop optimizer can say, hey, I, this, this branch down here happens a predictable number of times. It happens exactly four times. And so we can turn this entire loop basic block that iterates into this basic block, which has four iterations, all right, see we're, we're, we're incrementing by one, incrementing by one, incrementing by one, and incrementing by one. But then we definitively exit at the end. We don't have an actual loop anymore, okay? This is unrolling, this is called loop unrolling and full unrolling. And this is a huge abstraction removal. How many folks have written a for loop with the number four, right, in, in, the, in the bound of it? because you were going to write the same statement like four times. It is a total waste of time to write it. You just write once in a little loop, right? That's an abstraction that you as the programmer put in, and this is how the optimizer removes it and produces efficient code. Make sense? So anyone who tells you that, oh, that's less efficient, you should use a macro or something to stamp out eight iterations, you shake your head at them, and you're like, no, my optimizer will do that for me, okay? Making sense. All right, let's look at the next one. So imagine we have some other computation inside of the loop that doesn't actually depend on the loop, okay? And so here we have first, okay? And we're going to take first, and we're going to load first off of begin. Now begin isn't part of the loop. Begin isn't changing as the loop iterates. And so every time we load first, we get the exact same value, right? We just keep loading it over and over and over and over again, which doesn't have any point, okay? And so what we want to do is we want to actually lift that out of the loop, which I think I did here. Did I get that here? Sorry, we want to sync that. So, so. so we've got this first. We know that it's used, so it's used down here, uh, like we actually use first down here, and then we take that and we use it again here, and then we actually do a multiplication by it. Okay, so we didn't need this first unless we went through the loop, but we don't have to compute it each time, and so we can sync the first load into the loop exit. All right, this is a loop invariant code motion. It's essentially taking code that you wrote inside the loop because that was way more convenient and just moving it out of the loop because it trivially had nothing to do with the loop itself, right? And the compiler is very good at this. We can move things out of the loop. We can hoist things over the loop. We're really, really good at it. Okay. So, we can, we can, let's look at a last kind of fundamental loop abstraction removal. I'm trying to make sure I get correct here. Uh, yeah, so, so we, have this, we have this next loop. And so the next thing we want to do is we want to try and, and, and uh, 
try and widen the loop in some way here, okay? And so you might notice something down here at the bottom. I have this weird vectorization stuff, okay? And that's in order to cause this to happen. So when we're looking at this loop, it's this kind of scalar loop. It's going one chunk at a time, very predictable pattern. But that's not very efficient. We can do a lot better than that inside of this loop. We can actually do a whole bunch of these sums at the same time, which would be much more efficient. And so the optimizer can kind of reason about this loop body, and it can see that, like, okay, so I could do, instead of one, I could do two or four of these at the same time. And, and it kind of does a little bit of unrolling inside the loop, and it interleaves things together to kind of try and do a chunk of work at a time, which is in a much more efficient way. And so if we do this, uh, it unfortunately, it makes the loop quite a bit bigger. Okay, so, so we, we start from this fairly vanilla loop, much like we had to begin with, okay? And, and then we expand it. So at the top, you see loop preheader, okay? That was, that's still the preheader of the loop. But now, we're doing something. We're checking whether the number of iterations is above some minimum number, right? Are we doing enough iterations that kind of doing a chunk of them at a time is worthwhile? So we do that check. And, and if, if so, right, we actually want to go down to this vector, vectorized loop. And the vectorized loop still looks like an LLVM loop. We still have a loop preheader, we have the loop body, but now, instead of doing one thing, we're actually going to do a whole bunch of these sums at a time. So let's look at the next page, because the, this vector loop body keeps going. All right, so now we can see all of this vector body, all right? And we can see that we're actually going to, to load two different things here, right? And we do two sums. Instead of doing one at a time, we're kind of doing two at a time. Make sense? And then we come down and we iterate, just like we did before. Making some sense what we're doing here? All right. So, so that's all of the loop abstractions. Are there, are there questions, before we go on, are there any questions about loops? Loopiness. Hold on, we've got, we've got someone at the back, and then we'll get to you. Okay, so, um, if I got it right, you said before that function calls and loops are total different animals, right? Yes. Okay, but isn't a loop um, most of the time not just a circular function call as it was uh, shown in the, in the graph? Uh, so, so the question is, aren't loops usually kind of recursive function calls? Uh, most, most loops are not. People tend to not write very many recursive calls in, in software these days. Um, I mean, unless you're writing in a functional language, in which case you have tons of them, but they are relatively speaking rare, and they tend to occur in, in uh, places we don't care about optimizing as much. They tend to occur in, in fairly specific places. Um, ideally, what we'd like f to do is we'd like to, when we see an actual recursive call, we'd like to turn it into a loop so that all of these great loop optimizations apply because we don't know how to do any of these for function calls, right? Especially this, this one where we're vectorizing, we don't know how to do that for a function call. Yeah, uh, and um, another question is, um, you said the, um, the first uh, variable you used a couple of slides before yes. isn't changing inside the loop, but that is only true for programs that are not aware of anything outside their own program. I mean, can, uh, can't begin change from the outside. I mean, if I uh, load memory and I load, uh, and I load from my memory called begin, okay, and it so is changed from the outside. So, so, so the idea is that we're loading from this memory each time you go through the loop. Can't something change from the outside? In theory, sure. But we don't have to operate in theory. We can actually look at this structure of the code to figure out whether that can be possible, OK? So let's look at the code. So after we load from this memory, what happens? We have a get element pointer. Well, that just does arithmetic local to my function. right? We have a comparison that's local to my function. We, we may go back around the loop to the beginning. We have some phi nodes that's clearly local to the function. We load from memory, but we don't store to memory, and we do an addition. So none of those operations change memory. So nothing inside of the loop is changing memory. So it's very easy to see that memory isn't changing because of code inside the loop. But now let's look at code outside of this function, 
right? Maybe, maybe there's some code in some other thread changing memory. But you see, this load doesn't say anything about atomic or synchronization. Neither does this other load or any of the other instructions here. And that means that if something outside of this function is changing memory in another thread, right, then this load would be a race condition if it were observing those memory modifications. And since we know race conditions can't happen, we can, we can conclude that nothing outside of this function is changing the memory behind our back. All right? And, and LLVM has explicit modeling of atomics, much like C++ does, so that it can make that distinction, so that it can look at this load and it can say, like, no, 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 this is not an atomic load. This can't be observing something that another thread is doing, right? And I can look at all of the se code sequence in my, co in my function, and that doesn't modify memory, so I can reason about this locally. Make sense? If, if not, find me, or, or I have a whole hour and a half Q&A session uh, later today. I'm happy to dig into this in more detail and show you the, the before and after code, anything you want, okay? Okay, thanks. So a question down here. There's one over there as well. <coughs> yes, so uh, um, you showed an example with uh, computing the sum of the vector if I passed a vector which is known to the compiler uh, as a I just passed some constants there. Would it be smart enough to, well, not only unroll it, but also compute the sum of the vector using the constants? I think it's constant folding. So, so the question is, if, if not only is the size of the vector known, but actually the contents of the vector known, can it actually do the sum? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to see that with a, with a, a standard vector, but if you, if you look at how LLVM optimizes, for example, Sterlin, or stir care, a C function, and if you wrote the equivalent loop in code over a, a constant string of characters, uh, we actually have special code that will try and actually compute what it, what, where that loop stops in the end offset and, and other things very much like that. We try very hard to do that. It's hard to do. The way we do that is we actually build an algebraic model for every computation inside of the loop. And then we see if the thing that comes out at the end and the trip count being a constant allow us to solve an equation that computes the result. And when it does, we can do that. It's very hard for us to do this when we're going through memory, but we have a few special cases where we try and do that through memory. And that's, I'm going to talk about that specifically in the next slides. Hi, I wanted to ask if uh, this, these compiler optimizations are smart enough, let's say, to take two things at one at a time. Let's say we have a structure of three ints and we get a vector of structures like that. My next slide. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic question. Okay, so what happens when we combine these abstractions? Right, we've talked about like inlining and isolation and we talked about memory and isolation and then we talked about loops. But what happens when you know, we have structures and inline, or, or uh, your question was what happens when we have memory and, and a loop and, and the reasoning about the loop requires us to reason about memory. So let's look at this case. We're gonna talk about structures and inlining in particular because this is in my opinion what makes optimization really, really hard, okay? Even harder than it seemed like to begin with. All right, so we have these two functions, really straightforward functions here, right? Uh, we have f and g. We declare an integer a here, or an integer c here, right? We, c we call g with a, b, and c. c is an output parameter, right? We store the value of a times b into c. Makes sense as c code, right? So the interesting thing to think about, actually, what happens if you were to lower this into ir, right? This is a reference. In IR, that's actually going to be in memory, right? That's going to be a pointer. And this is going to be storing into memory, okay? And then up here where we return, we're going to have to load from that memory in order to get the value of C back, okay? And that makes it much harder to reason about the behavior of this code because now we have both memory and inlining. If I can't inline G into this call for any reason, I mean, in this case, it's very trivial. But like if G for some reason is in another, another file or it's really large, there's something that prevents me from inlining G into this caller, then I can't reason about the value of C here. I can't reason about the fact that like the value of C is closely related to the value of A and B and maybe there's a better way to implement this math. Okay, because I've, I've lost visibility into that data flow. 
Now compare that to the case where you actually don't put things in memory, right? You have G where you just pass it A and B, but it returns the value of C, right? This can be much easier for the optimizer to reason about. It has a lot more information here. It's not escaped in memory. So, so when you're looking at this G, what happens if G stores the address of C into a global variable somewhere, right? What happens if it synchronizes with some other thread? You could do anything. Right? It's off in memory. It's unanalyzable. Whereas when it's a returned value, it's much easier to analyze what's happening here. Right? G doesn't access memory any longer at all. There's nothing about memory involved here. Right? And so it's much easier for us to reason about this. And this is a somewhat reduced example, but what happens when this scales up? So let's look at a more realistic example. This actually comes up a lot in real code, and it's incredibly frustrating to me. So you've got some struct. Right, you've got some floating point values in it, you've got a double in it, and you've got some computation. Right? And now you, you have some expensive computation that assigns these initial values. Okay? You, you set up the delta, right? and, and there is some mathematical relationship here that's quite nice. And then you run compute. Now the most frustrating thing to me is that when you run compute, something very unfortunate happens. All of this information, everything we've done above here in this computation, is put into memory. All of it. All of S is in memory now. We can't even split S apart into separate pieces of memory. Okay? And the reason we can't is because this member function has a this pointer. Okay? And we access all of these members off of the this pointer. So when we call this function, we have to produce a pointer to a region of memory that has this exact layout just as it is here and hand that to the compute function. And then the compute function has to pull things back out of memory and start reasoning about them. This is really complicated, right? Remember that cost estimation, that evaluation of complexity that takes place in order for the inliner to make its decision. So here comes the inliner, and it's looking at this call site. Now what it wants to do to understand the complexity and whether or not to inline this call site is it wants to look at the context in which it's called. But we've now placed all of that context in memory instead of in SSA values. We've added an abstraction boundary in the context of this inline in cost, and now the inliner has to try and reason not just about trivial data flow, but about values in memory and how they'll be used inside the function also from memory, right? This defeats about 80% of our inline cost estimation, uh, more like 99% of our inline cost estimation, even today. We have somewhat crazy ideas that might get us to only losing 80% of our inline cost estimation, maybe at some point in the future. But this makes the estimation of all of this thing tremendously more complicated. Okay? And if we just change this in a fairly simple way, the problem goes away. So imagine we just have a struct that represents this aggregation of values. And we have a separate function that accepts it by value and returns the result by value. Okay? Because this isn't a member function, there's no longer a this pointer. That's gone. We're actually passing this in by value. And that means that we don't have it in memory at all. And so when we have this code here, if, you know, after inlining we discover that there's a constant C that is often put into this field, right? This S is no longer in memory. The inline cost estimation can track this delta value. It can see this predicate of C and consider that context when evaluating inline cost for compute, okay? Because you've taken it out of memory, you've removed one of these abstractions and given the optimizer more insight, okay? So that's, that's one of the most awesome things I like to see inside, inside the inliner. It's, this, this helps us a lot. All right. So a bunch of folks, but just, just hold on, we're about done, and then you can ask all the questions. So a bunch of folks expect me to say, like, ha-ha! So here is the magical tip that will solve all of your performance problems at the end of this talk. I don't have that magical tip. That's not what the point of this is. Right? The point of this is for you to kind of understand, or at least to start to understand, 
how this optimizer is working, how it's actually reasoning about your code, so you can make intelligent decisions. So you can think about these kinds of trade-offs and make intelligent decisions. But there's always going to be a trade-off. You're going to have to think about it differently in each context. There is not a single right or wrong answer here. And if you, if you, if you expect one, right, you're going to be disappointed. It's going to actually trip you up. You have to think about this you know, on a case-by-case -case, case basis. So hopefully you guys actually feel like you have that context. You've learned something about how the optimizer works. And I'm happy to take questions. I'll try and answer them. Um, won't always succeed, but I'll do my best. So you have, okay. you have one here. I have the question about the last example. Uh, is it worth doing that uh, for the cost of copying the value? Here? So the question is, is it worth it for copying the value? I mean, again, you should evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would assume that it is until something says, hey, you're copying values too often, right? Like, you should be measuring. You, 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 like, if you care about performance, first off, if you care about performance, you're measuring your performance, right? If you don't measure your performance, you can't come and tell me you care about your performance because I'll ask you what your performance is and you won't be able to answer it, right? So you have to be measuring your performance. Once you're measuring your performance, right, you should generally speaking assume that copies are not expensive because generally speaking, they aren't copies, right? There doesn't necessarily have to be a copy here, right? Because this S isn't used again. And in fact, in this particular case, I guarantee you there is no copying taking place here. This S will be passed in registers, not in memory at all. There's no copy to be had here. But sometimes there will be copies, right? There will be some copies, and you'll want to try and fix them. Before you try and, and pass things by, a, by reference, before you have output parameters, I would start off by using move semantics, right? By trying to reduce copies, by reducing your state. Output parameters tend to not actually improve the situation very much. Uh, generally speaking, um, until they're input output parameters where you reuse a common buffer over and over again, they tend to not help. Other questions? Thank you. I would like to ask about your opinion about uh, does it make any sense uh, nowadays uh, to make explicit inline in code or compilers should do this better than we? So, so the question is, should you be explicitly marking code uh, as inline? This is, th this is a little bit tricky. So the first thing to realize is the inline keyword in C++ has almost nothing to do with inlining in the compiler. Which may be surprising, it actually has essentially nothing to do with inlining. So what that keyword does is it makes it possible in terms of linkage to do inlining and to put things in header files, all right? And, and there's not really a whole lot that it does past that. Most of the inlining decisions are already made in the optimizer. Now, there are special implementation tricks like the always inline attribute that GCC supports and ICC supports and Microsoft supports. Everyone has one of these attributes, right? I would strongly encourage you to not use that attribute ever, okay? If you're using that attribute, you have found a bug in the inliner of your optimizer. If you're going to use the attribute, I would ask, please, please file a bug against the optimizer first and then add the attribute with the little comment that says, by the way, we should remove this as soon as they fix this bug over here that's hurting our performance. And it should always be based on performance measurements and you should always file a bug with, with the complaint to the optimizer about why did you not actually inline this. But Hi. yeah, it, it's rare these days, I think. Hi. Um, how do you check the check and test the correctness of optimization output because it's, it's quite challenging in my opinion. Okay, so you're asking how do you check the correctness of the yes. optimization? Yes, yes. What, what kind of test do you perform to, to check if it's correct? So, so we have both a simple and also unsatisfying answer here. Uh, we don't have a very good theoretical way of doing this, so we, we typically build all of the code we have access to, all the tests we have access to without the optimizer turned on, and we run those tests, and we see if those tests, in fact, behave the way the programmer who wrote them expected them to behave. And then for all the tests that do, you know, they work correctly without the optimizer, we turn the optimizer on, and we run the same set, and we build the test, and we run the test, and we see if they still have the behavior the programmer expected. All right? And then there's some number that don't have the same behavior after we do that. And those are either bugs in the optimizer or bugs in the program. And we typically have to stare at the code for a very long time to try and figure out which it is, which is really unsatisfactory. 
but it happens that this is relatively rare. Uh, right? so, so at Google, when we're testing new compilers, we build hundreds of thousands of tests, we run them, we compare the results, and we have very few that actually fail uh, because we turn on the optimizer. And, it's pretty, and we can kind of go through and analyze those and reason about whether they have bugs in the code. One great way to do that is by using things like LLVM sanitizers, which I talked a whole lot about uh, yesterday. And, and I'm happy to kind of show you how those, those you know, can impact optimizers, but that, that's, that gets to a long tangent, which would be great in the, in the Q&A session later today, but we should, we should delay until then. Next question. Oh, we got one down here too? I have a... Go ahead. Uh, I have a small comment about the inlining. Uh, so actually, the LVM inliner uses the in inline keyword key uh, as a hint, and it gives a small bon bonus. Uh, to I know the that inlining. the LVM inliner uses it as a hint, but it's a very small hint. It's one we're actively trying to remove, and I strongly encourage you to not think about the inline keyword as having that property. Please don't use the inline keyword because you want it to inline something. File a bug if it doesn't inline it when you want it to. Uh, yeah. Uh, how would you compare? Uh, uh, LLVM intermediate representation to GCC one? How would I compare it? Well, so the first thing is you're asking the wrong person to a certain extent. I don't use both. And so, so I, I, I kind of have a very peripheral knowledge of GCC's intermediate representation. Um, from what I understand, it tends to be uh, fairly different from LLVMs. So GCC had a representation that predated uh, SSA. And, and so they actually still have pieces of that. And they've layered SSA on top of that. In some cases, this has helped them out because they have extra information in their representation that LLVM doesn't have because LLVM kind of you know, uh, used SSA at every place that it could because it had it on, like, on day one. And GCC didn't have it, and so they built up some very interesting kind of side structures that helped them represent things. Um, on the other hand, it tends to not use SSA as much as it could because they didn't have it on day one, and they've built up these side things. So it's a trade-off, right? I don't know where the right answer is in that trade-off. Off. I'm, I'm very happy with how LVM represents things, but then I would be. I'm biased, right? So I, I don't know if I can give a really definitive answer about which one's the right representation. Okay, thanks. I have a question in the center. Hi. Uh, can you go back to this LVM code? Uh, go back to which? Uh, uh, somewhere where the, the phi func uh, function is used. Uh, we example, find one that's, oh yeah, that's example, readable. Here, here we yeah. go. For example, here, and uh, you know, when you, s you, you you told us that you know this, uh, for example, uh, percent x or percent i, sure, uh, is tag for the for the uh, for this you know line of of function of this 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 call. Yes, it's like a tag. It does. It's it's not a value. So uh, when you when you know when you loop through this code, yes, and you use this phi to 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 make a new value. I don't know value or m make a new tag uh, for this x. It it doesn't like it. it for me, it's like it does. It shouldn't uh, you know keep the state because okay. it's like redefining this tag. So 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 loads are the same way, right? So so the the particular value loaded may change on each iteration. The particular value produced by the the fee node may change on each iteration, but the particular value produced by a sum may change each time a function is called. The idea is not that, that these values have a particular bit pattern that we know. The idea is that uh, they always point to the same instruction, right? The, you can't, you can't have, have a, a name x, right? And then later on say that the name x now references a different instruction, right? But the particular dynamic value produced by instruction can change, right? And that's true for all of the instructions. Okay, thanks. All right, there's a question up there. <coughs> uh, okay, I got two questions. Is optimizer layer aware of a uh, machine that's th that we are compiling the source? And if it's aware or not, uh, I believe that uh, generation uh, code layer is another optimizer, and uh, they may cooperate each other or somehow. Okay. So, so the, the question is really like, how, how does optimization and code generation cooperate? And where, where, where does knowledge of the particular machine you're targeting come in? So at this level, we only have a very abstract awareness of what the machine looks like. 
Um, and, and so we have to only make very abstract decisions. The one of them is something like uh, this vectorization. We don't need to know exactly what vector instruction set the machine supports. We just need to know how big it is and whether it's uh, more or less expensive to use the vectors than to use the scalar code, which is a relatively high level question to ask. We have a very restricted interface that the optimizer uses to do that because the optimizer is somewhat focused on kind of improving your code as opposed to targeting a particular machine. Does that make sense? And, and then later on in the code generator, we do have some elements of an optimizer inside the code generator to, to handle things which are very machine specific, but they tend to be much more isolated, much smaller scale. Uh, this tends to be what deals with the abstractions of the actual C++ code coming in. Next question, someone have the microphone already? I've got some questions, go ahead. Some questions here, and I think we had a question down here as well. Do you have a question? Okay. I, I want to ask about loop optimization. How, go, how, sorry, how are you going to optimize loops uh, when you don't know number of iterations? So how do you optimize loops when you don't know the number of iterations? Well, uh, we do it, uh, so I showed in, in this case, we actually just check dynamically the number of iterations that we can expect. And so we can kind of synthesize a hypothetical loop for a particular number of iterations, and then put a predicate in front of it that checks, uh, do we at least have this many iterations? We do? Cool. Then we can use this code that we generated. And we can use all kinds of things to do this. We can kind of guess a number of iterations that we would like to have for a particular vector instruction set. We might have a profile that tells us, by the way, it looks like this loop iterates thousands of times, generate a special version that handles that case. But we just insert dynamic checks when we have to. Okay, thank you. Okay, j just one more, if you don't mind. Last Shana. question, then. Um, yeah, you had an example of a wrapper function. Um, yes. And you were saying that sort of inlining always turns out to be a win in that case. Um, so does it just turn out that code size sort of empirically is never a concern in those cases? I, I, I would say that empirically that is the case. We actually, we don't have any special case logic for wrapper functions, though. Right? Um, what I'm saying is the observation of how the logic that measures kind of code size tends to respond to wrapper functions. The code size impact of one call and the code size impact of another call that have roughly the same number of arguments tends to be roughly the same. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, we also have a whole hour and a half of pure Q&A session. I'll have a laptop, I'll have code up, and I'll, and I'll be able to answer any questions you want. You can ask really hard questions, and I'll keep talking as long as I need to. And that's in room 9 at 1.30, so after lunch. So again, Chandler is coming back to room 9 for question and answer and ask me anything uh, at 1.30. I could see by your question and in your faces that you uh, understand much better the compiler optimization, including the ones at the back with the dirty conscience. My God, there are a lot of you. <laughs> Mark, uh, sorry, uh, Chandler, thanks very much. Don't miss uh, Chandler's next session. Chandler Carruth. Thank you so much. What are you waiting for? It's a 15 minute break.
Raz. Dwa. Trzy. Raz, dwa, trzy, cztery, pięć, sześć, siedem, osiem, All righty, welcome back. And the person to welcome back is uh, Mark Isaacson, whom you met yesterday. Uh, he was talking about the fundamentals of type-dependent code reuse. Just a quick reminder that Mark is a software engineer at Facebook, uh, where he works on improving that developer experience for all C++ programmers. Uh, one thing that you don't know about Mark is that he's a fan of food and cooking, and uh, he's made his own cheese. He's uh, made his own pasta and a from scratch pizza. So Mark's dream is to try some unique Polish food. Uh, a quick disclaimer, he's already had pierogi. <laughs> so uh, if you want to uh, take him out, you need to be imaginative, but I'm, s I'm sure we can sort something out later in Mlecarnia. So I'm yeah, sure. we'll have a bra brainstorming session for... Mark's food. Anyway, for the time being, it is the set of natural code. So let's have a big hand for Mark Isaacson. All right, thank you. So what is the set of natural code? Well, this talk is about compiler and language trends, modern languages, modern compilers, and what they let us do. Uh, new things that we couldn't do before, old things that we can now do safer, uh, all of the above. So we're going to start this talk with a, a brief look at some history. We're going to talk about C and C++, you know, some of the things that are better in a C++ world. And then we're going to carry on in the future, and we're going to look at where is C++ going. And to do that, I'm not going to, you know, be listing a bunch of standards proposals. Instead, I'm going to show you the D programming language. Now, you might be wondering, why D? Well, D has done a lot of things now for years. It's had things like ranges. And 
a lot of these things, again, like Rangers, are coming to C++. The, the Rangers proposal is expected to ship in uh, C++20. We've got other things like ConstExper, which I think is influenced in part by D. So being able to do more and more work at compile time and what that gives us, what new powers we can uh, take advantage of. And all of this is possible because our compilers are so much better than they used to be back in the day. It used to be when we were talking about the first version of C++, that not only did it take compiler vendors years to catch up with the actual standard, but once they did, it wasn't even fast, right? It just worked. You, you had the Stepanov abstraction penalty benchmark, which was a benchmark saying, you know, we have all these wonderful new safer primitives in C++, but we pay for them. We pay in our runtime and our compile time to make those things work. Well, Long gone are those days. In fact, most of the time, abstractions make things faster, and that'll be a theme that we'll go over in this talk as well. Now, because I'm going to be talking about the D programming language, which I expect nobody in the room has used before, please ask questions. There's going to be syntax up here that is unfamiliar. I'm going to try and explain it. If I forget something, raise a hand. Um, actually, just curious, has anyone in the room used D before? Show of hands. There we go, non-zero. How about people who have heard of D? Exciting. That's you know, more, than, more than one I thought could hope for. So let's dive into our history lesson. If I wanted to write a generic vector-like container in C, one way I might go about that is as follows. I, I would have a function that created it, a function that freed the memory, and a function to add some elements, and I end up storing this as an opaque pointer, a void star, or maybe a type def to void star. We've got some problems here. That void star can be null. That void star might be my container, but it might be something totally different. I allocate it and then put the element in, which I'll talk about why that, uh, it, it may not sound that bad, but I'll explain in a second why it is. And of course, I can forget to free my resources. It's so easy to forget to deallocate the memory. Now, this container only works with integers. If I wanted to make it more versatile to work with any type that I could give to it, I could instead make it so that it accepted void pointers for all the elements but now I've got indirection and allocations. I could copy paste it, I could do templates, but by hand. All of these solutions, not so great. C++, one line, vector of int, container, give it the uh, initial element that I want to put in there right away. This is good for a few reasons. It's strongly typed. I'm never going to be able to put the wrong thing in. It frees the memory for me automatically as it falls out of scope. And a hidden benefit, it allocates the right size initially. I don't have this guess the size that I'm going to need and then add something in and hope I have enough space, maybe call the allocator again. It's, I know how much space I need, give me that much space right away, first thing. So things are better. Here's another example where I think things are much improved. If I wanted to have a square uh, function or macro in C, Things get a little crazy because we don't have overloading. We don't have templates. That's why the absolute value function, you've got abs and fabs. If I want something generic, macros are the only option. They're the only way to do it. And what sucks about macros is that those parentheses, I need them. Without the extra parentheses, if I had just written x times x, it will work some of the time, but not all of the time. I can call it with 2, and it will be correct. Square of 2 is fine. Square of 2 plus 2, on the other hand, falls apart, breaks at runtime, not so great. The template solution in C++, more verbose, yes, harder to make a mistake in. If you make a mistake, you're going to get a compiler error. So just kind of a short history, types make things better. That was, I think, the major kind of increase in our natural language to express ourselves in code between C and C++, is that the type system is so much stronger. Let's talk about D. So D is a systems language. It compiles down to native code. There's no JVM. Uh, on top of that, it is statically typed, same as C++. You have a choice of value and reference semantics with sensible defaults. So integers, they're cheap to copy around. We do that by value. Arrays and strings, which under the hood are arrays, have uh, shallow copy semantics. They're by reference. And I'll show you more of that in just a second and why it matters and why it's important. We have modules decompiles an order of magnitude faster of C++, so fast that for every single D product that I've ever used, and granted, they're not huge, but they're significant, it is faster for me to just send all of the files all at once to the compiler and let it cache those modules than to try and parallelize it on multiple cores or multiple machines with a make file. 
It's just that fast. It's so fast that for my biggest D programs that I use at work, it compiles and begins executing faster than it takes Python to start up. Wouldn't that be wonderful for C++? It's garbage collected. So at this point, you may groan and say, all right, you lost me. The good news is it's optional in the standard library. You don't need the garbage collector to use almost all of it. And everything else on this list we're just going to talk about in the rest of the, the presentation, the exception to that being polymorphism, which, like C++, is kind of optional. So the classic intro program to any language. I think on this screen there is exactly one line that is interesting, one line that doesn't have a direct C++ analog. Does anyone see my favorite line? Any guesses to what my favorite line on this screen is? The shebang line, that very first one. D is scriptable. If I set the permissions right on this file, I can compile and run that, again, faster than it would take Python to start. So D is now my total replacement for Python. Here is a simple program. D has a great power to weight ratio, and by that I mean, look at how much white space there is on this screen. But this program does something useful, especially if I change that file to standard in. Take a moment, look at this program, ask yourself, what does this do? And when you think you know what it does, put up a hand. Would anyone like to volunteer their guess as to what it does? Yeah. Absolutely. So what we're going to do here is we're going to read in a file, sort the lines, put it back together, and print it all out. And that reads like a set of ordered instructions. It's very easy for a human to go through and say, first do this, then do that, then do that. The only tricky part of this is the dot array. That's the part I think that might confuse you. So we have this file. We're going to read it by line. Dot array says create an array, which is more or less like a vector, and put all of those lines into it. So copy all the lines, put them in a vector. Sort that, join it back together with new line characters, and print it out. And one of the cool things that's not so obvious from this code is that it is as efficient as it possibly can be in terms of making copies. There are zero extra copies in this program. That sort happens in place. The join operation is just a view of that data. It does not copy the data and, and put it together in a big, long string. It's just a way of looking at the data in its original form, but as we're looping through it, as we're iterating over the data, it will just insert a new line character and keep going. So there is constant memory usage here, with the exception of the dot array line that is an explicit ask for a copy to be performed. Other than that, there's nothing else. Maybe I.O. buffers, but that's it. And I think that that's pretty special. Now, here's a rewrite of that same program. And I, I did this just to illustrate one thing, and that is the universal function call syntax. If I have a non-member function sort, sort of an argument, I can always rewrite that as the argument dot sort. That is the power that lets me write things as a list of instructions. So I, I rewrote some of the things here, not all of them. Uh, if you're confused by, isn't that a non-member function later on in the talk, this is the magic that makes that all work. So let's look at the C++. I don't like the C++. So, for starters, this is kind of complicated. It, it takes up more of a slide. I think it's harder to read. It's very dense. So just first impressions aren't the best impressions. Uh, we have a, a while get line loop in there. And one of the tricks about that that a beginner might not understand is that that move is essential. If I do not include the move, the standard move call, I will copy all of my data. And uh, an interesting anecdote that I believe Chandler put in one of his talks at CPPCon, hi, uh, was that if you're trying to benchmark a program, there's these subtle mistakes you can make, like not calling move, or not passing by const reference, or, or all these little things that make these tiny little copies all over your program. And if you do that, a profiler isn't going to find that. Because it's not like there's this screamingly obvious, broken, very expensive piece of your code. It's all of your code is equally bad. And so it's hard to find, and it's subtle. And you have to know explicitly to do the efficient thing. Contrast that with D. We explicitly did an expensive thing. In C++, you explicitly do the efficient thing. So sensible defaults are things that show up in modern languages. 
Now, sort, I think, is straightforward. You might be wondering, what's the deal with this string stream? Well, back in the day, I benchmarked, and I found that it was pretty much always better to buffer your output first, if you have a lot of it, and then print it out, as opposed to using C out in a loop or something like that. So again, not something a beginner is going to know to do. You have to do it. You have to use move again so that we don't incur all these copies. This is complicated. It's easy to get wrong. It's easy to go from a solution like this to one that has many more copies. Now, this solution here, the C++ solution, is equivalently performant, equivalently efficient, let's say. It's probably a better way to put it, to the decode. And when I say that, I don't mean that I've benchmarked. I have not benchmarked. What I'm saying is they make the same number of copies. The difference is, did we have to be uh, did, did we have to know to do special things to be that fast? And in D, the answer was no, and in C++, the answer was yes. Now, how, this mag how does this magic build up? To, to answer that question, we have to look at the primitives in D. And some of the things that we're going to look at are going to ship to you eventually in C++. Uh, arrays is unfortunately just going to build up to that idea. So arrays in D are more or less vectors. They have a length, you can concatenate them, all these wonderful things. And the great thing about having a length in your most primitive array-like container is that you can't get the heart bleed bug. For those of you that remember that fun security bug, the big problem there is that they wrote OpenSSL in C. And when you use C, you're forced into using things like C strings. And C strings, you separate the data and the length, and because they're separate, they can get out of sync, and when they get out of sync, boom, you have a bug. So we need better primitives. Always ask, why is the length separate? If you see something like that, your head should go, hmm, that's not quite right. We'll come back to that idea. Now, arrays have reference semantics, shallow copies. An array under the hood is two pointers, a pointer to the front, a pointer to the end. And when I use the assignment operator, all I'm copying is those pointers. I'm not looping over the data. It is a O of 1 operation. And you can see if I change my alias version there, it affects the original. To pay for a copy, I have to ask for a copy. I use dot dupe, dot duplicate. The last thing I want to talk about before we move on is something called slicing. Some other languages have this. Uh, what it is is it's saying, I want to change my view of the data. I'm not going to move the data in memory. I'm going to take those pointers and adjust them. So in this case, I'm getting the slice from index 1 to the end. Dollar sign is shorthand for array.length. So I have my view of the full data. I chop the first thing off. That is my slice. So let's write an algorithm. Let's write our first D algorithm. And to start, I want to focus on the unit test block at the end there. Now again, you can see that I can write a non-member syntax or a member syntax. It's equivalent. You might be wondering, what am I returning and why? So this is a linear search. I think that there are basically four questions you might want to answer from a linear search. The first of which is, is the thing I'm looking for in the stuff I'm looking through? Is the needle in the haystack? And to answer that question, let, let me first tell you what we've got here. So I am returning everything from the element that we were looking for to the end of the original array. So I'm, uh, I'm getting you a slice from the element we found to the end. And if all we want to know is, did you find it? All we need to know is, is it the empty slice? So if, if when we look for 2, we have a non-empty slice, starting at 2, going to the end. And when we search for 0, we find nothing. We get an empty slice out. The second question I think you might want to know from a linear search is, you know, great, we found it. Let me now call a method on it. Let me get a different data member out, if it's something like an object as opposed to an integer. So again, that's easy. I can just index the first thing off of my slice, do whatever I want with it. You might want to know everything that comes after, easily given by the result here. I can slice off what we found, and now I have everything that's left. And if I want to know everything that came before that, again, there's some slicing and math you can do to get that. So I get four answers for the price of my return type being a little not straightforward. Now, how do we produce this result? What is the algorithm? How, how are we implementing this function? Well. First off, notice that it is a templated function. We will accept any kind of array. And templates in D are specified with a second set of parentheses. It turns out that it's easier for both humans and compiler vendors to do matching on parentheses as opposed to the less than greater than stuff that we've got in C++. So great, 
we have this type t, that's our template type. Now the loop reads like this. While there's still stuff to search through, and we haven't found what we're looking for, slice off the first thing and keep going. Now, to make that more clear, if I break this down, if the length was zero, if we had an empty slice, if, if, if that was what haystack was, it was an empty array, then we would just return and again that would tell us we didn't find it. If we found the needle, then the needle's at the front of the haystack and I can just return that and again that is my answer. And otherwise we can chop off the first thing and try again. So that's how the algorithm works. This is our first D algorithm. By the way, one does not fail to write unit tests in D. D unit test is a keyword. And this is kind of interesting. So show of hands, how many of you would say that more than 10% of your code base is tested? More than 20, keep your hands up. More than 40, more than 60, more than 80. Congratulations <laughs> to those of you who still have your hands up. I don't see that many. So in D, I would say we have an above average number of tests. And the reason we do it is because it is built into the culture. It is built into the language. If you want people to do something, make it a keyword. Now, moving on. <laughs> I want to generalize my function. I want this to work with not just arrays, because it makes sense to be able to linear search over other things. And so in order to do that, we need to break down what these three operations are. I need a name for them. So for the first one, for haystack.length is greater than zero, what might be a general way of expressing that idea, of saying, you know, is there still stuff? Shout it out, ideas. Uh, maybe I'll actually ask for a hand. There were lots of different suggestions. Yeah. Dot empty, perfect. So there's a name for that. How about the next one, where we subscript zero? Uh, oh, uh, so, so another way we could have done the first operation, the suggestion is we could have casted a bool. Yes. For our next primitive dot front, look at the first thing. And for the slicing operation, pop front. Get me to the next one. And this might look familiar. There is an analog in C++. These three operations have a similar usage. So in C++, instead of dot empty, we have a comparison. You can compare between the iterator you've got and the end. Are we done yet? You have front, which is dereference, and you have pop front, which is increment. So what I'm showing you here is an input range interface, which is equivalent, in some ways, to an input iterator. And we'll come back to ranges and why they're better than iterators in just a little bit, but part of the reason is that they know their length. It's built in. All right, so I generalized my function. I wrote this version that uses these three primitives. It turns out an array doesn't have a front method, an empty method, and a pop front method. But I want this function to still work with arrays, not just things that already have those methods. It turns out if I implement these non-member methods, empty, front, pop front, and I pass in an array, that is sufficient for making this generalized version of my function work with arrays again. Does anyone remember the technique that, or, or the tool that makes this possible? We've already talked about it. Yeah. The generalized function call syntax. So again, any non-member function can be used like a member function. This is pretty great, and the reason it's great is because primitive types, array types, these are built into the language. The boundary is blurred between those types and a type that I can add any method that I want to. So an integer, I can basically add methods to an integer. An array, I can add methods to an array. And I can just use that the same everywhere. And C++ has a version of this that's under consideration. We'll talk more about that at the end. But big idea here is that we're kind of blurring the boundary between things that are given to us by the compiler, things that are given to us by the language, and things that we make for ourselves. So empty. How do I know if an array is empty? Does anyone have a, a, a solution for that? We've seen it before, back before we generalized. The length, we check the length. For front, we subscript zero. 
to pop front, we use a slice. And here is the entire implementation of an input range. The whole thing fits on a slide, easy. And now arrays will again work with our function. So it works with arrays, and not that you'd want to do a linear search on a red-black tree, but just an example, it does work now with even more things. So let's go a little bit further with our ranges. Let's do one that's lazy. Now, Python has this thing called generators, as do many other languages. And the thing about a generator is, instead of, if I want to get all of the exponents of 2, figuring out what those are and giving them you, to you in a vector, I can instead say, here's the first one. Ask me when you need the next one. And I will lazily compute that next one and give it to you if and only if you ask for it. Now, the advantage of a generator is you don't pay for what you don't use, a wonderful principle, but also that the generator uh, has constant memory. I'm not allocating a full vector of these things. I'm, I'm only looking at one of them at a time. So it's cheaper both in runtime, because you don't pay for the whole thing, unless you actually need it, and it's cheaper in memory. These are the kind of primitives we need in C++, and the ones that we don't have and that we don't see all the time in idiomatic C++. Spoiler alert, they're coming. So I've got this generator of powers. I'll generate powers of 2, I'll generate powers of 3, powers of 5, and I'll use that find algorithm we just wrote to ask, is 512 a power of 2? And one piece of syntax that's maybe not super familiar is I've got the bang character up there twice. The first time you probably are familiar with, that's a negation. The second time is to pass a, tem a template argument, a compile time argument. Now at the bottom there I show the optional set of parentheses. When you only have one argument, it's optional. But that symmetry between the find function signature where I had two sets of parentheses and the call site, that's what's going on there. Now why might I want to pass a base at compile time. My, I'm going to compute powers of 2, and I say 2 is given at compile time. Why would I want that to be given at compile time instead of runtime? What's the advantage there? So I could compute it during compilation, and in fact, yes, we will see an example of that later on. But to answer this question, maybe we have to think about how we're doing it. So exponents are computed by multiplying over and over and over again. I mean, if what I've got is something like 2, something like 4, something like 8, I can just use the shift operation instead. If I tell it the basic compile time, the compiler can say, oh, I know a faster way, and just give you the faster way for free. So you move a thing to compile time, you move information to compile time, you get better results. It's pretty cool. Now, here is again the full implementation of an input range. I have empty. Empty just says, are we going to overflow a U long? I won't go into the math. I store the initial value. So the initial value is 2 to the 0, 3 to the 0, base to the 0. It's always 1. To get the current power, I use front. To get the next one, I compute the next one with pop front. Again, a full input range right here on a slide. And by the way, if I want a template constraint, this is kind of like concepts. Something that says, hey, no, you shouldn't call me with that. I can use any arbitrary compile time if statement to say, eh, you know, base of zero is not allowed because I have an infinite loop and divide by zero. All right. We've implemented two ranges. I've shown you uh, an algorithm. I've showed you a generator. Why do we like ranges? Well, one argument, perhaps a, a simplistic one, is they're just convenient. Sort of one argument instead of sort of two arguments. I like that a little bit better. The left-hand side there, the C++ has something else going on. I'm passing a data, some, some data, and a length. Two arguments. And this should remind us of something terrible. C strings, heart bleed, bugs. I don't know if you've written this, but you can. You can have two different vectors and pass iterators to each of them. One from the first vector, one to the second. That'll compile. It'll make you very unhappy. I've got four bugs, four lines here, four uses of copy. Every single one of them is broken. And let's focus on the C++, because I think that'll be easier for you all to find the bug in. I'm going to copy the 3, 2, 1, 5, 4 from V into out. That's, that's my goal. And 
something here is broken. Every single one of those uses of copy. Does anyone see the bug? Say again. Back inserter is missing. So what that means is the out vector is empty. There's no space to copy things. I can either use a back inserter to grow it as we go. I can call dot resize ahead of time if I know how much I need. But either way, this is a problem. Now you might wonder, why am I showing you code that's buggy in two languages? What would be the point of that? Well, in D, we can give you better diagnostics. So in debug mode, because a range knows how much more data there is, because it knows whether or not it's off the bounds, in debug modes, it can just have a little extra if statement and tell you, you have made an error. There's no more undefined behavior, hoping you're not overwriting something important. Maybe you're going to crash, maybe you're not going to crash. In D, we just would abort the program for free. You don't need ASAN, you don't need Volgrind, you don't need any of these tools that tell you it's just free in debug mode. It gets compiled away in release mode. And yes, there are some versions of C++ iterators, special versions, that have this power too. But one of the issues that shows up if you do that is that it changes the sizes of your iterators, because now they need to know the bounds. Ranges already know. So that's kind of cool. But we can get more compelling. If I want to reverse the way I'm looking at the data, I'm not making a copy of the data, I'm just saying look at it the other way around. I can use a range modifier. I can say array.retro. Sure, C++ has this too. Sort things in reverse order, fine. What if I want to filter? What if I just want the even numbers from my input? Well, I can use dot filter, and the way that this lambda function, that's what that is, reads is for each A, if A cleanly divides by two, keep the element. And the cool thing is that this is lazy. It has O of one storage. We're not allocating a copy. If you want a copy, you can ask for it. You can say dot array, make me a new array that contains the result. But otherwise, it will just compute it on the fly as you're iterating through. It'll skip the elements as it goes. In C++, there is no idiomatic way to do this in C++14. There might be something in Boost. You can probably pull in Eric Niebler's ranges proposal. But in standard C++, you have to make a copy. So I can make a vector. I can use copy if. That's an allocation and a copy of all the things inside. Back inserter, because I, I might not know how big my vector needs to be until it's all done. And again, my lambda. So it's more wordy, it's more copies, it's more allocations. And ranges compose very nicely. So in D, I can use basically as many lines as I want. That's constant memory. My goal here is to take the string hello world, reverse hello, and put it back together with the original string world. So that's what we're going to get at the bottom. I can slice off hello, put it backwards, slice off world, keep it the same, and chain them together so that they just follow each other. And again, constant storage. This is just a way of looking at the data. We're not allocating new data. We're just looking at it differently. And I can do this as many times as I want. I can retro, I can chain, I can filter, I can map from one thing to another. All of these operations happen without any copies. In C++, the best thing I could come up with in C++14 is I make a new string. So there's an allocation. I use those reverse iterators, and I append on the rest of the characters. So I'm copying, I'm allocating all of these awful things all over again. So why ranges? Well, they're safer. Again, no heart bleed. They're convenient. They're memory efficient. One of the reasons why they're memory efficient is because they are lazy, and they, and they do this constant time memory thing. It, it, it's very difficult to get that in C++ right now. But another reason is the whole, if I've got two iterators, I might have you know, not just where I am, but some extra metadata, like a pointer back into a standard map. And if I've got two of those iterators, I've got twice the metadata. So now if I've got a range, I have half as much. There's a simple memory benefit there as well. And modifiers are so much easier to write. Why do we not have range modifiers in C++. Does anyone have a guess why we don't have all this laziness, all this kind of delayed computation memory benefit that we like so much? Why doesn't C++ have this today? Readily available, easy to use. Anyone have a theory? I've got one. It's this. To implement an input iterator, you have to implement all of that. To implement an input range, 
is three functions. We've seen that twice in slides. Show of hands, who thinks they can correctly implement an input iterator right here now without consulting the internet? Show of hands. I think I see less than 10. Keep those hands up if you, can, if you know the difference between an input iterator and a forward iterator. Yeah, so it's challenging. It's hard. Boost has things that makes this better, but it's not easy. I struggle to implement iterators in C++, and so creating these modifiers is, is not an easy thing to do. Ranges, you've got a lot less to deal with. The job is an easier one. So let's go back to talking about exponents. And I want to do something a little different. Instead of generating all of the exponents of two, I want to ask for uh, one in particular. So two to the power of three. If I can do the same non-member function, call it like a member. So I, I've basically given a method to an integer. Again, that boundary between primitives and proper objects has blurred. Three of these lines are the same. The last one is different. What makes that last line so cool? What's the cool thing about that being in a static assert? It's a compile time. I heard it. So I can just use that at compile time. And I'll, I'll show you the D version in a, in a minute. Uh, but let's ask, why might I want to do that? Why might I want to compute that at compile time? Well, maybe you've got some research that says a particular power of 2 minus 1 is a great initial hash table size. I could code that in as a magic number, and that'd be fine, but then I probably want to comment. Or I can just show how I got there. And I'll give you more compelling reasons why moving computations to compile time, like when we had our base automatically just convert into a shift operation instead of a multiply earlier, is such a good thing. But for starters, let's do this in C++. So C++ 98, the static assertion looks a little different. No longer do we have a pretty function call. It's pow, pass some template arguments, colon, colon, value the stuff out, see that it's correct. And the implementation, the only way you could do this in C++ 98 was with template recursion. This was an abuse of the template language system. I'll start at the middle. That's the base case. It's a partial template specialization. It says, for any base, if the exponent is 0, then the value is 1. That is the result. So 2 to the 0 is 1, uh, 3 to the 0 is 1, all of them. And then we have the recursive case up top. It says, grab the previous result, multiply it by the base. That is the new result. If you don't understand this, good. You shouldn't have to. The C++ committee smiled upon us in 2011. And they gave us constexper. Constexper is this wonderful keyword that says my function may be evaluated at compile time. Doesn't have to. You can use it at runtime too. But you're allowed to use it at compile time. So here is a much more straightforward recursive definition. It looks like a function. We can actually use it that way. Uh, and this is significantly better. This is a huge step up. There's some kind of weird things, though, with C++11 constexper. One of those is that if I wanted to make that ternary operation into an if statement, that'd be illegal. That was illegal in C++11. Well, again, the committee smiled upon us. And they said, you know what, we can relax a little. You can have loops, you can have if statements, you can have local data in your functions. It's almost like purity, functional purity. That's what constexper means to me these days. So I can have an iterative solution here. One of the nice things about being able to have an iterative solution is that constexper means that it can work at compile time. It doesn't have to work at compile time. So if I can write an iterative solution, one that performs better at runtime, then great. I can have the same code for both compile time and runtime, and it's you know fast in both cases. Now it turns out this solution is not terrible at compile time. In fact, both Clang and GCC memoize. So for Fibonacci, for example, that's going to actually be much nicer, I think, than if you were to use the same code at runtime. Uh, but in general, I like the iterative form. And I like not having restrictions, to just be able to do whatever it is that I want to do. And that brings me to D. Here's POW. This is the same one that I showed you before we went down this road with C++ 98. It's just a normal function. It's templated. It does the same exact thing as the C++ on the last slide. The difference is, there's no constexper keyword. Almost anything you write in D will just work at compile time. That's the future. No constexper, just if it'll work, do it. If you use it in a compile time context, 
do it at compile time. And to illustrate that point, I can use that power generator we wrote. I can use the find, actually I don't use the find, I can use drop exactly, which is an algorithm in the standard library that says ignore the first exponent things in this cases and grab something out. So almost anything you want to do, you can just do it at compile time. So let's get more exciting. Let's talk operator overloading. Well, at the bottom there you can see I've got both plus and multiply. And I could do subtraction, I could do subtraction and division, all of these things at the bottom. I do that with a single function overload. And the cool thing going on there is I pass a string that is the symbol of the operator, the plus, the multiply, the subtraction, at compile time. And then of course the right hand side. And I can, at compile time, put together a string. I can concatenate a string together with that operator to say this is the code that I would like to have happen. And mix in is built into the language code generation. It's you give me a compile time string, I will compile it immediately and insert it right here. And that's pretty special. So you might ask yourself, well, isn't that a lot like eval? Isn't eval awful? Eval from JavaScript or PHP, I forget which one of them. The thing about eval is that you often use that with user input. And you do it at runtime. Mixin happens at compile time where your attackers can't find you. And if they can, you've got bigger problems. So code gen built into the language, you can construct any string you want at compile time, because every function works at, a, at compile time, and turn it into code. Now, if you don't think that that's cool, prepare yourselves, because here's where things get really interesting. I've got two different ways of generating a regex. Same pattern, same interface, they work exactly the same. Those two lines with auto are very subtly different. Does anyone see why one of them is more cool than the other? One of them's at compile time. Now, we are passing the pattern at compile time. And I don't know about you, I've never written a program where the pattern has varied at runtime. The only program I can even think of that does that is grep. Grep, you're given the pattern and then you do the searching. Everything else, you know the pattern ahead of time. Now the cool thing about having the pattern ahead of time is most regex implementations, they've got this general purpose finite automata. It has to accept anything and it has to be fast with everything. If I know the pattern at compile time, I can generate a specific finite automata for your pattern and your pattern only. I can be smart about how I do that. And then once I'm done being clever, that code that I've just generated goes to the compiler, and more importantly, the optimizer. So that optimizer that all of those compiler gurus have spent hours and hours of engineering on making your code fast, now makes your patterns, your finite automata, that much faster. So imagine bringing the entire optimizer to bear on your pattern. That's what D does. And in 2014, Dimitri gave a presentation at DConf where we benchmarked our static compile time version of regex against everything else. And it was significantly faster. We had the fastest regex in the world. Why? Because we had an unfair advantage. If you look at the runtime version, it's okay, it's fine. We do not have the best people for regex in the world in the D community. What we have is the ability to do anything we want at compile time and optimize that to no end. Now, there's one more thing I want to show that I just think is kind of nice. And that is, I've got this phone book, an, uh, a way of going from names to phone numbers, and I'm storing it in a red-black tree, so think a standard map. And I'm going to loop over it in order, print everything out. These are the three things that I think are cool. That first one is just shorthand for a lambda. A mixin converts a string into a lambda. I can have my code be that much cleaner. But what really makes me happy is those last two boxes. The one I'm looping over my red black tree, I can refer to the things inside with self-documenting names. Compare to the C++. Entry.first, entry.second. Does this bother anyone else in the room? I hope it does. It, it really, it makes me very sad. Because it, it couldn't even have been key value. No, we got first and we got second. All right, I want to give some credits and then I want to wrap up and talk about what we've done. And more importantly, because you might be wondering at this point, why am I talking about D? This is a C++ conference. I want to relate that all back. So for starters, the first three links here are 
uh, works of Andre Alexandrescu. He was my mentor for a while, and he is, of course, big in the D community. That first book I want to really talk about, because that is my favorite programming book of all time, the D programming language book. And it's not just because I like the language, but it's because Andre explains exactly why everything happened in D. It explains the pitfalls of C++ and the design decisions that went into making D the language it is today. It's a little out of date, the book, but it's still a wonderful read, would recommend. That last link there is just the deconf presentation for those benchmarks. And with that, let's wrap up. So things in modern languages and modern compilers were getting more natural and expressive code, where it's hard to do inefficient things and easier to do the right things. To, you don't have to remember to do move. You can just you know, do what you need to do and the algorithms will be lazy, they'll be cheap, they'll be constant memory by default. Things are memory efficient, things are fast. We've got uh, work that is moving to compile time, and then we can use the optimizer to do clever things. We can make our code better by just shifting more things to compile time. We've got safer primitives. And what's more, a beginner is less likely to introduce these awful bugs, these awful bugs of from C to C++, maybe not freeing the resources, but in D, you know, the difference between D and C++, a lot of time, times comes down to perf, be that memory or runtime or both. So let's compare things that are coming from D to C++. D's been around for a while. There's a lot of implementation experience. A lot of the proposals, the big ones that are coming to C++, have been influenced by the work done in D. Ranges is a huge one. Eric Niebler went through D, looked at those ranges, heavily influenced the design for C++. We've got uh, shallow copy by default semantics for arrays in, C in D, and that's not coming to C++ because, let's face it, you can't change defaults. But there hasn't even been a clean alternative or even an unclean one in C++. It was very difficult to do something like my example from before where I reversed the word hello in hello world. I had to make a copy. In C++ 17, we get an answer to that, and that is string view a view of the data, right? That concept that I've been repeating over and over and over again is finally coming to C++. We can look at the data without making a copy of it with string view and array view. We have ranges that are coming presumably in C++ 20 that will let us take those views and do things with them. We'll be able to compose, we'll be able to reverse them, we'll be able to chain them back together, we'll be able to filter. All of these things, lazy, constant memory. Universal function call syntax, that hey, I write a non-member function, and I can use it like it's a member function. That might also someday come to C++. Interestingly, though, they want to do the opposite. So instead of any non-member function can be used like a member function, it's if I've got a vector with dot .begin, I can call that as begin of the vector without having to have a special non-member form of that. That might show up soon. And all of these other things are examples of things that exist today in C++ that came in part from D. I, I don't want to say that you know, they were directly copied from, but there are influences, modern trends. And with that, I'm Mark Isaacson. Uh, you can find this and my other talks on my blog. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, any questions? I see several. Ooh. What did you think? <laughs> Do it properly. Mark Isaacson. <laughs> Are you having a Q&A, Mark? Yes. OK. Questions then, please. First over there, thank you. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, thank first you. of all, I would like to point out that I think you a little bit cheated in the uh, comparison <laughs> between D and C++ making a pair instead of a struct. Sure. So that you <laughs> showing off like D is a better one. Uh, and the second one, uh, I would like to ask about the slices. How do they work? Like, are they like views or? so that they only are like a pair of begin and end iterators and they, they just re reference the, the original data back there, or is it a copy? 
Yeah, so the, the question is how do slices work under the hood? Uh, so I if you remember, an array is two pointers. Uh, so you have the pointer to the beginning of the array and a pointer to the end of the array. And when I'm talking about a slice, I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna have two different pointers to a different subset of that original array. So I'm not copying the data, I'm just looking at it with a different set of pointers. So if I wanna slice off the first thing, I just have a different pointer that, you know, is, it skips that first element. Hi, I have uh, two or two questions. The first one is, do you use the language in your daily job? If yes, to what kind of task? Yeah, uh, so I do use D. Uh, I, I use D at Facebook, and I use it for a few different things. So we, we had some bigger projects. Uh, we, we actually had a C++ linter written in D. We had our C++ preprocessor for a while was written in D. We've uh, retired those projects though, and we've got a few more that are still going. Uh, I use D a lot. Basically, anytime you would normally reach for Python, I reach for D. So I use it for all kinds of different scripting tasks, and one of those tasks is a tool that lets me find reviewers for my diffs. So I can use all kinds of source control data and who builds this and who deploys the binaries kind of stuff using a D script to figure that all out and give me reviewers. Uh, that's how I tend to use it in my daily life. I'm hoping that eventually it will make sense uh, for some other tasks as well. There's a lot of cool work in the D community right now to make it so that you can just use it together seamlessly with C++. And when I say that, uh, I, sh I should say that the C++ integration story today is actually very, very good. Uh, what I'm talking about more is we might eventually get to the point where vector could just be used transparently from one language to the other which I think would be amazing. Uh, one thing that D can do that no other language can do right now is it can catch C++ exceptions. So that's kind of cool. So I noticed that uh, when there was uh, functions like uh, reverse like, or joiner or something like that, you uh, omitted uh, the parentheses on method calls, but uh, when you used uh, pop first, there yeah. were empty parentheses. Yeah. Is that uh, required and why? Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to go back to the slide because it's way at the beginning, but the question is when I had my, my range, I sometimes omitted parentheses when I did things. So when I did array.front, I didn't have parentheses. When I did array.pop front, I did use parentheses. Uh, the answer is, is that stylistic or mandatory or, or what's, the, what's the explanation there? And it, it's just stylistic. Uh, you don't have to put the parentheses if there's no arguments. I sometimes choose to and sometimes choose not to uh, with really no good reason. Good question. Uh, hi, so I am not sure if it's really something you recommend or not because uh, hmm. uh, your find in D returns a sequence or a range yes. and uh, usually when you use find you want to find an element, uh, just one Yes. and sometimes you want uh, to, I don't know, iterate from, fir from the first one to the one you found and how would you do this? Yeah, so the observation was that for the find algorithm, we returned the slice from the thing we found to the end. And you know, usually, maybe we just want to have the thing itself, the thing we were looking for, and how would we iterate from the beginning to that at that point. So this goes back to uh, the, the, that the return value can be used in lots of different ways. So if you just want the thing itself, the thing that you found, when you got back that slice, that answer, that's in the array version, just another array. And I can you know, subscript out the, the zero index and that is the result. Or if it's a range, I can do dot front and that is the thing that we wanted to find. If I instead wanted to loop up until that point or get a slice that was all of the things up until that point, 
I can construct a slice by saying the array sliced from zero to, uh, you can do some math on the length of the original range or, or array minus the length of the slice that you got out. It, it's kind of complicated, but it works. Um, alternatively, you could write a loop. Okay, uh, one more thing. That uh, t dot init, if I'm not mistaken, it uh, yes. initializes to zero, yes? Yes, uh, so, so t dot init just says get the default initial value for that type. So if it's an integer, that'll be zero. If it's uh, an object, it'll be the default constructor. So this power will always return zero, yes? Uh, the, the question was, oh, yes, would this code always return zero? The answer is yes, I have a bug. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Always appreciate that. And the funny thing is I fixed this to say t dot init uh, prior to this presentation. So thank you. Um, are slices uh, garbage collected? Or? Are slices garbage collected? Uh, so yeah, by default, when you do stuff like slicing, that does get garbage collected. There are uh, some other primitives that you could write to do the same thing without having it be garbage collected. So for example, I wanted to have D arrays in C++ or more just to see if you could, to see if it would be possible to implement the same semantics in C++. And I wrote a library that did that, and under the hood it used shared pointer to do so. So that's shared pointer is kind of garbage collecting, and of course there's all kinds of evils that go along with using shared pointer, but you, you do need some amount of magic to make that work the way it does. I see a question over there. Um, hi, um, I can see you have you have used t.init over there, and does it mean that every single type has a default constructor, or can this line fail? Yeah. So does it does t.init mean that every single type has a default constructor? All of the primitive types do, uh, some sort of built-in definition for that, uh, and you can disable the default constructor for everything else. But by default, I believe it comes with one. I see another question. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, when you play with renders, like uh, you filter something, then you uh, reverse it, and then do some more filtering or something like that. Does the reverse operation make a copy of the range? Yeah. So the question is, if I filter something, can I then reverse it, filter it more, reverse it, and so on and so forth? Uh, and if I do so, does it make a copy? Yes, you can just keep going for as long as you want. And no, there are no copies that are made unless you explicitly ask for them by using something like dot array. And with that, I think we'll end questions. If you've got more, uh, come see me afterwards. Thanks again. Mark Isaacson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Thanks very much. OK, if I'm not mistaken, we've got a rather extensive lunch break. So we will be picking up at, hang on a minute, uh, 1.30. Uh, so again, there are some snacks upstairs, floor one. Other than that, you might want to take care of your own lunch. And we will be picking up at 1.30. Thank you.
Testing. Okay.
Раз, раз. Тест микрофону. Раз. Раз, два, три, четыре, пять. Раз, два, три. All right, welcome back to room one. May I just remind everyone to please mute your phones and indeed enjoy the rest of this conference. Again, may I just remind you that it is the first day of the rest of your lives, so enjoy it to the fullest. I don't know if you remember, but the, I just sort of very quickly suggested yesterday that you are supposed to network and meet someone new. So show of hands, who's, who's met a new person? Okay, it's not bad. I'd say a third of the people. For the rest of you, it may be, I mean, the fact that you haven't, maybe is that you haven't really mastered the art of networking. So just a, a little help with icebreakers. I'm sure you know what icebreakers are. It's just like the sentence, the first sentence that you say to someone you don't know, but you want to get to know them. So here are just a, Several suggestions, I'll start with the basic ones. And a very basic sentence or a question or an icebreaker that you may ask is, is this your first code dive conference? Right, very obvious, very easy. Another one is, do you come from Wrocław or are you new to this city? Again, very obvious, again, very easy. I like the fact that you're taking notes even if they are mental notes. And are you with Nokia or some other company? How many Nokia people in this room? I'd say most. Any other people, where are you from? Yell, shout. Krakow. Krakow, which company? Delphi. Delphi. Automotive, okay. Warsaw? Intel. Intel. Katowice. <laughs> okay. Fairly mixed crowd. So for you, advanced icebreakers. I think Code Dive is the most amazing conference in the world, don't you? And no, you will not be paid by Nokia to say that. But you can still use it. After the conference, would you like to Netflix and chill at my place? <laughs> I suggest you use this one uh, later uh, during our after party. And may I remind you, it's at 7 p.m., the Mletarnia pub. So yes, this is the one that you can use for breaking ice and hitting on someone at the same time. And finally, I can't help but notice, but your t-shirt is impressively more nerdy than mine. Where did you get it? Feel free to use any of those uh, later tonight. Uh, and before I, again, self-backhaul myself from the stage, a quick question. There's a bug in this slide. Where is it? Huh? Footer? <laughs> uh, sorry. Not familiar with this one. Uh, the bug is you hit on someone, not at someone. Okay, I'm definitely not intelligent enough to use it, so Sean, over to you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so may I now uh, introduce our next speaker, who indeed is our former speaker at the same time. Sean, how do you do that? 
Uh, if you haven't Sean, uh, met Sean, uh, let me just quickly remind you that Sean is a principal scientist and software architect for Adobe's Mobile Digital Imaging Group. And he's been with Adobe since 93, uh, when he joined as a senior engineer working on Photoshop and later managed Adobe's Software Technology Lab. In 09, he spent a year at Google working on Chrome OS before returning to Adobe. And from 88 through to 93, Sean worked at Apple, where he was part of the system software team that developed the technologies allowing Apple's successful transition to power PC. And I was trying to find out something personal, something informal about Sean, uh, and I couldn't. So I asked for help, and the person helping me was Michael Wong, whom you met uh, yesterday morning. And about Sean, Michael Wong said, and I quote, Sean is one of the most respected guys in C++ and one of the easiest going people I've ever met, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, Better Code Concurrency by Sean Parent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really enjoying being at the conference here. It's a good conference. Um, today I wanted to talk a bit about concurrency. How many people saw my talk yesterday? Okay, more than half. So not a prerequisite, uh, but but we will go over some of, this, some of the same things. Uh, to put this talk a little into context, a few years back at uh, Going Native, which is now CppCon, I gave a talk called C++ Seasoning that was fairly well received, and I got a lot of requests after that to put together a book. So since then, when I get invited to give a talk, uh, I've been working through a section of the book as part of doing the talk. Uh, so right now, kind of this is where we are. Uh, this is one of my more recent talks. Now there's a common theme in all of these talks, which is that writing better code is about managing relationships. And I don't mean that as personal relationships, although I think computer scientists are bad at both. It's about understanding the fundamentals. Okay. It's about learning to code simply and part of that is learning to reason locally and equationally about your code. Okay. Now to give you some idea of the kind of things I work on, uh, this is a screenshot. I didn't want to risk a live demo here. Uh, but this is a screenshot from uh, Lightroom for the web. So how many people are familiar with Adobe Lightroom? A handful of people. Well, this is a professional photography photo imaging product. And we now have a mobile version. And one of the jobs that I did was took the desktop rendering system and got it running on mobile devices, uh, first iOS and then Android. Uh, and then I decided, well, maybe I could get it running inside the browser. And to put this in perspective, uh, uh, you can't do a subset of the Photoshop of the Photoshop Lightroom rendering system and have a product because it's a non-destructive model. It's a parametric model. So rendering is always done live. So if you want to be able to display an edit that was done on the desktop for the same image on mobile or on web, you have to be able to render everything, all of the features that the desktop has on mobile and web. Okay. Uh, so at first, we were targeting Pinnacle, which is, for people who don't know, that stands for Portable Native Client, which is a technology that's built into the Chrome browsers and Chromebooks. Uh, and uh, you know, Chrome, regardless of what machine it's running on. And basically, what Pinnacle is, is it lets you compile code into an intermediate representation that looks an awful lot like LLVM. Uh, uh, intermediate representation, and then the back end of the compiler is built into the browser, and they have a secure sandboxing technology. So you can basically run multi-threaded, near-native performance, C++ code inside the browser. How many people knew that? Almost nobody. Yeah, few people. Uh, it's really an interesting technology and really worth playing with. Um, uh, but this is not inside of Chrome. This is inside of, of Apple's 
uh, Safari. Uh, to give you an idea of how much has changed in that image, that's the original image. I shot that in the Moscow subway. Um, uh, and that's the edited image. And that's all rendered in JavaScript. Okay? But it's C++ code compiled with the mscriptum compiler into JavaScript. Now, the main challenge to get this imaging pipeline, it's about a 40-stage imaging pipeline, largely CPU-based. This is not OpenGL code. Uh, to get this run, running high performance inside of JavaScript uh, was a challenge. All of the performance issues were a challenge. But the biggest hurdle to get here was the fact that this was a heavily threaded code base, and JavaScript doesn't have threads. Okay, so I had to get a heavily threaded code base running inside of JavaScript and running so that it gave interactive performance. So if you, as you slide the sliders in this, the screen updates and everything feels smooth and live. Okay. So this project got me thinking a lot about the issues of concurrency and how we go about it. First, some definitions. Okay. Concurrency is when tasks run and complete in overlapping time periods. Right? A task you can typically think of as a function. Okay? But it doesn't mean the same thing as parallelism. Parallelism is when things actually run simultaneously. I can have concurrency even though I have a, a single thread of execution. Okay? I can do that by time slicing the thread. I can do that by having a cooperative threading model. Okay, or I can do that by breaking up tasks and requeuing the tasks. Those are all forms of concurrency. Okay. The reason why you want concurrency is concurrency is the basic building block that allows you to get to parallelism, okay, which improves the performance of your application. It also allows you to improve the interactivity. Right? So you can build a usable application where the user isn't blocked from taking the next step. Now, all of my talks, except for my overview talk that we saw, saw yesterday, all of my other talks uh, have a goal. And this is the goal for today's talk. No raw synchronization primitives. All of my goals are stated as a negative. What not to do. They're non-prescriptive. They don't tell you what to do. Okay? And all of these goals are not rules. They're not even guidelines. I don't want people in code reviews to say, Sean said no raw synchronization primitives, so get those out. Okay? They are goals that are difficult to achieve. Achieving them will make your co code better, but I cannot tell you how to do this in all circumstances. We'll discuss some ways to do it and some reasons why they're a problem here. Okay? But this is an open-ended problem, something for all of you to strive for. So what's a raw synchronization primitive? Well, these are mutexes, atomics, semaphores, memory fences, condition variables. How many people have at least used one of these in a coding project? Almost everybody, good. Which means if I say, how many people have written anything with threads? Same people. <laughs> OK. So you're all somewhat familiar with those. The reason why you don't want to use them, the number one reason, is you'll likely get it wrong. Okay? And I know this because almost everybody I know gets these wrong. Here's a piece of code that I wrote. And I actually renamed this class to be bad cow. It was originally copy on write, which is cow. Um, the reason why it's bad cow is because I put this on a slide at one point without naming it bad cow, and somebody promptly copied this bad code and put it into a shipping product. So now it's a bad cow. So right there in this code, there is a bug. Okay, count m is an atomic. Now, this bug shipped. I wrote this bug, so I'll take full responsibility for it. It took over a year to find this bug. 
Can anybody spot the bug? I have a couple hands. Yell it out. Exactly. Exactly. And what would happen if it did? I'll help you out here. So what we're doing here, this is a ref counted object. Okay. So if a count is one, that implies single ownership. Nobody else has access to it. And if the count is one, the count can't change. Okay. So if the count is one, we can safely just assign straight into here without any fear of a race condition. And we're good. Okay. If the count is not one, okay, then we need to construct a new object and decrement our count. Now the problem here is every time we decrement our count, if our count goes to zero, we should delete the old object. Okay. Because if the count goes to zero, nobody else owns it, including us. So it needs to go away. Okay. So what could happen here is when we do the first check, we say it's equal to one. And that's false, so somebody else owns this object. But by the time we get two lines, three lines down below that, okay, whoever else owned this object has given up ownership, and now the count is one. And we decrement it, and it hits zero, but we don't test for that zero. We don't delete the object, and we leak whatever that object pointed to. Okay. So inside the compiled code, there is a function call in the middle to new. So th there's actually a fairly large gap of time in there for this race condition to occur. But in production, what this meant was about once every three to four hours, the system would leak one object. Okay? So, not a huge deal, but it kept showing up on our leak detection, and this was a pain to actually find. And it's pretty subtle. Okay? So, the fix is that we have to, when we decrement, check for zero. Now, the problem with this code is if you're not reading this code very carefully, that looks like a redundant check, right? right? And so even if you wrote this code to begin with, in all likelihood, an engineer in your building a year from now is going to be skimming over this piece of code and going, going what's this check? It clearly can't be zero, okay? Because it wasn't one, right? The only way we could get to zero is if we decremented one. It clearly can't be zero, and they're going to take that line out and reintroduce the bug. So if you do that, put a comment in there, too. OK, so you're going to get it wrong. The other reason why you don't want to use raw synchronization primitives is performance. Okay. Let me give you some understanding of why. This is a graph that a colleague of mine, uh, Russell Williams, he's on the Photoshop team, put together a couple years ago. Uh, so this is looking at a Sandy Bridge machine. Uh, and this graph has only gotten worse since then. It's still a little better than this on mobile devices. So this gives you a good slice. But this is a graph of where is the performance in your machine. Okay. That much of the performance of your machine, as far as just raw gigaflops, is in the GPU. This is a pretty traditional desktop box. Okay. That much of performance is in the vectorization in the SIMD unit on your machine. Maybe if you have auto vectorization in your compiler, you're touching that, just touching it. That much performance is in multi-core. So if you're at least coding with threads, if you're using C++ 11 or better, you get some access to that. And that is the slice on this machine if you're just writing single-threaded, non-SIMD optimized, non-GPU accelerated code on your machine. That slice is 0.25% 
of the overall performance capabilities of this machine. So if you're not writing parallel code, you've got a problem. Okay. Now, Michael Wong gave his talk here on day one. How many people attended Michael's talk? Yeah, so Michael mentioned that I challenged him. The basic challenge was, how do we, with C++, unlock this whole thing? Okay, so, and that's what Michael's been working on since. What I'm gonna talk about today is how do we move off the bottom mark, right? which is a big challenge in and of itself. Now, how many people are familiar with Amdahl's Law? A few people. Everybody needs to be aware of this. Okay. Amdahl's Law basically states right, that the amount of performance that you can get out of your machine is limited by the piece that you can't speed up. Okay. So the way that this translates to to accelerating when you have multiple cores is if you have 10% of your code which is synchronized, okay, then it doesn't matter how many cores you throw at that machine, you can't go more than 10 times faster, okay? Because that 10% will be your limit. You will approach it and never hit that and never exceed it. Now, this is the graph that you'll find if you look up Amdahl's Law on Wikipedia. This graph drives me nuts. Why does this graph drive me nuts? It does not give you the proper sense of scale. It is logarithmic on the bottom axis, and it is linear on the top axis, okay? So if I made this linear on both axes, we'd be about in the states going this direction. Okay, doesn't matter which direction we'd pointing, we'd go about halfway around the planet. Okay, so this really doesn't give you a sense of scale of the problem. So this is a more meaningful graph of Amdahl's law. This is linear on both axes. Okay, each line represents just 10% synchronization to see how fast you're falling off there. So if you look here, the numbers are pretty small. If I can see four, five, six, so that's seven. So out at, uh, we're out at 16 cores here. Sorry for the blurriness and the small type on this display. But we're out at 16 cores here on this side, okay? And that, I think, is a little better than six X performance. So if we just have 10% synchronization, okay? and 16 cores on our machine, we're just doing a little bit better than six times faster, right? The red line is just a straight linear scale, okay? So just a little bit of blocking, a little bit of synchroniz synchronization, which is what raw synchronization primitives do, kills your performance. Now everybody thinks about threading as this model. They think, oh, I've got an object and I've got a bunch of threads that are going to be banging on that object, and so I'm going to throw in a mutex, right, to only let one thread bang on that object at a time, and each thread will acquire the lock and will just rotate around. This is a horrible way to write threaded code. Don't do that. Don't stop. We want to minimize our locks. So, a couple more terms here, which we've been using already, but let's go ahead and define them. So, a thread is an execution environment. It consists of a stack, processor state, potentially running in parallel to other threads. Okay, it can be time-sliced, could be just running concurrent with other threads if you've exceeded the number of cores you have on the machine. Okay, a task is a unit of work, often just a function that's executed on a thread. So those are two different terms. Tasks can be scheduled on a thread pool to op optimize the machine utilization. Right? This is a very common technique. Right? Unfortunately, C++14 does not really have a task system. It's got threads and it's got futures. 
And it's, something called, it's got something called async, which in C11 was pretty well nailed down to say that async will execute a task on a, on a new thread. And in C14, that definition got weakened a little bit, largely because of Microsoft's arguments, which we'll get to in a bit, um, uh, to say, well, maybe that task could get executed on a thread pool. Okay. But that's the best we have. But regardless of what platform you're working on, almost, you probably have something better, right? I'm going to show you how to write a portable implementation here uh, for a thread pool in a minute. Uh, Windows, though, has Windows Thread Pool and PPL. Apple has something called Grand Central Dispatch, which is LibDispatch. LibDispatch is also open sourced, and you can find it available on most Linux systems. Uh, you can also bring it up on Android. Uh, Intel has something called TBB, which is available both as an open source license and a commercial license and available for many platforms, including ARM, not just Intel processors. And uh, HPX, uh, which is largely about how you do uh, high performance computing, but it's also fairly scalable, will run down on smaller machines, is available on, on smaller devices. So you probably already have a thread pool available. So even though I'm going to walk through how you build one, it's for instructive purposes. Don't write your own. Okay. Uh, the reason why I wrote my own here, the reason why I went through this experiment, is because I was trying to get to, like I said, to port all this code to Google's Pinnacle. And I didn't have a task system there. And libdispatch would have been the closest fit for what I wanted. Uh, but libdispatch requires libkernel. And I didn't have a libkernel either. So I ended up writing my own. Now, if you look online about how to write a task system, uh, way down here in type you can't see, it's a link to the Oracle website. You'll find the uh, Oracle guide to writing concurrency code, and they will tell you how to write a task system. And this is what they'll tell you. Well, you just need a queue, and you're going to put tasks into the queue, and then you're going to feed tasks out of the queue and put them on each thread. Okay. So we can write that. We're going to have a lock. We're going to write a notification queue, which is really just built on top of an STL deck. Okay. We're going to have a pop function to pop a piece of work out of the queue. We're going to have a push function to add a piece to the queue. Okay. Now we're going to write a little task system that just contains one of these queues okay, and a bunch of threads. One thread for each piece of concurrency we have. Okay, We are going to uh, uh, have a run loop, which is just going to spin in a loop and pop functions off of our work queue and execute them. So we'll construct our task system, spin up all of our queues, and point them to our run loop. When we destruct our set task system, we want to join all of our queues. Okay. Now, this won't quite work. right? We're going to join all of our queues, but if you actually look, our run loop never terminates there, so we're going to have to fix that. Okay. So we'll fix that in a moment. And then we're going to have an async operation here that just pushes a piece of work onto our queue. Okay. So let's fix this up. We need to add a done function. So we're going to have a, a little done flag there. A done that sets done under our lock and notifies all the, all the threads to wake up with our condition variable. Okay. Our pop, pop function now will return a bool. It will check for done. And it will return, what does it return there? It returns a. Uh, False if we're done. True if we actually popped. So that's our complete system. How well do you guys think this performed? Here's our speedometer. Anybody? Fast, slow, great? Depends on the task size. Let's say small tasks under load. OK. So we're trying to measure the overhead of this tasking system. Uh, 
like that. Really badly. Really, really, really badly. Okay. Why? Well, we did exactly what I told you not to do. We've got one queue, we've got a bunch of threads banging on it, and we've got a whole mutex around the thing, and we're doing that. Okay, but that's what Oracle will tell you to do. So how do we fix this? Right, we want to do better than that. Anybody know? Many queues. That's the right answer. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a little mini scheduler, which is just going to put our work into one of many queues. And then each thread will pull from its queue. So this is pretty easy. We don't have to change our queue. We can just change our task system. So now up on top there, you see we've got a vector of queues, right? One for every, every thread we're going to spin up. Okay. And down here now, when we pop, or with our run, our run's going to take an argument which says which of our queues we're going to pop from. Okay. And down here, when we do our async, we're going to push into the next queue available. And we're just going to keep a count, and we're just going to walk around. Okay. So pretty straightforward. OK, how do you guys think this one does? Question over here. Right. So the comment there was he has a problem with this solution, because one of these threads is going to chew through all of its work and there's going to be tasks piled up behind another thread because it's got a long-running task, and things are going to stall out. We're not going to fully utilize the machine. So we'll get to that in a moment, right? So how do we think this is going to do? Overall, nobody? A little better, OK? It's actually about 10 times better, OK? But it's a little better. So the solution is something called task stealing. Who's ever heard the term task stealing? Somebody's heard task stealing, or is that a question? <laughs> yep. So a few people have heard the idea of task stealing. So this is what task stealing is. When I have multiple queues in my system, right? if I come along to one thread and I'm out of work, right? just steal work from another thread or from another queue. Okay. And I can even do better than that. If I go to take a piece of work out of my queue and my queue is busy, right? maybe because somebody else is putting information into it, or because another task is already stealing information from my queue, then I'll just go steal work from somebody else's queue. Okay? So instead of blocking and waiting, I will do that. So how would we write this? Well, we're going to modify our notification queue just a little bit. We're going to have two functions here try pop and try push. Okay? And the idea is that try pop is going to attempt to pop something, but if the queue is empty or if it just can't acquire the lock because the lock is busy, okay, then it's just going to return and say, nope, didn't get anything. Okay? And try push is going to do the same thing. If it goes to try to push into something and that queue is busy, okay, then it's going to return and say, no, nope, I couldn't put anything in here. So we'll do those two functions. Okay. So now what we're going to do inside of our tasking system here is our run loop up on top there. Okay. What we're going to do is we're just going to, to spin around trying to pop things out. OK? So we'll just walk around. If we don't get anything once we've gone all the way around, then we'll just sit, w sit and wait on our pop. OK? Now our push in, we can be a little more aggressive here, right? right? On the try there, we want to eventually settle out 
on that on that pop and wait for it because people are notifying us. We need the guarantee that every time we get one notification, we pop at least one thing. Okay? But on the push, we can be a little more aggressive and we can spin more times. Okay? So there's a K factor in here as to how many times around we spin. Okay? And K will depend actually on your hardware a little bit. So a number somewhere between 32 and, and 56 times, 64 times, something in there is going to be the ideal. If you had to just pick a number out of thin air, set it to be 48, and you'll be within a couple percentage points of ideal. Okay? Okay. Now there are much more sophisticated task stealing algorithms okay, that require lock-free data structures, and all kinds of sophistication going on. But this is just a dead simple way to code it. Okay, now how do you guys think we do? Have we pegged it yet? In the middle? Well, we're actually doing a little bit better. We're way up here. Okay. So now we're at the point where you could start to look at things, much more sophisticated data structures. Now we're at the point where doing something like a lock-free queue would make a difference and kick you up a couple percentage points. Where doing a sophisticated task-stealing, lock-free task-stealing algorithm would kick you up a couple more percentage points. Okay? By having hooks into the kernel to being able to balance against the, the the other threads in the operating system to make sure that you're not overutilizing all of your cores would kick you up another couple percentage points. Now you're down to the fine tuning points. Now one problem that I have is we did all of this sitting on top of a deck, which is not a partic particularly efficient data structure with a big mutex around it. Okay? But what we did is we greatly minimized the amount of time that we're sitting in that mutex. And all too often, I see people come along and say, oh, I wrote this thing with one queue and it's slow, and they start pulling out memory barriers and, and lock-free devices, and they try to tune the queue, okay? And that's the wrong approach. So what is pegged on this scale, which is the best tasking system I found, is actually Apple's libdispatch, right? Performance-wise, under load, this performs better than any I've used. So that's my 1.0 on my scale. That's my pegging it. That's my max that I've been benchmarking against. And these are actual benchmark times here for all of these. these. Against that is a gold standard. Okay. Now that code, if you look it up as an open source code base, is a very large library and a very sophisticated library. Right? Right? And it's very well tuned and very hard to match. So, but what I just showed you here on a, on, with a few slides is we can come within 15% of that mark before we start going to sophisticated, clever solutions. Right. Right. And that's an important thing to understand. Right. When you're looking at where your code is spending time, right, the idea is to get rid of those blocks, to get rid of those places where you're actually acquiring the mutexes and to minimize the contention. So, this is a C++14 compatible async written with libdispatch. Fits on one slide. Um, my slides are available online, so you guys can grab this offline. I don't expect you to remember it. Uh, uh, but, you know, libdispatch is the C library that people think is hard to use. It's actually pretty easy to adapt into a nice C++ interface. So if you've used STD async, this is STD async written in terms of libdispatch. We're going to talk about a couple of issues with doing that, though. I gave this talk a while back at C++ Now, and somebody in the audience berated me afterwards for quite some time that I didn't look at Boost ASIO. Okay? Uh, the ASIO library has been submitted for standardization, and so his contention was that ASIO was the de facto tasking system for C++ because it had been submitted for standardization, and it was very heavily tuned uh, and very high performance. And it is, in, for some 
for some respects, but it's actually a very bad tasking system. First of all, it isn't a tasking system, but you can use it to build a tasking system. So this is a tasking system built out of Bustazio. Okay. So the problem here is the model is wrong. It might be fixable, but it, it would be a difficult fix to happen in the same API, because basically what we've got is we've got a single object that we're going to be banging on from multiple threads. Okay. Now, they have a very sophisticated lock-free queue, at least from what I understand. I haven't read the code in that much detail. But their performance on my bar here is exactly the same as my first very simple implementation with a single queue. Now, that's not quite true. They do beat my performance, uh, but it's not measurable to the first two decimal places. Okay. So that's Bustazio. Don't think it's a tasking system. So the next thing, then once you have a tasking system up, you need to learn how to use this. So what we want to do is spin up a task. At some point, you're going to want your task to create some object that you want to communicate to another task that's going. And your system keeps running, right? At some point, you need these tasks to be able to communicate. So how do we do that? Anybody? Do we already have a mechanism in the language? Futures. We do have a mechanism, right? So here's futures, OK? So what we're going to do is we're going to asynchronously calculate a Fibonacci number for a million using uh, uh, multi-precision boost integers, because that's a very big number. And then we're going to get our future result and print it. Okay. And I'm going to take a little digression here. How many people have seen Fibonacci used as an example in a talk on parallelism or concurrency? Oh, far fewer people than I would expect. Usually everybody's hand goes up. Because Fibonacci is the canonical example used. And I hate this. I hate Fibonacci being used because everybody calculates Fibonacci in the most brain dead way. Okay? It is my pet peeve. So for you guys in the audience, we're going to fix it. You guys are going to learn really quickly how to calculate Fibonacci. The first thing you need to calculate Fibonacci is a generalized power function. So this is a generalized power function. Okay? It's relatively straightforward. It's the same structure as an adder, right? So what I can do here is I can feed in a number as x, the power I want to raise it to, in the operation. Right? So if my operation is addition, then this does multiplication. Okay? And if my operation is multiplication, then it raises the thing to the power. Okay, so this is just a generic form of power. Should be an STL, but isn't. Okay, this is also known as the Egyptian multiplication or the Russian peasant algorithm. See Alex Stepanov's book from Mathematics for Generic Programming if you want a whole bunch of discussion about this, how and why it works. Okay, given that, we can write an operation which is just to multiply a two by two matrix. OK? And then, in order to plug it in, we need the notion of an identity element. And now to calculate Fibonacci, all we have to do is raise what's known as a Fibonacci matrix, which is a very simple matrix to a given power. OK? And uh, there we go. It relies on this equation right here. That's the Fibonacci matrix on the left raised to a power n. And those are the Fibonacci numbers that fall out, right? So you can see. The nth Fibonacci number is in the middle. We actually don't have to go that far, which is why you'll see this is n minus 1, because that would give us fn in the top left corner. OK? So all we have to do is raise a Fibonacci matrix to the nth power, and we calculate Fibonacci. And so what I did was exactly this asynchronously. And this slide takes a moment to load. This is Fibonacci for a million. OK, so that's 
208,000 digits, and that calculated in 0.72 seconds on one core, not parallelized on my machine. So for anybody who's using Fibonacci, please stop. Okay, that's how you calculate Fibonacci. But we're going to do it asynchronously for a million here. Okay, so what is a future? Getting back to our talk. Conceptually, what a future is, is we have a function that returns some result. Function takes some number of arguments, returns some result. And what we want to do is split the result from the function. So we can say, go execute that function someplace else, and we've got a token for the result that we can somehow view later and get the result out of it. Okay? So we've separated those two halves, the execution of the function from where the result goes, and those two can now flow independently in the system, but somehow they're magically connected between them. Right? It's not too magic, it's just shared state. Okay. So what futures allow is minimum code transformation to express dependencies, right? What that is, is this result depends on the execution of that function. Okay? So futures also provide exception marshalling in C++, which is quite nice. So if we wrote this function that just throws a runtime error, okay, and then on the other side, when we actually go to get the value, it will print out failure. So even though we threw an exception in one thread, we get to catch the exception in the other thread. That's because the exception was marshaled through our future. So this gives us a nice way to start to think about task communication. Well, we can think about it as our model for task communication is we take some task with a set of arguments, okay, and we split it, so we're hanging on to a future on one side, and we send those arguments over to be issued as another task. It executes the code, and then we call future.get, and what happens? And we block. We get the result, but we block. And we don't like blocking, right? I want every time you guys think future.git, think shutter, okay? We don't like that. It doesn't take much of that, and our system crawls. Okay, but it works. Our result comes over. Features lacking in C14. Now, some of these are in the TS. Some of them are not. Uh, Michael covered some of this. Continuations, right? What a continuation is, is, is the ability for us to say, okay, after this function, I want you to do this thing next. Win all is a way to join things. Split. There's no split even in the TS, so we're going to write one here. Um, there's no cancellation in the TS, and there's no good way to layer it. We'll talk about what that is in a minute inside of the current TS. There's no progress monitoring. We're going to ignore that because it's too long to talk about here, but I think it should be part of the system. Other than now we have is ready, which will tell us whether or not a future is ready. But there's no way to see how far along in the asynchronous calculation we are. Um, it's very important if you're trying to give the user some kind of feedback. And finally, C14 futures don't compose very easily to add these. Right. But let's, let's talk about them a little bit. This is what a continuation is, right? Circles are functions, boxes are values, are results. So we got a function yielding a result, and we want to give that to another function yielding a result. Okay? So. Why do we want to do this? Well, as I already mentioned, future.get has a problem. The first problem is a performance problem in that it causes us to stop. The second problem is actually worse and much more subtle, possibly, possibly causing deadlock in our tasking system. Okay? This is a really bad problem. Okay? So part of slowing us down is it means any subsequent non-dependent calculations on the task are also blocked from executing. 
Now, all of these other systems have, all, have some form of continuation, some form of, of system to solve this. What do I mean by a possible deadlock? Right. So I first hit this issue taking the Lightroom rendering code to mobile. In that when we scaled down to two cores, we deadlocked almost constantly. It took a huge amount of effort to figure out what was going on and why we were deadlocking. And you'll understand why in a moment. When we finally figured it out, we realized that we had seen the same issue running on eight cores and 16 cores on desktop machines. It was just much less frequent, but the same problem was there. Here's what happens. Let's just say I've only got one thread. And I've got a task executing, and that task spawns another task that goes into my queue and then calls git. It's pretty easy to see that that's an immediate deadlock. Okay, so if I only have one thread in my thread pool, then any calls to dot git or dot wait are just a deadlock. Well, what happens if I have two threads in my thread pool? I issue two tasks. One starts executing immediately. The other one's queued up behind it. This guy's waiting for that to complete. This guy issues a task, and he's waiting for him to complete. No task stealing will help you here. I have no threads available to steal a task. Okay. Now, the more threads you have in the thread pool, the least likely you are to hit the situation. But the problem with hitting the situation is if you hit the situation and you've got eight cores executing, okay, what you have when you're sitting in the debugger is a bunch of tasks that are blocked that have no interdependencies. It's not like an ABA style, style block. Right? So they all seem to be independent, yet nobody's making forward progress. Okay? So it's very unclear what the dependencies are that led to this. Right? And at this point, these two guys are completely independent. They're both just stuck. Okay? And the problem with this is it's very time independent. Right? Whether or not you get stuck depends on what order the tasks end up in the queue and who steals what from the queue when and exactly how things fall out. Right? So this is one of those vexing bugs where if you hit this, this will be a deadlock in your system once a week. Okay? And you will stare at this thing in the debugger and have no clue, why am I stuck? That's what happened to me. Now, the problem there, as I said earlier on, is STD async because Herb Sutter argued with the standards committee because Microsoft would really rather you not spin up threads and do everything through the thread pool, but Microsoft's PPL has continuations and tries to discourage locking at all, uh, argued that STD async should not spin up a new thread. So by STD async not spinning up a new thread, returning a future that doesn't have continuations where the only way to get a value out of it is to call dot .get or dot .wait, means that right now in C++14, you have a system that's as defined, guaranteed to give you deadlocks at some point. OK? It's not cool. OK. And it's not just Git, right? Any blocking call, any continuation variable will cause this problem. Okay, but let's keep going. Let's look at the positive here. So here I'm using the boost library uh, for futures, which has continuations. Okay, so this is what a continuation looks like, right? I can calculate some Fibonacci number. I'm doing smaller numbers now. We'll calculate 1,000. And then I can say, then after you calculate that, uh, print it, okay? And that will do that. 
So that's how continuations work. Okay. Now, frequently, you'll hear in the community argue, arguments about the difference between futures and callbacks, okay, or completion handlers, right, which is another form of callbacks. Okay. And people will be very religious about what side of that argument they're on, right? Whether or not your tasking system should work with completion handlers or whether or not your tasking system should work with futures. Well, here's the trade-offs, okay? So completion handlers are great if you know what you're going to do next at the time that you make the asynchronous call, okay? Because what you're doing is you're saying, here's my continuation. I'm going to tell it to you in advance. And that removes one point of synchronization, right? At the point on a future where I attach a continuation clause, okay, that's a synchronization point because I'm attaching my continuation call and there may be a value already in flight. And so I need some form of, of synchronization there. It might be a, an atomic, it might be very small, it might be lock free, but there's still a synchronization point there and it still applies to Amdahl. Dahl's law. So futures are always going to impose some performance penalty, okay, over just a completion handler. But futures let you compose things after the fact, right? You don't have to know where you're going next. And this is very important if you're in a dynamic system, right? If you go off with your document and you say, do this expensive, expensive calculation, and while you're doing that, the user says, save my document. What that means is complete that calculation and then save, right? So that's a good use of a future continuation. But if I knew I was going to do the operation in advance, I probably wanted to hand that operation to my async operation and say, call this completion handler when you're done. So my argument is that it shouldn't be a religious argument about whether or not we need A or B. We need both, right? Now, the next thing you find is that what you want is joins, okay? So this is win all, right? What you want to be able to do is say, when I have these two values, then I'm going to execute the next task. And a lot of people think that win all would be implemented as a blocking call. They think that win all would be a task that would immediately block saying get A, then get B. And so when they're both ready, then it would continue. But that's not how win all works at all. So what win all does is it creates a little shared group, okay? And the group has an atomic counter in it, okay? And the counter is for the number of arguments that it's waiting for, for the win all. And so when the first task completes, it decrements that count. And when the second task completes, that count falls to zero. And so it's the task that caused it to fall to zero that invokes the continuation for the win all for what to do next, okay? So win all isn't spinning up something that's waiting. It's just adding, it's attaching a little decoration and say, says win, keep decrementing my count. And when it hits zero, whoever decrements it to zero, call the next thing. So there's no, there's no waiting with a win all. So this is how a win all looks, right? I can calculate two Fibonacci numbers, and then I can go ahead and I can say win all. Uh, then what I want to do is output, did I multiply those two together? Yeah, I want to output what the two are multiplied together. Now this is using the current proposed uh, 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 interface for win all, and I'm not particularly happy with it. Because what my lambda gets called with there, which I have as, as auto f is the argument coming in, is I've got a future of tuples. Uh, wait, yeah, a future tuple where each element in the tuple is a future for my value. Right. So eventually we will have an unwrap call that will let you unwrap it, but I think the, by default the interface should just be unwrapped. So you, what you get in your lambda is the set of functions you were waiting for. And if something went wrong with them, an exception is thrown through another channel. So yes, that's just what I said. F is a future tuple of futures. 
That result is 626,000 lines or digits, which I won't print. Now the next operation we would want is a split. This is not in the TS yet. I think it should be. When I first gave this talk, at this point I gave a comment that said, I don't know how to layer on top of the existing TS a, a split. Um, uh, and then I saw one of Bartos's talk on category theory. And, and of all things, uh, uh, in my previous talk, I also mentioned a, a, a Kleisley category, which happens to be a very useful category. And Bartos was talking about this, and I said, this is very odd. Now I see how I can do split. So Bartos gives me a hard time because he says this is the absolutely most non-functional use of category theory he's ever seen in his life. But let's see how we'd build a split. Okay. So first thing is this is what we, we conceptually want to do. Right? We want to do an async operation, and then we want to do one thing with the result, and we want to do something else with the same result. And we would think that we could just write this code. Okay? But we can't. That code actually crashes. So the reason why that crashes is not a bug, it's because dot then consumes the future from x, okay? x on the first dot then there is actually moved into the continuation and what was in x is left as an empty shell. And so the second continuation is on a future which doesn't have any shared state and a precondition of calling dot then is that your future is valid and has a shared state and so we correctly crash. I have issues with this design, uh, but let's see if we can fix it. Okay. What we really want is for x to behave as if it were a token for our value, and we could just copy it, should be a regular type, move it around. So we can write a pseudo copy that I call split. Then our code would look like this, okay? We could say y equals split x then, and then x dot then for our second continuation, okay? And we could have as many splits going on there as we wanted to, right? And the last one, we don't need the split, it's just gonna consume x. Okay? And then we could put the results back together, and we would get that. So let's see how we would write that. To understand how we would write this, we need to understand what promises are. Who knows what a promise is? A handful of people. A promise is the other end of a future, right? right? It's the sending side of a future. The typical way you get a promise is you create a package task, which helps with the exception marshalling. And so you take a function, you create a package task out of it. Package task bundles up the promise side, and gives you the future. So here's how promises work, right? I can create a promise, x int, and I always think the phrasing for promises is reversed, but that's how it is. And I can create a future, int y, and out of our promise, I can get a future. So now I've got the promise is the sending side, the future is the receiving side, okay? And so I can set a value on my promise, and that value comes out of my future. Right? Everybody following that? So that's my basic building block for dealing with futures. That will print 42. So how are we going to split? Well, we'll break this code down. Okay, we start out with a future for x. There's a light arrow that hardly shows up up there. Uh, but that arrow implies that there's a promise somewhere on the other end of that future that's going to send the value. Okay? And we need that arrow to end up going to two places. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move x into temp just to get it out of the way. Okay? So now our arrow goes into temp. Now, we're going to create a new promise and extract from it a new future, okay? And we're gonna put the future where x was. 
And X is passed in by reference here, so we overwrote the future that was passed in. Then we're going to take temp, okay, and we're going to attach a con our, our continuation to it. And keep in mind that that attaching the continuation is going to consume temp. Okay, so now temp gets moved into what's going to become underscore temp, the argument there. Okay, so, so then we're going to do something and the result of that, of that dot then, right, is a new future which we're going to return. Okay, inside of our continuation, we're going to move P, right, you see it right there. Right, we're going to move P inside of our continuation, inside of that lambda, okay? And so now what happens when that lambda executes, it gets the value, okay? So that's the value coming in from temp. It gets the value. It sets the value on P, okay, which sets it back through the future X, and it returns the value, which sends it out through here, okay? So the resulting structure is that. Okay, so we successfully split a future into two things. Now we do need to handle just a little bit more, which is dot .get could throw an exception. And we also want to split the exception and send the exception down to both. Okay, so here we do that. We just check to see if temp has, a, has an exception. If it does, we get the exception pointer we set the exception on, on underscore P, and then we rethrow the exception, which will hand it off to the future that's returned from our split. Okay, so now we can split futures. Okay, so we can do that. Now cancellations. Other than rewriting the whole system, I don't have a good answer for this. And I actually do have slides on how to rewrite the whole system, but it's way longer than we have time for. Uh, what you want is when the last future destructs, is any operation that's leading up to that future that hasn't started to execute, you want it to not execute, okay, and to just no op. So eventually what happens is with these futures, I have futures attached to continuations and I've got splits and I've got joins and I've got some big graph I'm building up conceptually inside of my code. And if I decide, oh, hey, I don't need this value anymore and I let that future destruct, what I want to have happen is say, well, if that operation hasn't started, don't start it, which should get rid of those two uh, uh, futures, right? They were held by that continuation. So those guys go, go away, and what I'm left with is just one chain coming down, right? So my tree can unravel as many levels as it needs. What happens right now if you destruct uh, an STD future, if the STD future came from async, it may block until the thread that it was issued on completes. Uh, it used to absolutely block in C++11, but in C++14, because it could be on a tasking pool, it may block. It's not required to. Um, uh, uh, if it doesn't block, it simply detaches, and all of your results get calculated and then thrown away, right? So you're doing additional work. Now, channels. What's a channel? Well, if you've been following along here, what we're building with futures and promises and these, these tokens that we're passing around, we are building up dependency graphs. And these dependency graphs in your code can get quite large. And a future is an execute once thing, right? You get one value out of a future and then you're done with it. So if you actually watch a piece of code that's written with a lot of, of futures, what you will find is it will build this fairly complicated graph because each of these futures has some shared state somewhere, synchronization primitives around it. So, 
So behind the scenes, it's building this fairly sophisticated graph. And then you fire a value through it or, a, or you, that flows out through this graph, tearing the graph down as it goes. And then your code loops back around and says, hey, let's do that again. Let's build that graph one more time and stick a different value in it and tear it all down. And your code keeps doing that, right? So there can be a fair amount of overhead. So the idea with a channel is what if we can take the graph and we can persist it? Okay. What if when we build up this graph, if we can send multiple values down it without tearing it down every time? Right. So the Go language has something called Go routines and channels that connect Go routines. Okay. So that's an idea that's here. Right. That's what we want. Uh, the basic idea is also what you find if you've been reading about reactive programming models, okay? In which case, so that should say channels are known as behaviors, okay? Each change triggers a notification to the sync value. And each operation within your graph then doesn't need to be a one-to-one -one mapping. I don't need to just stick a simple lambda in there. I could have a coroutine in there that generates a set of functions or a set of results uh, uh, or consumes a number of results and then outputs one, right? So I can have coroutines within my graph that act as generators or as accumulators. So if we had the ability in C++ to write with channels, they might look something like this. Okay? We can create a channel called send, and using the pipe notation here, we can pipe that's a coroutine to it using coawait. Okay? So what this guy's going to do is he's going to keep receiving values through coawait, summing them together. This is uh, Chandler's fa most uh, favorite loop here. Okay, so we're going to sum them together, and then we're going to fall out of this loop when coawait returns that it's done, and we'll return the sum. Okay, and then the piping is just to attach the equivalent of continuations here. We're going to print the result. Okay, so now we can send one, two, three into our channel, and then close the channel to signal that we're done, and that would output six, right? Would sum up those values. Now, if you actually set out to build one of these things, you're going to immediately find you've got a problem. Here's what happens. You build the graph, and these guys are all running at different rates. Okay? So very quickly what happens is you have a whole bunch of values stacked up. Okay. So what you need is a form of flow control. So this guy puts out a value. And then he puts another value, and then he's stuck waiting, right? Because that guy hasn't consumed it yet. Then he consumes it and signals back, hey, I got space for another value. Okay. So it's exactly the same thing as if you've ever done any programming on serial ports, which most of you are probably too young to have ever programmed serial ports. But if you have, um, uh, uh, it's exactly the same thing as doing serial port flow control, right? So channels have the additional complexity that you want serial port flow control. Right. Now, what would come next? If you think about an application, we're building up dependency graphs within in the application. We're persisting the dependency graphs, right? So we don't have to keep rebuilding them. And then we study those persistent dependency graphs. And what we would find is that within our application, there's a finite set of graphs that our application represents. So we have sections of the graph that are conditional, that can come and go. And we have sections of the graph that are effectively somehow mirror images of the same thing. They tend to represent the same thing, just flowing in different directions, right? So what you would find 
is that these functions aren't necessarily just a function that takes a couple values in and puts a value out, but it represents a relationship. Okay? And within your body of code, you have that same relationship represented, but you have it represented as multiple different functions for the different flows through that node. Okay? So maybe this is a multiplication thing here. So given any two values, I can define the third value, right? And in one part of your code, you did a multiplication. And in another part of your code, you did a division with the same set of numbers. But those really represent the same relationship just coming at it from a different direction. Okay? So what if we could take our channels, build up our graph, remove the arrows, okay? and that forms a type of constraint system that's known as a property model, okay? where flow is determined by the priorities of cells, of values within the system, and relationships can be conditional, as I said, so long as the predicate can be determined regardless of the flow. Okay. Cells can only have one in edge, right? right? A given cell can only be determined along one edge or our system's over-constrained. Right? Right. And then we can start to think about how these things flow out. They each represent a state in our system. So how would something like this flow out in an asynchronous system? Right? So we have source values coming in, flowing through our relationships. It determines the flow. So here we have two source values. That causes a flow through our graph, two sync values. Okay. Reflowing a property model doesn't require all the relationships to be resolved, which means I don't have to calculate the functions to figure out the flow of my graph. The only thing I need to calculate is anything that's dependent on a conditional. Right? Otherwise, I can flow it simply based on priority of cells. Creates a single dependency graph for each flow. And over time, these things can be connected. Right? So here, we have two states of our system. Right? We have a value set in source A and then source B, which causes a particular flow. But those are high latency operations, so those take time to flow out. And then a value is set in source C for the next state in our system, OK? Causing a reflow, right? But if you see there, the values in I's are connected. Those are going to be the same value between the two states of our system. We're just going to be, they're attached with continuations effectively. So as we complete the flow from the first state, we'll continue the flow into the second state of our system in our system will just continue to keep, keep running and settle out on the right value. Okay. okay. So the result that we end up with is, is, is like that. Now these graphs have some interesting properties. Uh, they're very useful for UI behaviors, which is why I actually started with them. Uh, there's significant information that's hidden inside the graph itself. Source and derived values form a partition set. What I mean by that is, is very simple. It's just that every item in, in a property model for a given state of the property model is either a source or it's derived, so it partitions it in, into two sections. But further, the source values are order independent, provably, within these graphs. And that means that if you very quickly want to check one of these graphs to make sure that no matter what order the user sets information in or information is coming in over the network in, and it's solvable for any combination of values, it's a very quick algorithm to do that model check. Okay. Equal results regardless of source order also means that these things form what's known as an operational transform. Who knows what an operational transform is? Wow, nobody. OK. Uh, so an operational transform is, is a very particular construct that says 
that regardless of the order that we're editing things in, so long as we make the same edits, we will end up at the same place. So this has huge ramifications if you want to build a distributed system. Because what it means is every user of the system okay, that's collaborating on a single centralized model, every user sees a linearly consistent view of the universe. Right? Everything for them seems to be going forward, either in a reaction to the changes that they made, or if somebody else makes a change, when that change comes in, it comes in sequentially after them. They never go back in time, even if the other user actually made that change before they made their change. Okay? So every user sees a linearly consistent view of the world, and at the end, you have a guarantee that the system will reach the same state. So, so given enough time, all your users in the system will end up at the same place. But they will each have a different view of how they got there. Okay? So this is very important if you want to build a collaborative editing system. Okay? It's also very important in a lot of networking applications. OK, so other information that's in the graph. A value within the graph is implied by the current state if it has only one in edge, if there's no way to have an out edge on that, on that system. Okay, so it has one edge that's fixed coming in. Okay, so source values within the system form what's called the intent of the system. Right? So if you want to do a scripting system, like Photoshop has this scripting system called Actions that does intelligent recording and playback, okay? what you want to do is capture the user's intent. What I mean by that is if the user says, make my document be three inches wide constraining proportions, what you want to record is make my document be three inches wide constraining proportions. What you don't want to record is the command that was actually executed, which is make, make my document be 300 pixels by 500 pixels because that would take all of your documents, regardless of their aspect ratio, and make them 300 pixels by 500 pixels. Okay? The source values are the intent. And you can't just look at what the user changed, because if you did, maybe the user changed both width and height, and so you would record 3 inches by 5 inches constraining proportions, which makes no sense. Okay? So you have to understand all of the relationships in order to capture the intent. And finally, values disconnected from the result or sync are don't care values. And that can be very useful to know in your system, too. And I am kind of out of time. I do have a slot there for a demo. Um, I'm going to skip that for a moment. Final thoughts. As you start to think through the ramifications of concurrency and asynchronous code, I start to think, that maybe even though futures are the minimal transformation to represent a dependency graph, maybe writing in an imperative system, right, where we pretend that it's C++ code that we're executing, when under the hood what we're actually doing is we're building up dependency graphs and tearing them down and mutating the dependency graphs, is very much the wrong level to be coding in, right? Maybe instead we want to start to talk about the graph explicitly and mine the graph for information. Uh, my slides are available uh, for all my presentations at the link that's there. You'll also find uh, papers that I've written on property models, mostly in collaboration with Yako Yarve, at, formerly at Texas A&M, now at uh, University of Oslo, I believe. Um, uh, there's also an experimental future library. Uh, that's up here that does have cancellation, and I've got an experimental implementation of channels up here. Uh, same GitHub website, but it's a different repository, is an implementation of property models, if, if anybody wants to look at property models and play with those. So finally, no raw synchronization primitives. Right. Start to think differently about how you write code so that code doesn't block, so that code can be very high performance and can run without stopping. Right. Really what we're talking about here is communicating sequential processes. Uh, how, how many people know Tony Hoare's book on, on CSP? Nobody again. Okay, so Tony Hoare, classic computer scientist, wrote a great book in the 1970s, 
communicating sequential processes. This is the foundation of the Go language and Go routines. Okay, this is the fundamental theoretical underpinnings of everything I talked about here, right? right? And I think if more people on the standards committee had read and grokked communicating sequential tasks, that we wouldn't have deadlocking gets on our futures right now. So write better code. And I'm going to open it up for questions. I think we only have literally four minutes for four one minutes or two quick ones. So just a brief question or two. Is everybody stunned? I'm seeing stunned faces here. Like, where did this talk go? It started so practical. Question up one here. One over there. Hey, what do you think about await concept introduced by Microsoft a few years ago? Uh, which concept introduced uh, by Microsoft? I think await. And oh, the oh, operating oh. of the concurrency by the state machine. Right, right. Uh, so, 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 so async await or their coroutine work. Um, uh, I think the, the coroutine work is a fundamental building block here. When I got to the point where where I was showing channels, um, I used an example using using co-await, which is async await, which is is the coroutine operation. Um, uh, uh, coroutines are absolutely critical if you want if you want high performance task system without jumping through backflips to write code. Right, writing a communicating sequential process without a coroutine either means you're spinning it up on a thread, which is very resource heavy, or you're doing backflips writing very sophisticated state machine as a, as a function object, which can get very tedious very fast. Um, when I talked about taking our rendering system to JavaScript, uh, the way that I did that was I went through, it was not a huge number of places, but I went through sections in the code where we had producer consumer patterns which required concurrency to execute. And I had to take that code, and since I didn't have coroutine facilities uh, within Clang, I had to manually uh, uh, do the transform of the producer-consumer states into coroutines so that I could task chain the coroutines to get everything to run. Uh, and that is a very painful operation to do. Um, I also have arguments with people frequently, I really fundamentally think that if you're going to build a system that's going to scale to many, many cores, you absolutely have to build it so that you can scale down to one core. Okay, if you cannot run single-threaded one core, then you do not know how much concurrency your application requires. You only know that it requires more than one core. And usually the answer is, is some n under some situation or you deadlock, okay? So, so if you really want to build scalable code, you have to make sure it runs down to one thread. And the only way to do that is with, with a coroutine system. The only good practical way to do it is with coroutines. So I chat with Gore at Microsoft about this stuff quite a bit. Um, um, I'm, I'm afraid we need to wrap this up, Sean. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean Parent. He's done two talks for us during Code Dive and he deserves twice as long cheers with double the energy. So I'll time you guys, 15 seconds, at least 15 <laughs> seconds of cheers. Keep going. Ten. Five. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, 15 minute break and uh, Let's get back together in the room in 15 minutes. What's that? <laughs> Yay! I'm yelling here.
Welcome back. Thanks for coming. If you'd like to take your seat, um, I'm going to introduce the last sort of full-time speaker of the day. And by full-time, I really mean it. Uh, you may remember uh, the speaker Bartosz Szurgot. He's been uh, with Code Dive since the very beginning, so it's his third time. That's why I think we can safely call him our full-time speaker. Uh, so he's back, obviously, by popular demand. People find his talks really interesting his slides extremely funny, and his sense of humor irresistible. He's a man of a thousand faces. He's a coder, he's a 3D printer, he's a hacker, and a geek, of course. His professional life includes C++, Linux, and Embedded. And again, I was, I was trying to, to dig out something personal about Bartek, and um, just by accident, I spoke to uh, one of his colleagues. And uh, he said, you know, when I was writing my code, I wrote sort of 30 lines, and then I asked Bartek to consult on this, and in these 30 lines, Bartek found 40 ways of doing it better. That's the expertise we are dealing with, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And also this afternoon, I, um, I heard a nickname about uh, Bartos, but but before I tell you what the nickname is, can, can I ask you, I mean, how are you with dangerous situations? Do you normally keep your cool? Do you panic? Can you keep your cool in dangerous situations? Okay, let's, let, let's try it. I mean, the, the reason I'm asking is that uh, Bartek has been described to me as, a, quote, dynamite. Uh, so just in case, May I ask? Uh, you should you should have your uh, special seat belts in your chairs. Can you can you ask? Can you see them? Yeah. If you don't, imagine you've got them and make sure that you fasten your seat belts because I'm going to introduce taming software, including, of course, C++ and embedded by Bartosz Szurgot. Well. So hello everyone, uh, welcome to Taming of the Software, obviously featuring C++ some embedded stuff and more. Uh, I'm Bartek Shurgat, but I usually just refer to my name self as uh, Bash, the nickname, because it's first uh, short, easy, and easier to pronounce by foreigners. So most of the time I'm writing software in C++, and this is like my daily work. I also use Linux daily, so I write a lot of shell scripts in Bash and from time to time to some Python coding, and over time usually a microcontroller electronics. And since recently I do a lot of presentations, actually LaTeX became a tool of my choice as well. So you can say that most of the time just like geeking around. And in my spare time, I provide human race with groundbreaking innovation like the wall-mounted 3D printed tablet holder for your toilet. It's really awesome, give it a try. Yeah, but no worries, this is not what we're gonna talk about today. Instead, we're gonna talk about something completely different. We're gonna talk about software. So, we'll be building, decomposing, abstracting, and testing. Does it sound familiar to you? Yeah, sure, yeah, software developers as well. So you do this on a daily basis. So the first and obvious question is, if it's so omnipresent and everyone does that, then why even bother to talk about that? Well, Actually, my observation is that in majority of the projects, the way things are organized actually remind me of an old cartoon when one of the main characters used to say, well, isn't it cute? But it's wrong! Um, you know, the thing is that people have this tendency to reinvent the wheel. And when wheel gets reinvented, it usually turns out to be square. And this makes developers sad and over time causes a lot of confusion in the project and over time more and more. So today, we'll be talk, uh, talking about road signs. I will give you a set of battle-tested advices on how to deal with these common problems and hopefully push your projects into the right direction. Well, let's start with builds. We'll have this little pet project, some uh, weather station connected to different devices over Wi-Fi, some uh, Internet of Things maybe, mix of multiple uh, technologies. But first thing we do, obviously, we need some sort of a build. So build, mar build mark one has two targets, make clean and make image. What do you think about such a build? Anyone? Good, bad, missing something? Yeah, first of all, release the bug, definitely. But there is something even simpler, maybe. Thank you. 
no unit tests. There is no target here for unit tests. So what can you expect about this project, right? This will be hell of a crap, right? No unit tests at all, a lot of binaries, and obviously testing everything on a hardware. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So let's try build uh, Mark II. Okay, we have unit tests, so it improved things a little bit, but already a colleague noticed, yeah, but the bug release would probably be a good idea as well. So in a way, I think this test actually gave us a false sense of um, correctness, right? Like having this R tied with the rope to the wagon, right? It didn't really fix a problem, right? We're just a little bit closer to it. So scratch that, we definitely need a plan. So we really need to think, uh, what are our requirements here? So let's think about build options. What actually build should provide? We'll divide them into two sections, uh, the core ones and the nice to haves ones. So core, obviously debug release, right? Another thing, some sort of set of targets. So we would like to build target software for the platform, uh, some tests, when it comes to tests, it might be like unit test, module test, integration test, we might have different target for these. Uh, also an architecture, at least two, First will be like our target hardware, let's say ARM V8, and the other one AMD64, so our workstation that we work on. We would like to have our code, also the production code, to be compilable and runnable on our PC. We'll talk about how to do it later. And some nice to haves. Well, sanitizers. Uh, we actually have, an, uh, uh, this year we have an expert on sanitizers, uh, Chandler Card, so you can actually consult him when it comes to uh, details, but basically we'll definitely want to see if we are not going uh, out of the bounds uh, when it comes to access. Do we have uh, some race conditions in threads, memory leaks, and stuff like that. So definitely a good option. Since we are doing tests, it would also be nice to have a coverage to actually see if our tests do test what we expect them to test. And last but not least, permit warnings. Well, it's not maybe obligatory, and I personally do consider warnings of, as an error by default. Uh, I still like to have an option to turn this off from time to time, because when we are doing refactoring on some base component for a huge code base, it actually might be cumbersome to fix warnings that you already know that are there, but they are okay, you're fine. You are just testing this little part that you do not want to hold build to collapse because of it. And for a day or two, you actually might want to leave it thus. Okay. So we have it defined, and this is where we come to rule number one, orthogonal build. Old build options should be independent of one another. So we defined this set of options, typeset, architecture, and so on, and we would like to be able to change one of them at a time without affecting the others. So for instance, we might be doing uh, tests with sanitizers or without, in the uh, compiled tests in release or debug mode, depending on the, actually what do we want to test. And we have two types, up to two sets, architectures might be two or more, sanitizers for options, um, uh, coverage is like on off, warnings on off. If you do the math, you will actually notice that we just generated a build that uh, can produce uh, around 500 different results. And you might say, okay, why would anyone want to have a build with 500 different possible targets? And I say, it's all about the freedom. Actually, you do what you want, right? You have a build and you ask it to do the work and provide you the binaries. And even though that most of the time you will be just probably using like five or 10% of its possibilities, it's still there for you to use it once you need it. And even though that 99% of the time it might actually look like a little bit of over-engineering, that actually it also allows you to do a very smart thing, uh, like this zero-waste bread cutter. For instance, uh, so to give you some real-life life examples, you might actually want to have unit tests run on the actual hardware. And frankly speaking, this saved my butt at least twice, um, because I was actually hitting a bug which was uh, only reproducible on a certain compiler, and this was compiler for the target platform, not the compiler that I have on my PC. So another example, you might actually want to target software to be running on your PC with certain restrictions, but we'll talk about it later. So having this in place, you can actually do a lot of interesting things that can improve your work. Yeah, and when we do this, implement it, we'll have this nice command. Build command, type debug, set production, architecture, MIP64, sanitizer, address, uh, coverage, true, permit, warnings, true. <laughs> right, cool. No more than 60 meters. Probably not even 150 characters. Everyone would like to type it like 100 times a day, don't, don't you? <laughs> yeah, okay, so obviously something's wrong. Wh what do you think? On one hand, we want these options. On the other hand, uh, we do not really want to type this all the time. Any suggestions? Yeah, precisely. Let's provide some default values, right? Because, well, let's be honest, uh, how often you manually enable coverage? How often will you uh, disable warnings, right? 
So most of the time, you will actually be good with the default values. And this is where the rule number two comes, easy build. Builds should be easy to use. Any required complex complexity must be hidden inside. So first thing, uh, obviously, all the, the values should have a default, uh, default value. And the second thing is, if there, are any ma there is any magic required to set up your SDK, push it to the build as well, not to bother developers about it. The build should be as easy as possible. In perfect, solu in perfect solution, this should be like one command being run if you are using CMake, make it two, and preferably without any extra parameters for the most common scenarios. And defaults should always be for developers. If you make developers type 150 characters to do their build, they will die in front of the keyboard, or you will die in front of yours. Depends. So. Definitely target them, not CI, not tools, developers. And what developers do or should be doing daily, mostly, w when it comes to coding. <laughs> Thank you. Thinking, yes. Uh, but once we do the thinking and we actually need to implement something, where do we start? Tests. Yep. So probably a good default, this is just a suggestion, but probably a good default actually will be to build tests on the local platform. So that this should be the most common case. You change something, you have a test for it, you build and you run tests automatically. Like click, click, okay, we have click, click, okay, it works, right? So this will be the most common situation and this is the one which probably is the worth optimizing for. Yeah, <coughs> and even though this tool, uh, sorry, this talk is mostly about concepts, so I like try to avoid talking about tools, I would like to mention one, th one thing um, at the end of the build section because most projects, uh, embedded projects, actually use either make or CMake plus make combination. But however, there is one more interesting choice. CMake plus Ninja. How many of you know Ninja build? Okay, cool, probably around 30 people, maybe more. Okay, Ninja is actually a nice replacement for make, which actually doesn't carry any legacy crap with which make does. I don't know if you know, but uh, when you have like, uh, some targets in make, it checks, for instance, if this is not a Fortran program. If you actually start make uh, with uh, all the debugs to show what is actually happening, you, for the simple task, you will notice like two screens of possible tests. And this actually slows things down. You can actually do it much faster. And this is where Ninja kicks in. Ninja has absolutely no... Uh, automated targets, like target deducing, no. Everything needs to be written explicitly. And obviously, this is a pain if you do it manually. But on the other hand, if you have a generator like CMake, voila. And to give you some numbers, uh, in project I currently work in, it actually takes four seconds for Make to realize everything is built, our, tar our targets are up to date, and nothing needs to be done. On the other hand, when we switch to Ninja, one more switch to, uh, to CMake, we actually have this uh, down to 40 milliseconds. So two rows of magnitude gain. Quite a win. Give it a try. It actually speeds up the compilation as well because it do doesn't require so much time to check for dependencies. Okay, so two things to remember out of, uh, out of the build section. First, orthogonal builds, so we change parameters independent from one another. And the second thing, make sure your build is easy to use. It's human friendly. You check out the repository, run one command, and off it goes. You have build software. Might be the test, but you have built something to start with. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about components. Looks familiar to you? Dependency diagram? Yeah, okay, any comments on this? What's wrong? What went wrong here? <laughs> Everything, yeah. In a way, actually, uh, probably somewhere around this, this is a problem. We have a lot of interdependencies and components just like depend on one another and probably everyone to everyone somewhere around here. So we have just this enormous ma uh, mass of uh, dependencies inside. And this is actually a classic face palm for the design. Just too many dependencies inside. If you think about it, this is an IT equivalent of do not touch any of these wires solution, right? Just too many dependencies. No one actually is knowing what is happening b behind there. And if something breaks, then uh, uh, we should probably fix it, right? So, no. <coughs> but there's more. There's, there's time to link it, right? Uh, I highlighted in red the most important part, but probably you cannot see it, so let's zoom in a little bit. And here we have this uh, starting start group and end group. This is a very old school of linking, but still quite popular in embedded projects. How many of you know linking groups? Wow, so three, four, four people maybe? Okay. so. When it comes to regular linking, it goes like this. We have some main, which has dependencies to other objects, so we pass linker a set of libraries we want to link against. Linker checks the library, 
resolves all the symbol that is uh, that it was uh, missing and adds the new symbols for these libraries which are still undefined and proceeds with next library resolve some symbols and add new undefined and it goes up to the end of the command line once it reaches the end either you have a working binary all symbols have been resolved or you have a situation where some symbol has not been found in the library and this is a linking error the symbol is missing and that's it and someone realized that, yeah, okay, but if we actually make a circular dependencies between the components, so A depends on B and B depends on the A, then we actually have a problem because we need to put these libraries multiple times, twice at best, but probably more, into the linking command in order for linker uh, to resolve all the symbols correctly. So someone came up with idea, hmm, okay, so let's actually consider this a group and tell linker, look for the symbols inside this group as long as possible, just to make sure that finally we find it. If we checked all the libraries and all the symbols and haven't found it, then okay, we signal the problem. So let's do the math. So we'll have G groups, M dependencies per each group or library, and we have, oh my god, complexity. Actually, if you multiply this, this is n square, and I think this is how mammoths die. They were using n square linking, and actually they die, they're just starved to death in front of their computers, waiting for build to finish. I personally once worked in a project uh, where it took around 20 minutes to do the from scratch build of everything. This was quite a big project. And then it took three minutes to link. Think about it. Three minutes of linking. You're doing a little tiny change in this little library, which compiles in half a second, and then you wait three times for it to link. Something went wrong, right? So the rule number one regarding components is dependency tree. Dependencies of each component must form a tree. So make sure it's just plain and simple. There is a main, there is a component one, component two, main depends on these components. They might have a common set of dependencies like component four, that's fine. Problem is if component four depends on component two because then we have a cycle and then we fall into the trap of linking groups which makes it incredibly long. So please hug the trees, make your work environment green, save the forest and everyone will be happy and stuff like that. So just, just make sure your components are always, for always forming a tree. Now, another classical example you're joining a project, you're having a look uh, at some source, and you would like to see where actually this uh, includes belong. This is the part of the component, maybe something uh, from the outside of the library. Where would you start to look for this includes when seeing the file? I would have a look at the compilation. So the command line for the compiler. So let's copy and paste it um, on the slide. And for your convenience, I highlighted everything uh, that is important in red. So you usually then see all the includes libraries of all the projects, wherever it goes, and it's all squeezed into one single command line. Uh, my, my personal record, uh, the, compi the compilation, uh, the, the command to compile actually was one screen long on a really, really big LCD. So this, well, this is probably the first signal that something is wrong, right? You look at it and so big, no. There is a problem. And in fact, there is. If you think about it, you now might have actually non-unique file names. So you might have a foo component with writer HPP file and a bar component with writer HPP file. Hmm? Sounds scary? Let's go further. Actually, now, include of orders does matter, because what actually include writer HPP means? Well, it depends, kind of, because if you first include foo and then bar, then writer HPP will obviously be foo. But if you do bar and then foo, then writer HPP will be bar writer, right? Sounds interesting, but it actually gets even funnier because you have these two components that uh, up until now were independent, and then you created a Fizzbus component with re which requires a dependency towards a foo and towards a bar. And guess what? You are unable to come up with a reasonable set of flags to compile it because either way, you will always hit this writer or this writer, and you are in deep problem. So definitely not the way to go. But some people still think they can actually cheat the system they can underscore it with the name of the component. So we can have foo slash foo underscore writer HPP. Right? Bar, so then bar underscore writer HPP. That's cool, right? No. R no, definitely, this is not the way to go. So rule number one is about namespace segregation. Keep files inside directories named after namespaces they contain. Each file is named after class it contains. May sound complicated, but in fact, it's that simple. Let's have a look at example. So we have a class named writer, which is located in the namespace bar, which in turn is located in the namespace foo. So we map name namespaces to directories foo and bar, 
and a, cl a class name to the file. So our header is foobar writer HPP and implementation is foobar writer CPP. And that's it. You always see the class, you know the namespaces, so you know you know exactly where it's located. And because you usually call the namespaces after the components, this actually is a component directory. So it's very simple. It's very easy to understand, very easy to follow. And actually, right now, you'll have just one single include into your project. Because that's all it takes. You just need to point to the root of the project, and then all the paths from that point on will come on naturally. And now, thanks to the file system, you will never have a collision on file names. Because if you have a collision and you will try to like create a new file that already exists, you will actually open a file that exists and you will see the content, right? And if you like create two writers in two different directories, this means that they will be in a different directory, so no problem on a file system level. And since the directories differ, it also means the namespace differs, so there is no collision on object level as well. So that's simple. No problems from that point on. But whenever I introduce this rule in the project, someone comes and asks, OK, but what about private includes? I mean, each component has some includes and uh, that it needs to use for internal purposes, but you definitely do not want to signal anyone that this is a public interface. I personally used a Boost detail convention here, uh, which is used by Boost. Uh, and the idea is very simple. Uh, if you have something that, for whatever reason, can technically speaking be included by someone or used, just put it into detail namespace. And according to our convention, let's put it into detail directory as well. So effectively, we might have a component with two public uh, headers, the interface, full public HPP and full interface HPP. And then if you want to have some internal implementation, you just add a detail here. Detail namespace and directory and then some internal HPP, do not touch HPP. And this is actually very easy to follow. So actually, for all the projects I worked in and we had this uh, rule applied, uh, it was just enough to do the code review. So during code review, you can uh, clearly see that you are including something from the detail namespace of the other component. It really strikes eye. So basically, it's just enough to do it uh, as a part of the code review. The rule will be followed. It's if you have like really big project and you want to be like super sure that it never happens, you can also create a shell script of probably like three or four lines to check each component if it doesn't uh, include something from the other components. And you can actually make it as a part of your uh, CI run. So for each commit, the rule will be enforced by the tool. can do this, but frankly speaking, most of the time, it just works out of the box. OK, so two things to remember out of the components. First, dependency tree. Your, de your components always must form a tree. This is first, avoid a linking and square linking. And the second thing, it actually keeps your architecture clean. So if you're like on a good side of the force, you'll probably, it, it will just like come up naturally. And the second thing is namespace to directory mapping. So whenever you have a namespace, make directory out of it and put files inside and files are named after classes. So we have one-to-one -one mapping here. Okay, so now let's talk about how. I promised uh, some embedded. So whenever embedded uh, developers talk about portable code, they usually mean something like this. Please do not read it. It's really not important. It's like copy and paste from, from some random project open source. Instead, I'd like you to have a look from, uh, for, uh, on it uh, from a distance and tell me what color is dominant and what is it responsible for. <laughs> Beg your pardon? <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. So the dominant color here is preprocessor, right? So actually, if you count the lines, uh, almost exactly half of the lines here is preprocessor, right? So just by looking at the source, you know you have seen it before, and you're almost sure it shouldn't sound like this. So something went wrong along the line. And uh, here, let me quote uh, Stephen Durst here from his excellent book, C++ Gotcha. Quote, I have to use a uh, preprocessor if dev statement to handle the different platform requirements, end quote. To prove your point, such as it is, you display the following code. Some portable code, if dev platform A, do platform A specific stuff, and if, if dev platform B, do platform B specific stuff, and if. The conclusion. The co uh, this code is not platform independent. It's multi-platform dependent. Any change to any of the platforms requires not only recompilation of the source, but change to the source of all platforms. You've achieved maximum coupling among platforms. A remarkable achievement, if somehow impractical. Nothing to be added here, I suppose. So the rule number one for HAL is don't use if-devs. When you are using if-devs, you're definitely doing something wrong. 
But embedded developers, please don't panic. There are techniques that actually can circumvent that, so we can, do ha we can have really portable code with nice separation of concerns without using preprocessor. And it basically it boils down to providing a proper set of abstractions and a little bit support from build. So about the HAL itself. Uh, HAL stands for Hardware Abstraction Layer. So it's basically the lowest, the lowest part of the, the lo lowest layer of your compo of your system. Uh, there is a component that actually directly talks to the hardware. From this point on, there should be like straight straight line, and ab uh, above it, there is only a business logic. So we have like clean separation of the code that is platform dependent from the business logic that is above it. Please, however, note that HAL is not a recursive acronym. It doesn't stand for HAL abstraction layer. So if you have like HAR over HAR over HAL and so on in your project, please fix that and then like we'll proceed with the remaining parts. So <coughs> having this said, let's talk about hardware abstraction layer. Uh, let's first start with a little quiz where actually HAL could be useful. Let's have a look at a few examples. First, like good examples, init LCD. This is nice, right? We just say we want to initialize an LCD, and we really do not uh, care if this is like LCD connected to the big computer, or maybe this is like two by sixteen little display which can uh, display only characters since connected to my mi to our microcontroller. So sounds reasonable. Then a back key pressed, returning bool. Okay, again quite abstract. Actually, this might be an on-screen button, uh, like we, uh, on a touch screen, we can like click it with the mouse, or maybe this is one of these big red buttons for the oh shit moments, right? You do not care, right? You just check if the button has been pressed. Again, reading from serial port and returning one byte. Okay, we do not really care if reading here actually means like manipulating registers, or maybe there's some queue internally done, or maybe we're using a syscall for different platforms. It doesn't matter. We are just reading one byte. Some bad examples. Read status register returning int. Yeah, okay, cool. Now, can someone tell me how do I interpret these bits? Yeah, I cannot either, right? So probably there is a problem. And most likely, even if someone will actually come up with a, with a reasonable definition, the new platform will arrive and we'll be back to square one. No way to go. Stateless line 15. Okay, again, any help from the room? Yeah, I suppose so. I also do not have an idea what's the status line 15. And port A, return one byte. Well, that's super obvious. Uh, until you actually change a platform and this will be like two bytes. Or until you get a new hardware and actually stuff that was usually connected to port A is now connected to the port B. So now will you like rename it for one platform or for all platforms? Or maybe you'll just remember that actually port A is port B on this one particular hardware. Well, difficult choice, right? But life is about choices. Yeah, so you probably already see the pattern here. The good examples are all about uh, answering what question, what should be done. The bad examples actually try to address how question, how we should implement it. So basically here we are leaking abstractions, while here we are, we are stating what do we want to do without referring to underlying details. So this will be like the rule of thumb here. And now let's play a little bit with interface and implementation. So I promise to keep it like a little bit too agnostic, uh, but we obviously stick to the C++ world. And uh, let's say that we have our abstract component, which is called stuff. And we will like to enable stuff. So we make enable stuff HPP file, which contains just one function, enable stuff. And then we do the implementation. Enable stuff CPP, uh, one function enable stuff, and then if the platform A, do some platform A related stuff, and else do the platform bar related stuff and div. Any comments? Yeah, exactly. What we did wrong? If dev, precisely. We just said that we do not really want to use the if devs because they're they're actually causing problems, and uh, all these uh, internal uh, dependencies between platform locate co-located. So this is like the code for which you get a face bomb from the polar bear, and when you get a face bomb from the polar bear, you definitely know that something is not right. So let's try to fix it. There is a technique called split backend, and it's very simple. Uh, you create enable stuff underscore name of the platform, let it be foo, dot cpp, where you implement a function enable stuff which does only platform foo related uh, things. And then there is an enable stuff underscore bar, another platform, dot cpp, that has enable stuff but internally performs only platform bar related elements. And the one last thing that we are missing is a build. Inside build, we add to the list of sources our implementation file, so in our case this would be enable stuff underscore a platform CPP. 
So here, we actually tell the build to take a proper file for a proper platform and do the compilation. So this way, actually, when it comes to this hardware-related part, uh, different files are selected for different platforms. And this is how we actually decouple the elements from one another. But again, if you do this uh, right uh, this way, commit it to the repository, probably no longer than a few hours, maybe a few days, and someone will come to your desk and ask this famous question, yeah, okay, but what about the footprint? Mm. And I usually answer, yeah, what about it? Actually, have you measured it? Because if we do not measure, we really do not know what are we talking about. If you actually start to change the code without uh, knowing uh, what was the original intent, what was the original size, speed, then you do not, do not really know if you actually improve things or make it worse. And you are like you have equal chances to do both because you haven't measured. So first, let's measure. And actually, if you measure, you will notice that most of the time the solution is just good enough. Because even if you have like this little extra overhead for calling a function, I mean, how often do you initialize LCD or a serial port? Like maybe once at the program startup? You might say, okay, but I'm like reading from the serial port constantly. Okay, but most likely you have microcontroller that runs at some tens of megahertz, or maybe a PC running at gigahertz, and then you have the serial port that pumps data in kilobytes, right? So really, not that much of a problem. But obviously, you might hit a very reasonable situation where actually this is a problem. These few bytes extra will really cause you uh, cause a lot of headaches, and maybe you are not uh, uh, real time um, making real time requirements. So what to do then? I would first go for LTO, link time optimization. How many of you are familiar with LTO? Okay, around 30 people, maybe 40. Yeah. Okay, so just to make sure everyone's on the same page. LTO is link time optimization, so it basically says, uh, uh, how it works is um, it allows us to do certain optimizations that normally are done for a single translation unit, a single file that we compile, actually at link time. So normally, if you have two different translation units, two different CPP files, and you compile them both and link them, if there is any dependency, the linker will just pull in both files and make a function call from one to the other. But with LTO enabled, you can actually enable linker to reason about what is happening between these two files. So it actually may notice that we are doing function call from one object to another, but actually this is very, very little function, because like one or two lines. So instead of doing a function call, we can just inline it in place. So this way, we can actually get rid of all the overhead. And this is not only the overhead inside uh, our hull part. Actually, this will improve the whole project, because everyone might be using these little functions just to make sure their architecture is clean, and then we actually remove extra overhead for it. But obviously, we are embedded developers, so we are very often dealing with platforms that do not really support uh, a lot of fancy features, and we actually might turn out not to be able to use LTO simply because compiler or linker doesn't support it. So then there is one more technique called split header, and you probably uh, might figure out uh, where, we are, where actually we are heading with it. And split header works very similar to split backend, but now instead of playing with CPP files, we'll, enable, we'll play with includes. So we have foo slash enable stato, uh, st stuff dot HPP, and we have an inline function enable stuff that do all the foo related elements. Then we create a bar directory and enable stuff HPP here, inline enable stuff and do all the platform bar related functionality. And again, we glue it on a build system level. So we just add a one single flag to the compilation. Just add one more include directories, the directory which is named after the platform. And we're good to go. If someone includes enable stuff, if we are compiling for platform foo, this file will be selected. If it's platform bar, then we select this file. And we're good to go. So rule number two is about split backend. Separate platform dependent implementations with split backend, split header, or a mixture of both, because you can actually use both solutions at the same time. Most of the time, I would recommend split backend because it uh, offers uh, clean separation. Uh, it uh, allows you to include less when you are using these hardware-related elements, so it's good. But on, cer on certain occasions, you might fall back to using split header as well. Now, this is how we improve projects. This is how we make Polar Burst pleased. But there is more to it. Probably, if the if your project is big enough, you will finally get the message from the manager, OK, our clients are super excited about these features we're working on, and we would really like to have this new platform and port our code there. So how do we actually port a code to a new platform? We're using this split backend. We have this nice separation. But again, how would you approach it? 
I reserved the whole slide to explain it, but again, maybe someone already has an idea. Okay, okay. One, my one-liner here is find repository path name, and we are finding files matching star underscore and name of one of the platforms. Let's say amd64.cpp. This command will list you all the files inside the repository that are platform dependent for this particular platform. And for, the, for all the other platforms, you will get exactly the same set of files, only this ending will be different. So now you can have a look at it and go to your manager and say, okay, uh, we checked, we have 30 files that need to be adopted for the new platform. Each of them is on, on average 100, 100 lines long, so we effectively need to write 3,000 lines of code and taking into consideration the speed and efficiency of our team, it roughly maps to one month. That's quite a fair estimation, don't you think? We can actually support our claims, how long will it take with the actual numbers. We have implemented a few platforms and we already know exactly which points need to be, che uh, which points need to be checked. And there is more, because once we do this, once we implement all the files for, for the new platform, we obviously need to test it. But what is a nice thing, because we separated the sources, we now know that we do not really need to uh, test all the platforms that we had support already. Supported, right? Because we have not changed their sources. We just added new sources solely for the new platform. So only thing that requires uh, test uh, throughout testing is the new platform, the thing that we have added which is a very good feature. But again, there's more. Uh, there, uh, how many of you have heard about, uh, um, about modules for C++? Okay, how many of you have heard it for about a decade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a feature that we are waiting for uh, quite a long time. But the interesting fact is that uh, inside the proposals for modules, actually uh, most of them state that preprocessor will not be available inside the module. So either module or preprocessor. But guess what? We are actually not using preprocessor at all in our solution. No, no, nowhere in our repository there is a single if dev for it. So actually, this is the place where you make polar bears dance out of happiness, because you're not only having a very good solution, you're also a future proof. Excellent, right? What a beautiful day. Okay, so regarding hardware abstraction layer, two things to remember. First, don't use if devs. And if I will ask for one single message that I would like you to take out of this room, don't use if devs, please. Instead, split backend or split header. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about testing. So whenever people are, people are talking about testing, they usually refer to unit tests, module tests, integration tests, sometimes system tests, and this is not what I actually want to talk about. Instead, I'd like to talk about a little bit about automated tests versus the manual tests. So whenever people are talking about manual tests, they usually refer to it as bad tests, right? The one that we need to do manual are bad. I actually happen to have a little bit different opinion here. I actually think uh, that they can work in a complementary fashion. It's actually about the trade-offs. So, if you have automated tests, they're repeatable. Yeah, same input, same output, same code. They are fast because machines execute them. But they actually require a framework setup. And when I'm talking about the framework, it's usually not that bad because uh, for unit tests, you are like having a Google test, maybe some catch or two or other framework, and it's like five minutes of work. But on the other hand, if you have uh, hard parts that are platform related, they require actually to work with the hardware, you'll probably need an emulator for your platform. And uh, by platform, I do not mean only the CPU. I mean the platform uh, as the whole set. If there is an LCD or a serial port, you also need to have it emulated, connected to the proper pins. So this actually might lead uh, to the situation where you will need to write the one from scratch. And this is a significant amount of work. So probably only the biggest projects could afford that. And this is where manual tests kick in. Because even though they're slow and error prone, because again, human need to interpret the result, they actually require a minimal setup. So uh, if you think about it, when you are doing a manual test, you are just writing a small, simple binary that you put on the device, run, and observe the result. And that's it, right? So you basically require only to have a hardware on your desk and nothing more. So in a way, if you have a look at the plus and minuses here, they are complementary. And this is where maybe not a rule, but a suggestion, uh, number one, comes in. The best effort. Use automated and manual tests in complementary fashion to speed up the development. And let's have a look at some examples. 
So how would you deal with a situation that you need to have some custom container fine-tuned for your data set and you need to implement it and now how many of you would implement it, uh, these tests in automated fashion? Please raise your hand. Okay. How many of you would do it in manual fashion? Okay. Okay. I would definitely go for automated here. Why? Well, Actually, container is sort of a business logic. It's not really hardware dependent, right? So we can easily test it in memory and we'll have repeatable tests. And if someone, because we're doing this probably due to some optimization, if someone will come in half a year and then uh, try to optimize it even further, it would be good to have uh, some sort of um, uh, some sort of uh, base ground to know that we are by optimizing, we are not breaking the basic functionality. Then another serial port driver. Again, automated tests. Okay, manual tests. Okay, most people will go for manual. I'd go for manual here as well. Because if you're doing automated testing, you actually require to have this platform emulation, which can be really a heavyweight. On the other hand, how often the implementation of in silicon serial port changes? Once you implement it and test it, you'll probably never, wa uh, never touch it ever again for this particular platform. So it's like, like a good start to do the manual tests. Now, you have some tests that requires to be run uh, as a part of uh, continuous integration. Automated tests? Manual tests? Okay, this was catchy, but no one catches it. Okay, good. Obviously, uh, here we need to go for automated tests because part of continuous integration means we need to run it over and over again. So, definitely automated. And the last one, DMA access to the LCD buffer. So, we would like to write on a screen as fast as possible. So, again, automated tests. Okay, a few people. Manual tests? Okay, majority, definitely. Yep, I'll also go for manual. Why? Again, because this is actually, uh, aside from the fact that you have an emulator, you, uh, it's actually very, it's super hard uh, to test it. Think about it. You are writing using DMA to some memory location, right? Okay, but now how can you tell if this is correct? I mean, what these bytes actually, or bits actually mean? And if you're having manual tests, it's easy. When the uh, white rabbit pops up, you follow it, right? You're good. But if you see some scrambled image, then you know the test doesn't work. So you just run single binary, open a window, and then you see if your code works or not. So it's super easy to test manually. And again, you probably already see the pattern where suggestion number two, how boundary. Hull is usually just a good layer to uh, distinguish between manual and automated tests. Whenever we are talking about hardware testing, uh, like for the, this lower layer of the software, it's usually good to give it a try with manual tests. But when it comes to business logic, pretty much always we should uh, do the automated testing. Yeah, but some notes here. First, automated hardware test. Uh, you can still have these. You might have, for instance, a reference platform connected, physical platform connected to the physical PC with a predefined set of cables and run automated tests there. It is doable. I have seen projects w where it worked like a charm. So if it's possible for you, you can spare one device. This is a very good idea. Uh, if it's possible, you might be doing a hardware emulation, but as we said, this is expensive. And last but not least, the manual tests needs to be implemented and versioned as well. By manual test here, I do not mean like play around with cables and see if it doesn't explode. No, we're, we, ha we're we are having a hardware, we're pushing the binary that we compiled. The binary might be simple, just like initialize serial port, send some bytes and receive some bytes and print them, something like this. But then we can co manually connect this real serial co console to the device and see if these bytes actually get transferred. So this is what I mean by manual tests. Only the, the human part is in impl interpreting the result and nothing more. So two things to remember. B first, uh, the best effort approach. So try to balance between automated and manual tests to get as much uh, of development speed as possible. And consider the how boundary for doing manual versus automated testing. Okay. And this set, we approach the end of our presentation, C++ style. Uh, well, obviously, I do not try to sell you a golden hammer. Uh, so, for instance, uh, to give you some counter example, if you are doing the project that has one or two thousand lines of code, you can probably do it any way you want and it will just work, right? But on the other hand, if your project gets bigger, you will find more and more of these advices useful and probably after reaching some point in time, you will just find it irresistible because otherwise you will be just uh, fighting with bugs that normally should not be there in the first place. So please apply them with care and consider them like a good guidelines and, and tested practices. So to summarize the whole talk, 
the builds orthogonal, so multiple options independent of one another, and build as such trivial to use. Components tree structure, so always form a tree, never cycles, and namespace uh, to directory mapping to make sure that symbols and file names are always unique. How? No if devs, ever, never. Instead, split backend and split header. And when it comes to testing, uh, first consider best effort approach to balance, and then consider a hull as a layer of, of split b between the implementation of manual and automated tests. Okay, on this slide I uh, put some links for reading, uh, but the presentation will be available offline, so we'll not, um, we'll not be going through them. Uh, instead, we'll try to switch directly to the question and answer session. So if you have any questions, this would be the good time to ask them. I think, uh, how much time do we have? About 12 minutes. Awesome, perfect. So questions, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, please. First um, question over there. Okay, there will be runners with microphones. Uh, uh, just uh, one remark. For, per for another person who have a question, please raise your hand so the runner can just give you a microphone so it will just go smoother. Okay, please. Okay, you mentioned that we need to preserve a tree structure of the component inside our uh, inside our application. So, mm -hmm. do we uh, do you have any advice how to uh, automatically preserve it? Have some automates to check if we have any circular dependencies inside our build. Yes, uh, the tool is linker. Actually, if you create a circular dependency, uh, you will just find out that the, some symbols have not been found. Because, uh, for instance, the order of libraries uh, will then uh, cause it, uh, when you pass the library, for just let me give you an example. Library B and A. A linker goes through B, and uh, then notice that B depends on A, so it resolves the symbol for A, but then on A it will find the symbols that were supposed to be resolved with B, but at the time the B was processed, it didn't have this information. So basically you will go through the whole list of libraries and find out that these symbol certain symbols from B were not found. This is quite a f ob obvious situation, mm -hmm. but for example, if you are using, for example, CMake, mm -hmm. uh, you can go to the situation where you are uh, explicitly giving uh, uh, dependencies for your uh, single component mm -hmm. uh, in uh, different places, in different files. So it is easy okay. to make this uh, depend uh, these dependencies, and uh, just linker will uh, CMake will give a proper GCC command, and you will see it only if you see verbose mm -hmm. output of the CMake. Yeah, uh, actually, before the question and answer, I thought like, okay, torpedoes in the water, and there's the first one, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's actually not that bad because, as I said, usually when you get into circular dependencies, you would like to y you will end up having multiple times the same library put into the linker command in order for it to work. So for like maybe one single break of the rule, you actually might not notice it. But when you have multiple such places, uh, you will definitely catch it. And uh, actually, my advice when it comes to using CMake is always state your explicit dependencies only. So CMake actually can sort of derive dependencies. So if you have like library N, A, and it depends on five libraries, and then you have like the uh, library B, which depends only on A, then inside library B, just point it, okay, I depend on A and nothing more. And the CMake will automatically deduce, okay, this is A library, and A library depends on five more libraries and will automatically include them. So just state the, state the requirements explicitly in the place where you uh, have one single library, and then you will not have this need of like copy and pasting all the dependencies around. Okay, some other questions? More questions. Uh, one over there, the other side of the room, please. Okay. Just I, I, over I there. Ca I cannot see you, so please speak loudly. <laughs> You've got probably 12 seconds to take a sip of water. <sighs> okay. <laughs> we'll do so. Hey, by the way, how many of you do embedded development daily? Mm -hmm. Okay, roughly half the room. And maybe server side, someone? High performance, okay. Okay, a few people. <coughs> okay. Uh, how for other platforms from uh, your perspective is basically unused code. So when you need to change signature, uh, you make uh, cause conflicts for other platforms. So any good advice on how to handle this? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, when you're using split backend, please note that the header, the, the main header for uh, the function class or whatever is always common. So actually, you ha do have a common place. And as a part of your CI, you should be doing at least one build per platform anyway. So if you do find uh, there is uh, some inconsistent, you will definitely catch it on CI. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, 
One last question or question over there, if possible. <laughs> I was wondering if, uh, when using um, split backend and uh, link time optimization, uh -huh. you've run into any problems where uh, third-party code is relying on the fact that something in another translation mm -hmm. unit won't be reordered across call boundaries. After uh, yeah. uh, I personally have not hit this situation, but uh, I'm aware that such situation exists. Uh, for instance, I think you have had such a such an, uh, bad ex bad, uh, yeah, bad experience with libraries. Yeah. yeah, it may happen. Actually, the truth is that most of the embedded libraries, the third parties, are written in C, and usually this is like a hard code C, uh, like you could see something in the 80s. So yeah, <laughs> this might be, thank you for the comment, by the way, I forgot to talk about it, to tell about it. Yes, this might be the case. So when it comes to link time optimization, even if your compiler does support it, make sure that your third libraries, third party libraries also do support it correctly. Okay, so maybe uh, the one final question actually will uh, come from me. So how many of you have been on my last year's talk, uh, C versus C++ embedded? Okay, okay, like 20 people. <laughs> Online counts as well, right? <laughs> okay, I promised to do some Inver Vim versus Emax, and actually, uh, I'm a Vim person, and I think that Vim is awesome because it has the Neon Cut plugin, so we can see the progress bar in Neon Cut form. But I also recently found out that uh, Vim is addictive. If you actually type into Google how to quit, you'll get like drugs, smoking, alcohol, and VI. <laughs> so please make sure you dose it correctly. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, this dynamite style presentation requires an explosive cheer. Bartek Shurgot. All right, thanks very much. Let me announce a quick break. Well, by quick, I mean uh, just over 20 minutes and make sure that you do come back for the lightning talks, which will start at half past four. Half past four, thank you.
Is it working? Okay. Hello?
Thank you for showing up for this last part of Code Dive. These are called lightning talks, and they will be presented by Nokia's own two people, uh, Swavik Zborowski, who's a veteran. Is it your second or third, Swavik? Third. And I believe Patrick is the first from you? Okay. So, on the one hand, we need to give Swavik recognition for his part. He's a veteran and a warm welcome to the first timer, Patrick. So, Swavik and Patrick and their lightning talks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I'd like to give uh, some short talk about uh, JavaScript from a C++ developer point of view. So how many of you are C++ engineers? Show your hands. OK, almost most of you. Do we have any JavaScript developers here? OK, a few of you. And this is what I expected. Do we have anyone that is both JavaScript and C++ engineer? OK, great. So I cannot say that I am C uh, JavaScript engineer, but I had a unique opportunity to develop some JavaScript projects recently, because this is the only language that works in web browsers, and I'd like to share some observations with you. So let me start with something different. This is a picture I found in the internet the other day, and it is from GitHub blog. It shows how many code repositories they have, and as you can see, in 2014, they approached 10 million of repositories. So then I asked myself how many, how many developers we have in, in the world. And I wasn't able to find any figures or, or numbers for the whole world, but I managed to, to find on the Satista webpage numbers for programmers in, in UK. And as you can see, the trend here is quite exponential. And when it comes to number of, of people in software engineering, it is linear, at least, at least now. So then I had this question. How it is possible that the growth is linear for number of people, but for projects, it's, it's exponential? And I think two factors are contributing to this. The first one is that hardware is evolving, so does the software meaning that we started with punch tapes like this, literally holes in, in a paper. Then the machines evolved so we could write some mnemonics and they get converted to, to some machine code. So it was much, much easier than, than doing something with a tape. Then in order to actually write any operating system, uh, humans developed programming languages, and this, this one uh, is actually a C. And the next logical step was to, in order to abstract the differences between the, between the platforms, was to introduce a man in the middle called a virtual machine. Uh, so we can code without uh, taking care of things like memory and uh, differences between operating systems. And for Java, it is JVM. For JavaScript, it will be a uh, JavaScript engine in built in uh, into the web browser. And the second thing is, I don't know whether you will agree with me or not, but I think that more and more people are going to the software engineering industry, meaning that a uh, lot years ago, it was quite uh, quite unusual to, to meet some other software engineer. Now it is being uh, popular, so more and more people are coming to, to us. And I believe that th these easy languages and more people actually is the reason why we have this part here. And actually, if you go to, to the GitHub statistics, you can see that JavaScript is a top language for several years at least. So this is, this is what I think. Do you recognize this lady? Show your hands. OK, great. She is Margaret Hamilton, and she, she used to, to help with Apollo 11. And in this famous photo, she's standing near source code for, for this project. And I think you will agree that this is a lot of assembly, right? But but fast forward to 2016, we can find blog posts like this. 
Node.js on a satellite means anyone can be a space programmer. So this is how it changed. Anyone now can be a space programmer. And I noticed some interesting thing here as well. Ex nebula ut spatium yolo. I have no idea how to pronounce Latin, but ex nebula is uh, from the cloud ut spatium to the space. It's quite logical, right? It is the shortest path from the cloud to the space. It's shorter than, than from the ground. Nevertheless, I think YOLO is not part of Latin language. And I think we, we can have some problems in a near future, like Houston. What it means undefined is not a function. But let's compare those two languages. Uh, so C++ is a compiled language that is statically typed and strongly typed, while JavaScript is quite opposite. It's interpreted and it's dynamically typed and loosely typed. So comparing those two is more or less like comparing apples to oranges. But still, I found some interesting thing that, that can be compared, like a creation, how, how it went from the very beginning. So with C++, it's, it's like an evolution. We started with C, then it was C with classes, then C++, C++11, C++14, and now we are heading towards C++17. With JavaScript, well, it was more like bank and you have JavaScript. The whole language... <laughs> this is HTML uh, presentation, you can click on this link afterwards. I'm not joking, the whole language was created in 10 days, including documentation. One person created a language with the docu and documented it in, in 10 days. Amazing, isn't it? So the next thing that I found to be quite similar in our different words is the diversity. Do you know what it is? Here, this is part of Boost Unit's uh, source code. And it doesn't matter where, where you go, uh, what boost header you open, you will see a code bloated with those if devs because we have different platforms, different compilers, and we need to support them. With JavaScript, it is quite similar in, in some, at some points. In this example, if, if you want to check whether the user escaped from your application by changing a hub, then you, you, you need to access either document.hidden or document.mshidden, perhaps it's from Microsoft, or document webkit hidden, and it goes like this. So there are some differences, uh, sorry, similarities. And for JavaScript, I think it is maybe the same or maybe even worse. If you have that amount of JavaScript features and that amount of browsers, then if you build a matrix, you can see a lot of incompatibilities between those browsers. So we share, we share the same pain. Another thing that I'd like to check, that, that I wanted to check actually, and I did it yesterday, is how C++ and JavaScript look like in Google Trends. So as you can see, JavaScript is more popular. It is this red line here and C++ is lower. And actually, I, I wasn't looking for this, but it caught my attention. What do you think? From where uh, this, this thing comes? What is the month? It's December, end of December. And I was curious whether this is only for C++ and JavaScript, so I put more languages like PHP and Python, and definitely we have some pattern. But still, my question was, is it true only for the programming languages or not? So we need to put some reference point. And while doing this, I was drinking a beer, so I decided why not put alcohol word here. <laughs> and well, let's leave only C++ and operator percent. So clearly you can see that some, something's going on. There can be numerous explanations for this, and one of them 
possible explanation is that programmers are in the basements and they code for one year and then at the end of the year they go out and then Google how to fight alcohol addiction. This is only possible explanation to this. Okay, but let's get back to, to some differences, funny differences between the language between those languages. Libraries is the most is the, the biggest thing that differs between between the languages. This is an example of JavaScript library. The name is positive integer, quite useful library, right? And here we have source code for this library from February. I'm not joking. This tiny library that only checks whether your number is positive is four lines of code. And from these four lines, three lines are actually importing something. It means that this tiny library has three dependencies. Isn't that crazy? And actually, it could be written in one line. So to put it in, in some other context, let's assume that we'd like to create some directory. And let's see how we can do this in C++ and in JavaScript. So for C++, it is quite obvious. We, we just pick a boost file system. It's one line, and we're done. How it looks in JavaScript. I wanted to find some, something similar to, to, to boost file system in, in JavaScript, and I found this file system extra package. And from the description, you can read that it contains methods that aren't included in the vanilla Node.js file system package, such as make directory, copy, and remove. So you know, Python has this motto, batteries included. And I propose a motto for Node.js, only one battery is included. Because you can operate on files, but not on directories. Nevertheless, while looking for a library to create a directory, I also found other one. Make dear. Quite obvious, right? And then I found another one. Safe make dear, which is ignoring the fact that uh, when, when the directory exists. And then, well, make dear p. Make dirs, make dir parents, then make path over there, make subdir, great, make dir recursive, and file system make dir p. And I'm going to stop here, but actually there were one than, uh, more than 100 of those. So, what can I tell? Part of JavaScript community is definitely good at uh, inventing number, number of names for the same thing, and perhaps they are very bad at Googling. Thank you. Okay, we need 15 seconds to set up the audio and the correct presentation, please. So again, it's Patrick's first time. A little bit of encouragement. Three, two, one. Thank you. Let's check if it works. Okay. Um, so I was thinking, like, uh, what, like, I'm giving the last speech in the main room, right? So, like, that's kind of negative position, like, like to be in, right? So, always think positively. Like, on the other hand, I'm giving the closing keynote of the conference, right? So, that's kind of good. So basically. What I'm going to try to do is try to learn you something, uh, try to learn you, teach you something interesting about property-based testing. It's not going to be a fully-fledged uh, tutorial on this topic. So let's talk about tests. 
Let's suppose we've got the following add function signature. It takes two ints, and then it returns another int. So how would you approach testing it? Like, you can go on and on and just write test cases like this one, add some numbers, expect uh, another number, add some zero inside, negative numbers, big numbers, right? You can go on and on and like, on like this. You can write 10, 50, 100 of t tests like this. You can, you know, improve it by using, let's say, table-driven tests or whatever, right? And let's say that those tests, all the tests pass and they, they pass for one, two, three weeks, whatever your, your project lives on. But what if the implementation looked like this? And you've never thought about this. Never, no one really cared to put a test like this, right? So you've used, maybe for, for you know, by accident, someone written a test using Y as seven, but you didn't consider seven being, X being seven, right? So this is always like, you know, contrived example, but I bet that at least there's at least one part of your code base at work or whatever that has some kind of code like this that you, you never know when it's going to fire back at you. So how can we test addition in other means? Like, how can you think about it? Uh, thinking it from another perspective, right? So let's think about its properties. Everyone, I, I presume everyone in this room, it's like primary school knowledge, knows property, uh, properties of addition, right? There's three of them. We know that addition is pro, uh, commutative, commutative, associative, and it has the, uh, it has the additive identity property, right? So let's try to define those in pseudocode. That would be for the commutativity, you just put two random numbers, you, you use the add function, and then you use it with the reverse order of parameters. It should always, it should always be equal, right? You use the additive identity property, and you add to any random number you want, zero, and you should get the very same number back. And then you've got the associativity, so you add three numbers, and then you reverse the other op operations, and it should always be the same, right? Like taking aside like overflows, underflows, and stuff like this, but that should always work. So that's exactly where property-based testing kicks in. And what I would like to show you are examples in this presentation using rapid check uh, property-based testing uh, framework, which has been done by Emil uh, Ericsson at Spotify. Uh, they have found several interesting bugs in their Spotify player uh, using this. Uh, mostly related to shuffling, uh, shuffling songs and playlists and stuff like this. It's been greatly inspired by uh, QuickCheck and Haskell, which has been in the environment, uh, in, the in the Haskell ecosystem for several years now. So let's, so let's take the, the pseudocode that we've used to define uh, uh, addition properties and then just rewrite it as in C++ code. So using rapid check, it would, it would be more or less like this. Take, uh, take the RC check uh, function, put a test definition, and then just put the lambda almost as it would be like plain English. Uh, so we co almost copy up the, the properties that we defined, and then we put it in the lambda. And the, ma the place where magic kinks in, it's, it's where we define the parameters to the lambda. The framework does... Uh, magical automatic random uh, parameter generations for it for each each of the test invocation so we use that we use all of those properties for the implementation that we've seen and we're going to see more or less output like this showing us that we have a, uh, we have a problem in our impl implementation as you might see there is the seven in the first place in the first parameter that has been caught as a problem going back we might go and fix the implementation that we've seen back there, and then we're going to see the successful, uh, successful uh, tests passing. Uh, what you might see in the slide is that the, the, each of the tests has been run 100 times. And if that's a reasonable default of the framework, you can configure it to your needs. You can also observe the seed, which was used to uh, uh, randomly generate numbers. So if you want to reproduce that, you can always use the seed if you've seen a failing test case in your CI or whatever you, you're using. Uh, RapidCheck has a lot of configuration options. 
Google test or boost test uh, integration, one of them. If you want to use it with Google test, just replace the macros that you're using from Google test. Uh, shove uh, shove uh, rapid checks macros in there, and then add a third parameter, which would be the list of the parameters that you would like that you'd like to have randomly generated for you for each, each test generation. What I'm using here is the rapid checks in ring generator, which basically re uh, returns a, when the referenced it returns a, a number which is in it between first and second, and then I'm just checking whether it's in, uh, indeed in the range. And then we're getting like familiar output from, from Google test, together with the C that I've mentioned before. Uh, one of the biggest features of property-based testing frameworks are, uh, is shrinking functionality, which allows, which allows humans to reason about the test output. So having random numbers and one random, uh, random types being generated by, uh, by the random system, you're going to have if you have a failed test case, you're going to have a tremendously diff like really different types and really different values that it's hard to reason about them. Just li like as in, in this test case, you're, you're having a test that is called all numbers in vector or have desired va value, and you have just a bunch of random numbers that you have that you have no clue what they might be and what the test uh, re uh, requires from it, but after shrinking, it will look more or less like this, and it would still fail your test. That's, real, that's way easier to reason what might be actually in there. It, it's still like in the add function, it still might be a contrived example, but th there's probably a lot of uh, examples in your code base that it might be useful. And this particular test was just testing whether all of those numbers were less than 100. And you can see that it matched the fifth parameter uh, that was the only one that was higher than, than 100. It, it, make it made it smaller up to 100, and then the other ones which were not relevant made it zeros. It didn't shrink the, it didn't shrink the vector size because it was important that it was the, the, the concrete size was left untouched. The other one is reproducible failures and the C that it's used to, to run tests, just as you've seen before, as I've mentioned. Uh, but there is also another feature that allows that on in each failed test case, you're going to get output in the end that, that tells you that you can reproduce your tests with RC params and the parameters that has been used to, to launch the test case. And what's really convenient uh, when you use this, this particular uh, the uh, environment is uh, uh, environment and variable is that if you, you if you have like th thousands of tests or hundreds of thousands of tests for your uh, for your system and then it takes I don't know one minute five minutes whatever two hours to run it you're gonna running your tests with this flag or is gonna just reproduce the failed test case that you had and that's really convenient if you want to if you want to follow the flow of the failed test case. More of those you, with rapid check, you can you can write your own uh, user defined type generators. And what's really convenient is that you have built in STL support, which makes it really easy when you write when you write uh, user your your types T uh, generator, you get uh, you get STL vector STL list of your type T generators for free. It's like built in the framework. Uh, you get configurable number of tests to run, whatever you want to run. If 100 is not enough, just put a million in there, whatever you want to run. There is lots, of, lots and lots and lots of mo configuration options that you can use with this one. So the, for, as a conclusion, I would like to mention that just try to think about your tests as fellow human beings. Don't try to think about them as input-output pairs. It would be disgusting to think about fellow co-workers in terms of input output pairs, right? Just think about them, think about their properties and conditions that should hold throughout the whole test execution. And some of the examples that I've written here and many more uh, is, are, ava are available on my GitHub. You can just download them. And as probably you've seen Bartex, uh, Bartex talk, it's just one command to run them. There is no magical uh, magical build commands that you have to use. 
And that's basically, basically it. You can check out those references. There's very nice talk by Scott uh, Vlashin about, uh, I believe, F-sharp's uh, quick check implementation, which tells a really nice story, which I have to admit I've been inspired by. So that's basically it. Thanks a lot. Patrick Mawek. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, part of my job as journalist is collecting quotes, and uh, I've been doing it diligently, so to speak, um, earlier today. And uh, I'd like to quote three people that I spoke to uh, over lunch. Um, I asked two people, you know, if, if it wasn't for Code Dive, what sort of other conference of this sort would you go to in this country or in this part of the world, in fact? And uh, one person said, there are several of those conferences, but none of them is as professional as Code Dive. The other just shrugged his shoulders and he said, other conferences? None. And the third person uh, I've spoken to, um, I, asked, um, I asked them, what, what, what did you think? What, what were you uh, taking away with you? And he said, you know, I'm not a, a very professional uh, developer, but the solutions that I've heard about today, I can start using them tomorrow. And I think it uh, best summarizes what we've heard over those two days. So this is almost it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Patrick and Swavik were very kind, and they left me tw 32 minutes to speak. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> So I'll, I'll try to use the time that I've got available, unless... Okay. That's a secret that I'm going to give away in a moment. Uh, but in case you were wondering how, how Code Dive is done, uh, it basically started this edition, which was the third. It basically started the day after edition number two finished. So if you think about it, it took around 363 days to prepare. And it fell on shoulders of two people, really. Uh, and those people are Konrad and Dominik. Uh, Dominik is not here, he's still working. But Konrad, may I thank you personally? That guy and his friend, thank you. Do it properly for Conrad. That guy spent a year preparing this conference. Uh, so make sure you buy him a beer later during the after party. Um, and they spent hundreds of hours doing that. And they exchanged mm -hmm. thousands of emails. And uh, they went to countless meetings. Uh, for this conference to happen. Uh, today there were around 30 volunteers that I would like to thank personally. It, it was thanks to them that the conference went so smoothly. So again, if you see those people in blue coat dive shirts, it's the volunteers and they need a separate thanks. Volunteers! Thank you. May I interrupt? I would like to shortly announce the winners of today's race to 5G. So the third place goes to Darius Piłka. The second place goes to Mariusz Czaplicki. And the winner of today's Nokia race to 5G is Artur Śliwiński. Thank you very much. So if you are one of the winners or know them, please ask them to a report to the station. There's one thing that I've, that, I've, that I've wanted to do over those two days, so if you allowed me, I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> Feels good, I should do it more often. Anyway, if I, if I just uh, could go back to what I said at, at the beginning, that fun was mandatory for everyone. I, I was trying to look at people's faces and, you know, I don't really understand a lot from what's going on on the screen, so I studied people's behavior. And I can certify that enough fun was being had. 
Uh, more fun will be available later this afternoon in the Mlecarnia pub, which is uh, just around the corner, and we will be starting at around 7 p.m. Uh, thank you for coming. There were 1,500 of you, and of course, you make this conference happen. So thank yourself. And my name is Rafał Motryuk. I am Polish Radio's science and technology correspondent. Thank you for having me. As ever, it was a pleasure to host this conference. Thank you very much. And I think the last round of applause uh, is needed for our organizer and sponsor, Nokia. Rumor is, and it has not been yet verified by Western journalists, so I'm selling this as a rumor, but the word is that next year we will be having a Code Dive conference, and I think there's, this is something to look forward to. So hopefully see you next year for the time being. I'd like to thank everyone who came. Uh, many countries were represented, including France, Germany, Romania, the Philippines, China, and the UK. Thank you very much, and come again. Goodbye. <laughs>